Preface to Pictures from Italy. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anthony Ogus. Pictures from Italy by Charles Dickens. Preface. The Reader's Passport. If the readers of this volume will be so kind as to take their credentials for the different places which are the subject of its author's reminiscences from the author himself, perhaps they may visit them in fancy the more agreeably and with a better understanding of what they are to expect. Many books have been written upon Italy, affording many means of studying the history of that interesting country and the innumerable associations entwined about it. I make but little reference to that stock of information, not at all regarding it as a necessary consequence of my having had recourse to the storehouse for my own benefit, that I should reproduce its easily accessible contents before the eyes of my readers. Neither will there be found in these pages any grave examination into the government or misgovernment of any portion of the country. No visitor of that beautiful land can fail to have a strong conviction on the subject, but as I chose when residing there, a foreigner, to abstain from the discussion of any such questions with any order of Italians, so I would rather not enter on the inquiry now. During my twelve months' occupation of a house at Genoa, I never found that authorities constitutionally jealous were distrustful of me, and I shall be sorry to give them occasion to regret their free courtesy, either to myself or any of my countrymen. There is probably not a famous picture or statue in all Italy, but could be easily buried under a mountain of printed paper devoted to dissertations on it. I do not, therefore, though an earnest admirer of painting and sculpture, expatiate at any length on famous pictures and statues. This book is a series of faint reflections, mere shadows in the water, of places to which the imaginations of most people are attracted, in a greater or lesser degree, on which mine had dwelt for years, and which have some interest for all. The greater part of the descriptions were written on the spot, and sent home, from time to time, in private letters. I do not mention the circumstance as an excuse for any defects they may present, for it would be none, but as a guarantee to the reader that they were at least penned in the fullness of the subject, and with the liveliest impressions of novelty and freshness. If they have ever a fanciful and idle air, perhaps the reader will suppose them written in the shade of a sunny day, in the midst of the objects of which they treat, and will like them none the worse for having such influences of the country upon them. I hope I am not likely to be misunderstood by professors of the Roman Catholic faith on account of anything contained in these papers. I have done my best in one of my former productions to do justice to them, and I trust in this they will do justice to me. When I mention any exhibition that impressed me as absurd or disagreeable, I do not seek to connect it or recognise it as necessarily connected with any essentials of their creed. When I treat of the ceremonies of the Holy Week, I merely treat of their effect, and do not challenge the good and learned Dr. Wiseman's interpretation of their meaning. When I hint a dislike of nunneries for young girls who abjure the world before they have ever proved or known it, or doubt the ex officio sanctity of all priests and friars, I do no more than many conscientious Catholics both abroad and at home. I have likened these pictures to shadows in the water, and would fain hope that I have nowhere stirred the water so roughly as to mar the shadows. I could never desire to be on better terms with all my friends than now, when distant mountains rise once more in my path. For I need not hesitate to avow that, bent on correcting a brief mistake I made not long ago, in disturbing the old relations between myself and my readers, and departing for a moment from my old pursuits, I am about to resume them joyfully in Switzerland, 
where during another year of absence I can at once work out the themes I have now in my mind without interruption. And while I keep my English audience within speaking distance, extend my knowledge of a noble country inexpressibly attractive to me. This book is made as accessible as possible, because it would be a great pleasure to me if I could hope, through its means, to compare impressions with some among the multitudes who will hereafter visit the seams described with interest and delight. And I have only now in passport-wise to sketch my reader's portrait, which I hope may be thus supposititiously traced for either sex. Complexion fair. Eyes very cheerful. Nose not supercilious. Mouth smiling. Visage beaming. General expression extremely agreeable. End of preface. Chapter One of Pictures from Italy by Charles Dickens. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Anthony Ogus. Going through France. On a fine Sunday morning in the midsummer time and weather of eighteen hundred and forty four, it was my good friend when, don't be alarmed, not when two travellers might have been observed slowly making their way over that picturesque and broken ground by which the first chapter of a middle-aged novel is usually attained, but when an English travelling carriage of considerable proportions, fresh from the shady halls of the Pantechnicon near Belgrave Square, London, was observed by a very small French soldier, for I saw him look at it, to issue from the gate of the Hôtel Maurice in the Rue Rivoli at Paris. I am no more bound to explain why the English family travelling by this carriage, inside and out, should be starting for Italy on a Sunday morning, of all good days in the week, than I am to assign a reason for all the little men in France being soldiers, and all the big men postilions, which is the invariable rule. But they had some sort of reason for what they did, I have no doubt, and their reason for being there at all was, as you know, that they were going to live in fair Genoa for a year, and that the head of the family proposed, in that space of time, to stroll about wherever his restless humour carried him. And it would have been small comfort to me to have explained to the population of Paris generally that I was that head and chief and not the radiant embodiment of good humour, who sat beside me in the person of a French courier, best of servants and most beaming of men. Truth to say, he looked a great deal more patriarchal than I, who, in the shadow of his portly presence, dwindled down to no account at all. There was, of course, very little in the aspect of Paris, as we rattled near the dismal morgue and over the Pont Neuf, to reproach us for our Sunday travelling. The wine-shops, every second house, were driving a roaring trade. Awnings were spreading and chairs and tables arranging outside the cafes, preparatory to the eating of ices and drinking of cool liquids later in the day. Shoe-blacks were busy on the bridges, shops were open, carts and wagons clattered to and fro, the narrow uphill funnel-like streets across the river were so many dense perspectives of crowd and bustle, partly coloured nightcaps, tobacco pipes, blouses, large boots and shaggy heads of hair. Nothing at that hour denoted a day of rest, unless it were the appearance here and there of a family pleasure party, crammed into a bulky old lumbering cab, or of some contemplative holiday-maker in the freest and easiest days there be, leaning out of a low garret window, watching the drying of his newly polished shoes on the little parapet outside, if a gentleman, or the airing of her stockings in the sun, if a lady, with calm anticipation. Once clear of the never-to-be-forgotten or forgiven pavement which surrounds Paris, the first three days of travelling towards Marseille are quiet and monotonous enough. To Sens, to Avalon, to Chalon. A sketch of one day's proceedings is a sketch of all three, and here it is. 
We have four horses and one postillion, who has a very long whip and drives his team, something like the courier of St. Petersburg in the circle at Astley's, or Franconi's, only he sits his own horse instead of standing on him. The immense jack-boots worn by these postillions are sometimes a century or two old, and are so ludicrously disproportionate to the wearer's foot, that the spur, which is put where his own heel comes, is generally halfway up the leg of the boots. The man often comes out of the stable yard, with his whip in his hand and his shoes on, and brings out in both hands one boot at a time, which he plants on the ground by the side of his horse with great gravity, until everything is ready. When it is, and, oh heaven, the noise they make about it, he gets into the boots, shoes and all, or is hoisted into them by a couple of friends, adjusts the rope harness embossed by the labours of innumerable pigeons in the stables, makes all the horses kick and plunge, cracks his whip like a madman, shouts, En route, di! and away we go. He is sure to have a contest with his horse before we have gone very far, and then he calls him a thief, and a brigand, and a pig, and what not, and beats him about the head as if he were made of wood. There is little more than one variety in the appearance of the country for the first two days. From a dreary plain to an interminable avenue, and from an interminable avenue to a dreary plain again. Plenty of vines there are in the open fields, but of a short low kind, and not trained in festoons, but about straight sticks. Beggars innumerable there are, everywhere, but an extraordinarily scanty population, and fewer children than I ever encountered. I don't believe we saw a hundred children between Paris and Chalon. Queer old towns, drawbridged and walled, with odd little towers at the angles, like grotesque faces, as if the wall had put a mask on, and were staring down into the moat. Other strange little towers, in gardens and fields, and down lanes and in farmyards, all alone and always round, with a peaked roof, and never used for any purpose at all. Ruinous buildings of all sorts, sometimes an hôtel de vie, sometimes a guard-house, sometimes a dwelling-house, sometimes a chateau with a rank garden, prolific in dandelion, and watched over by extinguisher-top turrets, and blink-eyed little casements, are the standard objects repeated over and over again. Sometimes we pass a village inn with a crumbling wall belonging to it, and a perfect town of outhouses, and painted over the gateway, stabling for sixty horses, as indeed there might be stabling for sixty score, were there any horses to be stabled there, or anybody resting there, or anything stirring about the place but a dangling bush, indicative of the wine inside, which flutters idly in the wind, in lazy keeping with everything else, and certainly is never in a green old age, though always so old as to be dropping to pieces. And all day long strange little narrow wagons, in strings of six or eight, bringing cheese from Switzerland, and frequently in charge the whole line of one man or even boy, and he very often asleep in the foremost cart, come jingling past, the horses drowsily ringing the bells upon their harness, and looking as if they thought, no doubt they do, their great blue woolly furniture of immense weight and thickness, with a pair of grotesque horns growing out of the collar, very much too warm for the midsummer weather. Then there is the diligence, twice or thrice a day, with the dusty outsides in blue frocks like butchers, and the insides in white nightcaps, and its cabriolet head on the roof, nodding and shaking like an idiot's head, and its young France passengers staring out of window, with beards down to their waists, and blue spectacles awfully shading their warlike eyes, and very big sticks clenched in their national grasp. Also the malpost, with only a couple of passengers, tearing along at a real good daredevil pace, and out of sight in no time. 
steady old curé come jolting past now and then in such ramshackle rusty musty clattering coaches as no englishman would believe in and bony women dawdle about in solitary places holding cows by ropes while they feed or digging and hoeing or doing field work of a more laborious kind or representing real shepherdesses with their flocks to obtain an adequate idea of which pursuit and its followers in any country it is only necessary to take any pastoral poem or picture and imagine to yourself whatever is most exquisitely and widely unlike the descriptions therein contained you have been travelling along stupidly enough as you generally do in the last stage of the day and the ninety-six bells upon the horses twenty-four apiece have been ringing sleepily in your ears for half an hour or so, and it has become a very jog-trot, monotonous, tiresome sort of business, and you have been thinking deeply about the dinner you will have at the next stage, when, down at the end of the long avenue of trees through which you are travelling, the first indication of a town appears, in the shape of some straggling cottages, and the carriage begins to rattle and roll over a horribly uneven pavement, as if the equipage were a great firework, and the mere sight of a smoking cottage chimney had lighted it, instantly it begins to crack and splutter, as if the very devil were in it. Crack, 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 crack. Hello, hello, vite, voleur, brigand, hi, hi, en route. Whip, wheels, driver, stones, beggars, children, crack, 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 hello, hello, Charité pour la mort de Dieu, crick, crack, crick, crick, crack, crick, 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 bump, jolt, crack, bump, crick, crack, round the corner, up the narrow street, down the paved hill on the other side, in the gutter, bump, bump, jolt, jog, crick, 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 crack, 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 into the shop windows on the left-hand side of the street, preliminary to a sweeping turn into the wooden archway on the right, rumble 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 clatter 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 crick 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 and here we are in the yard of the hotel de l'écu d'or used up gone out smoking spent exhausted but sometimes making a full start unexpectedly with nothing coming of it like a firework to the last the landlady of the hotel de l'écu d'or is here and the landlord of the hotel de l'écu d'or is here and the femme de chambre of the Hôtel de l'Ecu d'Or is here, and a gentleman in a glazed cap with a red beard like a bosom friend who is staying at the Hôtel de l'Ecu d'Or is here, and Monsieur le Curé is walking up and down in a corner of the yard by himself, with a shovel hat upon his head, and a black gown on his back, and a book in one hand, and an umbrella in the other, and everybody except Monsieur le Curé is open-mouthed and open-eyed for the opening of the carriage door. The landlord of the Hôtel de l'Ecu d'Or dotes to that extent upon the courier that he can hardly wait for his coming down from the box, but embraces his very legs and boot-heels as he descends. My courier, my brave courier, my friend, my brother! The landlady loves him, the femme de chambre blesses him, the garçon worships him. The courier asks if his letter has been received. It has, it has. Other rooms prepared? They are, they are. The best rooms for my noble courier. The rooms of state for my gallant courier. The whole house is at the service of my best of friends. He keeps his hand upon the carriage door and asks some other question to enhance the expectation. He carries a green leathern purse outside his coat suspended by a belt. The idlers look at it. One touches it. It is full of five-franc pieces. Murmurs of admiration are heard among the boys. The landlord falls upon the courier's neck and folds him to his breast. He is so much fatter than he was, he says. He looks so rosy and so well. The door is opened. Breathless expectation. The lady of the family gets out. Ah, sweet lady, beautiful lady. The sister of the lady of the family gets out. Great heaven, mademoiselle is charming. First little boy gets out. 
"'Ah, what a beautiful little boy! First little girl gets out. Oh, but this is an enchanting child. Second little girl gets out.' The landlady, yielding to the finest impulse of our common nature, catches her up in her arms. Second little boy gets out. Oh, the sweet boy! Oh, the tender little family! The baby is handed out. Angelic baby! The baby has topped everything. All the rapture is expended on the baby. Then the two nurses tumble out, and the enthusiasm swelling into madness, the whole family are swept upstairs as on a cloud, while the idlers press about the carriage and look into it, and walk round it and touch it. For it is something to touch a carriage that has held so many people. It is a legacy to leave one's children. The rooms are on the first floor, except the nursery for the night, which is a great rambling chamber with four or five beds in it, through a dark passage, up two steps, down four, past a pump, across a balcony, and next door to the stable. The other sleeping apartments are large and lofty, each with two small bedsteads, tastefully hung like the windows, with red and white drapery. The sitting-room is famous. Dinner is already laid in it for three, and the napkins are folded in cocked hat fashion. The floors are of red tile. There are no carpets and not much furniture to speak of, but there is abundance of looking-glass, and there are large vases under glass shades, filled with artificial flowers, and there are plenty of clocks. The whole party are in motion. The brave courier in particular is everywhere, looking after the beds, having wine poured down his throat by his dear brother the landlord, and picking up green cucumbers, always cucumbers, heaven knows where he gets them, with which he walks about, one in each hand, like truncheons. Dinner is announced, there is very thin soup, there are very large loaves, one apiece, a fish, four dishes afterwards, some poultry afterwards, a dessert afterwards, and no lack of wine. There is not much in the dishes, but they are very good and always ready instantly. When it is nearly dark, the brave courier, having eaten the two cucumbers, sliced up in the contents of a pretty large decanter of oil, and another of vinegar, emerges from his retreat below, and proposes a visit to the cathedral, whose massive tower frowns down upon the courtyard of the inn. Off we go, and very solemn and grand it is, in the dim light. So dim at last that the polite old lanthorn jawed sacristan has a feeble little bit of candle in his hand to grope among the tombs with, and looks among the grim columns very like a lost ghost who is searching for his own. Underneath the balcony, when we return, the inferior servants of the inn are supping in the open air at a great table. The dish a stew of meat and vegetables, smoking hot, and served in the iron cauldron it was boiled in. They have a pitcher of thin wine, and are very merry, merrier than the gentleman with the red beard, who is playing billiards in the light room on the left of the yard, where shadows, with cues in their hands and cigars in their mouths, cross and recross the window constantly. Still the thin curé walks up and down alone, with his book and umbrella, and there he walks, and there the billiard balls rattle, long after we are fast asleep. We are astir at six next morning. It is a delightful day, shaming yesterday's mud upon the carriage, if anything could shame a carriage in a land where carriages are never cleaned. Everybody is brisk, and as we finish breakfast the horses come jingling into the yard from the post-house. Everything taken out of the carriage is put back again. The brave courier announces that all is ready, after walking into every room and looking all round it to be certain that nothing is left behind. Everybody gets in. Everybody connected with the Hôtel de l'Ecu d'Or is again enchanted. The brave courier runs into the house for a parcel containing cold fowl, sliced ham, bread and biscuits for lunch, hands it into the coach and runs back again. What has he got in his hand now? More cucumbers? No, a long strip of paper. It's the bill.
The brave courier has two belts on this morning, one supporting the purse, another, a mighty good sort of leathern bottle, filled to the throat with the best light Bordeaux wine in the house. He never pays the bill till this bottle is full. Then he disputes it. He disputes it now violently. He is still the landlord's brother, but by another father or mother. He is not so nearly related to him as he was last night. The landlord scratches his head. The brave courier points to certain figures in the bill, and intimates that if they remain there, the Hôtel de l'Écu d'Or is thenceforth and forever a Hôtel de l'Écu de Cuivre. The landlord goes into a little counting-house. The brave courier follows, forces the bill and a pen into his hand, and talks more rapidly than ever. The landlord takes the pen. The courier smiles. The landlord makes an alteration. The courier cuts a joke. The landlord is affectionate, but not weakly so. He bears it like a man. He shakes hands with his brave brother, but he don't hug him. Still he loves his brother, for he knows that he will be returning that way one of these fine days with another family, and he foresees that his heart will yearn towards him again. The brave courier traverses all round the carriage once, looks at the drag, inspects the wheels, jumps up, gives the word, and away we go. It is market morning. The market is held in the little square outside in front of the cathedral. It is crowded with men and women, in blue, in red, in green, in white, with canvassed stalls and fluttering merchandise. The country people are grouped about with their clean baskets before them. Here are the lace sellers, there are the butter and egg sellers, there are the fruit sellers, there are the shoemakers. The whole place looks as if it were the stage of some great theatre, and the curtain had just run up for a picturesque ballet. And there is the cathedral to boot, scene-like, all grim and swarthy and mouldering and cold, just splashing the pavement in one place with faint purple drops, as the morning sun, entering by a little window on the eastern side, struggles through some stained-glass panes on the western. In five minutes we have passed the iron cross with a little ragged kneeling place of turf before it, in the outskirts of the town. Chapter 2 of Pictures from Italy by Charles Dickens. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Anthony Ogus. Lyon, the Rhone, and the Goblin of Avignon. Chalon is a fair resting place in right of its good inn on the bank of the river, and the little steamboats, gay with green and red paint, that come and go upon it which make up a pleasant and refreshing scene after the dusty roads. But unless you would like to dwell on an enormous plain, with jagged rows of irregular poplars on it, that look in the distance like so many combs with broken teeth, and unless you would like to pass your life without the possibility of going uphill, or going up anything but stairs, you would hardly approve of Chalon as a place of residence. You would probably like it better, however, than Lyon, which you may reach, if you will, in one of the before-mentioned steamboats in eight hours. What a city Lyon is! Talk about people feeling at certain unlucky times as if they had tumbled from the clouds. Here is a whole town that is tumbled, anyhow, out of the sky. Having been first caught up like other stones that tumble down from that region, out of fens and barren places, dismal to behold! The two great streets through which the two great rivers dash, and all the little streets whose name is Legion, were scorching, blistering, and sweltering. The houses, high and vast, dirty to excess, rotten as old cheeses, and as thickly peopled. All up the hills that hem the city in, these houses swarm, and the mites inside were lolling out of the windows, and drying their ragged clothes on poles, and crawling in and out of the doors, and coming out to pant and gasp upon the pavement, 
and creeping in and out among huge piles and bales of fusty, musty, stifling goods, and living, or rather not dying till their time should come, in an exhausted receiver. Every manufacturing town melted into one would hardly convey an impression of Lyon as it presented itself to me. For all the undrained, unscavengered qualities of a foreign town seem grafted there upon the native miseries of a manufacturing one, and it bears such fruit as I would go some miles out of my way to avoid encountering again. In the cool of the evening, or rather in the faded heat of the day, we went to see the cathedral, where divers old women and a few dogs were engaged in contemplation. There was no difference in point of cleanliness between its stone pavement and that of the streets, and there was a wax saint in a little box like a berth aboard ship with a glass front to it, whom Madame Tussaud would have nothing to say to on any terms, and which even Westminster Abbey might be ashamed of. If you would know all about the architecture of this church, or any other, its dates, dimensions, endowments, and history, is it not written in Mr. Murray's guide-book, and may you not read it there with thanks to him as I did? For this reason I should abstain from mentioning the curious clock in Lyon Cathedral, if it were not for a small mistake I made in connection with that piece of mechanism. The keeper of the church was very anxious it should be shown, partly for the honour of the establishment and the town, and partly perhaps because of his deriving a percentage from the additional consideration. However that may be, it was set in motion, and thereupon a host of little doors flew open, and innumerable little figures staggered out of them, and jerked themselves back again, with that special unsteadiness of purpose, and hitching in the gait, which usually attaches to figures that are moved by clockwork. Meanwhile the sacristan stood explaining these wonders and pointing them out severally with a wand. There was a centre puppet of the Virgin Mary, and close to her a small pigeonhole, out of which another and very ill-looking puppet made one of the most sudden plunges I ever saw accomplished, instantly flopping back again at sight of her, and banging his little door violently after him. Taking this to be emblematic of the victory over sin and death, and not at all unwilling to show that I perfectly understood the subject in anticipation of the showman, I rashly said, Aha! The evil spirit, to be sure. He is very soon disposed of. Pardon, monsieur, said the sacristan, with a polite motion of his hand towards the little door, as if introducing somebody. THE ANGEL GABRIEL Soon after daybreak next morning, we were steaming down the Arrowy Rhone, at the rate of twenty miles an hour, in a very dirty vessel full of merchandise, and with only three or four other passengers for our companions, among whom the most remarkable was a silly, old, meek-faced, garlic-eating, immeasurably polite chevalier, with a dirty scrap of red ribbon hanging at his buttonhole, as if he had tied it there to remind himself of something, as Tom Noddy, in the farce, ties knots in his pocket-handkerchief. For the last two days we had seen great sullen hills, the first indications of the Alp towering in the distance. Now we were rushing on beside them, sometimes close beside them, sometimes with an intervening slope covered with vineyards. Villages and small towns hanging in mid-air, with great woods of olives seen through the light open towers of their churches, and clouds moving slowly on upon the steep acclivity behind them. Ruined castles perched on every eminence, and scattered houses in the clefts and gullies of the hills made it very beautiful. The great height of these, too, making the buildings look so tiny that they had all the charm of elegant models, their excessive whiteness as contrasted with the brown rocks, or the sombre, deep, dull, heavy green of the olive tree, and little slow walk of the Lilliputian men and women on the bank made a charming picture. There were ferries out of number two, bridges, the famous Pont d'Esprit, with I don't know how many arches, towns where memorable wines are made, Valence where Napoleon studied, 
and the noble river bringing at every winding turn new beauties into view. There lay before us that same afternoon the broken bridge of Avignon, and all the city baking in the sun, yet with an underdone pie-crust battlemented wall that never will be brown, though it bake for centuries. The grapes were hanging in clusters in the streets, and the brilliant oleander was in full bloom everywhere. The streets are old and very narrow, but tolerably clean and shaded by awnings stretched from house to house. Bright stuffs and handkerchiefs, curiosities, ancient frames of carved wood, old chairs, ghostly tables, saints, virgins, angels, and staring daubs of portraits being exposed for sale beneath. It was very quaint and lively. All this was much set off to by the glimpses one caught through a rusty gate standing ajar of quiet sleepy courtyards having stately old houses within as silent as tombs. It was all very like one of the descriptions in the Arabian Nights. The three one-eyed calendars might have knocked at any one of those doors till the street rang again and the porter who persisted in asking questions the man who had the delicious purchases put into his basket in the morning, might have opened it quite naturally. After breakfast next morning, we sallied forth to see the lions. Such a delicious breeze was blowing in from the north, as made the walk delightful, though the pavement stones and stones of the walls and houses were far too hot to have a hand laid on them comfortably. We went first of all up a rocky height to the cathedral, where mass was performing to an auditory very like that of Lyon, namely several old women, a baby, and a very self-possessed dog, who had marked out for himself a little course or platform for exercise, beginning at the altar rails and ending at the door, up and down which constitutional walk he trotted during the service, as methodically and calmly as any old gentleman out of doors. It is a bare old church, and the paintings in the roof are sadly defaced by time and damp weather, but the sun was shining in splendidly through the red curtains of the windows, and glittering on the altar furniture, and it looked as bright and cheerful as need be. Going apart in this church to see some painting which was being executed in fresco by a French artist and his pupil, I was led to observe more closely than I might otherwise have done, a great number of votive offerings with which the walls of the different chapels were profusely hung. I will not say decorated, for they were very roughly and comically got up, most likely by poor sign-painters, who eke out their living in that way. They were all little pictures, each representing some sickness or calamity from which the person placing it there had escaped, through the interposition of his or her patron saint, or of the Madonna, and I may refer to them as good specimens of the class generally. They are abundant in Italy. In a grotesque squareness of outline and impossibility of perspective, they are not unlike the woodcuts in old books, but they were oil paintings, and the artist, like the painter of the Primrose family, had not been sparing of his colours. In one, a lady was having a toe amputated, an operation which a saintly personage had sailed into the room upon a couch to superintend. In another, a lady was lying in bed, tucked up very tight and prim, and staring with much composure at a tripod, with a slop basin on it, the usual form of washing-stand, and the only piece of furniture beside the bedstead in her chamber. One would never have supposed her to be labouring under any complaint beyond the inconvenience of being miraculously wide awake if the painter had not hit upon the idea of putting all her family on their knees in one corner with their legs sticking out behind them on the floor like boot trees, above whom the virgin on a kind of blue divan promised to restore the patient. In another case, a lady was in the very act of being run over, immediately outside the city walls, by a sort of pianoforte van. But the Madonna was there again. Whether the supernatural appearance had startled the horse, a bay griffin, or whether it was invisible to him, I don't know, 
but he was galloping away ding-dong without the smallest reverence or compunction. On every picture ex voto was painted in yellow capitals in the sky. Though votive offerings were not unknown in pagan temples, and are evidently among the many compromises made between the false religion and the true, when the true was in its infancy, I could wish that all the other compromises were as harmless. Gratitude and devotion are Christian qualities, and a grateful, humble Christian spirit may dictate the observance. Hard by the cathedral stands the ancient palace of the popes, of which one portion is now a common jail, and another a noisy barrack, while gloomy suites of state apartments, shut up and deserted, mock their own state and glory like the embalmed bodies of kings. But we neither went there to see state rooms, nor soldiers' quarters, nor a common jail, though we dropped some money into a prisoner's box outside, while the prisoners themselves looked through the iron bars high up, and watched us eagerly. We went to see the ruins of the dreadful rooms in which the Inquisition used to sit. A little old swarthy woman, with a pair of flashing black eyes, proof that the world hadn't conjured down the devil within her, though it had been between sixty and seventy years to do it in, came out of the barrack cabaret, of which she was the keeper, with some large keys in her hands, and marshalled us the way that we should go. How she told us on the way that she was a government officer, concierge du palais apostolique, and had been for I don't know how many years, and how she had shown those dungeons to princes, and how she was the best of dungeon demonstrators, and how she had resided in the palace from an infant, had been born there, if I recollect right, I needn't relate. But such a fierce little rapid, sparkling, energetic she-devil I never beheld. She was alight and flaming all the time. Her action was violent in the extreme. She never spoke without stopping expressly for the purpose. She stamped her feet, clutched us by the arms, flung herself into attitudes, hammered against walls with her keys for more emphasis, now whispered as if the Inquisition were there still, now shrieked as if she were on the rack herself, and had a mysterious hag-like way with her forefinger, when approaching the remains of some new horror, looking back and walking stealthily and making horrible grimaces, that might alone have qualified her to walk up and down a sick man's counterpane, to the exclusion of all other figures, through a whole fever. Passing through the courtyard among groups of idle soldiers, we turned off by a gate, which this she-goblin unlocked for our admission, and locked again behind us and entered a narrow court, rendered narrower by fallen stones and heaps of rubbish, part of it choking up the mouth of a ruined subterranean passage that once communicated, or is said to have done so, with another castle on the opposite bank of the river. Close to this courtyard is a dungeon, we stood within it in another minute, in the dismal Tower des Oubliettes, where Rienzi was imprisoned, fastened by an iron chain to the very wall that stands there now, but shut out from the sky which now looks down into it. A few steps brought us to the cachot, in which the prisoners of the Inquisition were confined for forty-eight hours after their capture, without food or drink, that their constancy might be shaken, even before they were confronted with their gloomy judges. The day had not got in there yet, they are still small cells, shut in by four unyielding close hard walls, still profoundly dark, still massively doored and fastened, as of old. Goblin, looking back as I have described, went softly on into a vaulted chamber, now used as a storeroom, once the chapel of the Holy Office. The place where the tribunal sat was plain. The platform might have been removed but yesterday. Conceive the parable of the Good Samaritan having been painted on the wall of one of these Inquisition chambers. But it was, and it may be traced there yet. High up in the jealous wall are niches where the faltering replies of the accused were heard and noted down. 
Many of them had been brought out of the very cell we had just looked into so awfully, along the same stone passage. We had trodden in their very footsteps. I am gazing round me with the horror that the place inspires when Goblin clutches me by the wrist and lays not a skinny finger but the handle of a key upon her lip. She invites me with a jerk to follow her. I do so. She leads me out into a room adjoining, a rugged room with a funnel-shaped contracting roof, open at the top to the bright day. I ask her what it is. She folds her arms, leers hideously and stares. I ask again. She glances round to see that all the little company are there, sits down upon a mound of stones, throws up her arms and yells out like a fiend, La salle de la question! The chamber of torture. And the roof was made of that shape to stifle the victim's cries. Oh, goblin, goblin, let us think of this a while in silence. Peace, goblin. Sit with your short arms crossed on your short legs upon that heap of stones for only five minutes and then flame out again. Minutes. Seconds are not marked upon the palace clock when with her eyes flashing fire Goblin is up in the middle of the chamber describing with her sunburnt arms a wheel of heavy blows. Thus it ran round, cries Goblin, mash 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 an endless routine of heavy hammers mash 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 upon the sufferer's limbs see the stone trough says goblin for the water torture gurgle swill bloat burst for the redeemer's honour suck the bloody rag deep down into your unbelieving body heretic at every breath you draw and when the executioner plucks it out, reeking with the smaller mysteries of God's own image, know us for his chosen servants, true believers in the Sermon on the Mount, elect disciples of him who never did a miracle but to heal, who never struck a man with palsy, blindness, deafness, dumbness, madness, any one affliction of mankind, and never stretched his blessed hand out but to give relief and ease. See, cries Goblin, there the furnace was, there they made the irons red hot, those holes supporting the sharp stake on which the tortured persons hung poised, dangling with their whole weight from the roof. But, and Goblin whispers this, Monsieur has heard of this tower? Yes, let Monsieur look down then. A cold air laden with an earthly smell falls upon the face of Monsieur for she has opened while speaking a trap-door in the wall. Monsieur looks in. Downward to the bottom, upward to the top of a steep, dark, lofty tower, very dismal, very dark, very cold. The execution of the Inquisition, says Goblin, edging in her head to look down also, flung those who are past all further torturing down here. But look, does Monsieur see the black stains on the wall? A glance over his shoulder at Goblin's keen eye shows Monsieur, and would without the aid of the directing key, where they are. What are they? Blood. In October 1791, when the revolution was at its height here, sixty persons, men and women, and priests, says Goblin, priests, were murdered and hurled, the dying and the dead, into this dreadful pit, where a quantity of quick lime was tumbled down upon their bodies. Those ghastly tokens of the massacre were soon no more, but while one stone of the strong building in which the deed was done remains upon another, there they will lie in the memories of men, as plain to see as the splashing of their blood upon the wall is now. Was it a portion of the great scheme of retribution that the cruel deed should be committed in this place? that a part of the atrocities and monstrous institutions which had been for scores of years at work to change men's nature should in its last service tempt them with the ready means of gratifying their furious and beastly rage, should enable them to show themselves in the height of their frenzy no worse than a great solemn legal establishment in the height of its power, no worse, much better. 
They use the Tower of the Forgotten in the name of Liberty, their Liberty. An earth-born creature nursed in the black mud of the Bastille moats and dungeons, and necessarily betraying many evidences of its unwholesome bringing up, but the Inquisition used it in the name of Heaven. Goblin's finger is lifted, and she steals out again into the chapel of the Holy Office. She stops at a certain part of the flooring. Her great effect is at hand. She waits for the rest. She darts at the brave courier, who is explaining something, hits him a sounding rap on the hat with the largest key, and bids him be silent. She assembles us all round a little trap-door in the floor, as round a grave. Voila! She darts down at the ring, and flings the door open with a crash in her goblin energy, though it is no lightweight. Voila les oubliettes! Voila les oubliettes! Subterranean, frightful, black, terrible, deadly. Les oubliettes de l'Inquisition. My blood ran cold as I looked from Goblin down into the vaults, where these forgotten creatures, with recollections of the world outside, of wives, friends, children, brothers, starved to death and made the stones ring with their unavailing groans. But the thrill I felt on seeing the accursed wall below, decayed and broken through, and the sun shining through its gaping wounds, was like a sense of victory and triumph. I felt exalted with a proud delight of living in these degenerate times to see it, as if I were the hero of some high achievement. The light in the doleful vaults was typical of the light that has streamed in on all persecution in God's name, but which is not yet at its noon. It cannot look more lovely to a blind man newly restored to sight than to a traveller who sees it calmly and majestically treading down the darkness of that infer. Chapter Three of Pictures from Italy by Charles Dickens. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Anthony Ogus. Avignon to Genoa. Goblin, having shown Les Oubliettes, felt that her great coup was struck. She let the door fall with a crash and stood upon it with her arms akimbo, sniffing prodigiously. When we left the place, I accompanied her into her house, under the outer gateway of the fortress, to buy a little history of the building. Her cabaret, a dark low room, lighted by small windows, sunk in the thick wall, in the softened light and with its forge-like chimney, its little counter by the door, with bottles, jars and glasses on it, its household implements and scraps of dress against the wall, and a sober-looking woman, she must have a congenial life of it with Goblin, knitting at the door, looked exactly like a picture by Ostada. I walked round the building on the outside in a sort of dream, and yet with a delightful sense of having awakened from it, of which the light down in the vaults had given me the assurance. The immense thickness and giddy height of the walls, the enormous strength of the massive towers, the great extent of the building, its gigantic proportions, frowning aspect and barbarous irregularity, awaken awe and wonder. The recollection of its opposite old uses, an impregnable fortress, a luxurious palace, a horrible prison, a place of torture, the court of the Inquisition, at one and the same time a house of feasting, fighting, religion and blood, gives to every stone in its huge form a fearful interest, and imparts new meaning to its incongruities. I could think of little, however, then, or long afterwards, but the sun in the dungeons, the palace coming down to be the lounging place of noisy soldiers, and being forced to echo their rough talk and common oaths, and to have their garments fluttering through its dirty windows, was some reduction of its state, and something to rejoice at. But the day in its cells, and the sky for the roof of its chambers of cruelty, that was its desolation and defeat. 
If I had seen it in a blaze from ditch to rampart, I should have felt that not that light, nor all the light and all the fire that burns, could waste it, like the sunbeams in its secret council chamber and its prisons. Before I quit this palace of the popes, let me translate from the little history I mentioned just now a short anecdote, quite appropriate to itself, connected with its adventures. An ancient tradition relates that in 1441, a nephew of Pierre de Lude, the Pope's legate, seriously insulted some distinguished ladies of Avignon, whose relations, in revenge, seized the young man and horribly mutilated him. For several years the legate kept his revenge within his own breast, but he was not the less resolved upon its gratification at last. He even made, in the fullness of time, advances towards a complete reconciliation, and when their apparent sincerity had prevailed, he invited to a splendid banquet in this palace certain families, whole families, whom he sought to exterminate. The utmost gaiety animated the repast, but the measures of the legate were well taken. When the dessert was on the board, a Swiss presented himself with the announcement that a strange ambassador solicited an extraordinary audience. The legate, excusing himself for the moment to his guests, retired, followed by his officers. Within a few minutes afterwards, five hundred persons were reduced to ashes, the whole of that wing of the building having been blown into the air with a terrible explosion. After seeing the churches, I will not trouble you with churches just now, we left Avignon that afternoon. The heat being very great, the roads outside the walls were strewn with people fast asleep in every little slip of shade and with lazy groups, half asleep and half awake, who were waiting until the sun should be low enough to admit of their playing bowls among the burnt-up trees and on the dusty road. The harvest here was already gathered in, and mules and horses were treading out the corn in the fields. We came at dusk upon a wild and hilly country, once famous for brigands, and travelled slowly up a steep ascent. So we went on until eleven at night, when we halted at the town of Aix, within two stages of Marseille, to sleep. The hotel, with all the blinds and shutters closed to keep the light and heat out, was comfortable and airy next morning, and the town was very clean, but so hot and so intensely light that when I walked out at noon it was like coming suddenly from the darkened room into crisp blue fire. The air was so very clear that distant hills and rocky points appeared within an hour's walk, while the town immediately at hand, with a kind of blue wind between me and it, seemed to be white-hot and to be throwing off a fiery air from the surface. We left this town towards evening and took the road to Marseille. A dusty road it was, the houses shut up close and the vines powdered white. At nearly all the cottage doors women were peeling and slicing onions into earthen bowls for supper. So they had been doing last night all the way from Avignon. We passed one or two shady dark chateaux, surrounded by trees and embellished with cool basins of water, which were the more refreshing to behold from the great scarcity of such residences on the road we had travelled. As we approached Marseille, the road began to be covered with holiday people, Outside the public houses were parties smoking, drinking, playing draughts and cards, and, once, dancing. But dust, dust, dust everywhere. We went on through a long, straggling, dirty suburb, thronged with people, having on our left a dreary slope of land, on which the country houses of the Marseille merchants, always staring white, are jumbled and heaped without the slightest order backs, fronts, sides and gables, towards all points of the compass, until at last we entered the town. I was there, twice or thrice afterwards, in fair weather and foul, and I am afraid there is no doubt that it is a dirty and disagreeable place. 
but the prospect from the fortified heights of the beautiful mediterranean with its lovely rocks and islands is most delightful these heights are a desirable retreat for less picturesque reasons as an escape from a compound of vile smells perpetually arising from a great harbour full of stagnant water and befouled by the refuse of innumerable ships with all sorts of cargoes which in hot weather is dreadful in the last degree there were foreign sailors of all nations in the streets with red shirts blue shirts buff shirts tawny shirts and shirts of orange colour with red caps blue caps green caps great beards and no beards in turkish turbans glazed english hats and neapolitan headdresses there were the townspeople sitting in clusters on the pavement or airing themselves on the tops of their houses or walking up and down the closest and least airy of boulevards and there were crowds of fierce-looking people of the lower sort blocking up the way constantly in the very heart of all this stir and uproar was the common madhouse a low contracted miserable building looking straight upon the street without the smallest screen or courtyard where chattering madmen and mad women were peeping out through rusty bars at the staring faces below while the sun darting fiercely aslant into their little cells seemed to dry up their brains and worry them as if they were baited by a pack of dogs we were pretty well accommodated at the hotel du paradis situated in a narrow street of very high houses with a hairdresser's shop opposite exhibiting in one of its windows two full-length waxen ladies twirling round and round which so enchanted the hairdresser himself that he and his family sat in armchairs and in cool undresses on the pavement outside enjoying the gratification of the passers-by with lazy dignity the family had retired to rest when we went to bed at midnight but the hairdresser a corpulent man in drab slippers was still sitting there with his legs stretched out before him and evidently couldn't bear to have the shutters put up next day we went down to the harbour where the sailors of all nations were discharging and taking in cargoes of all kinds fruits wines oils silks stuffs velvets and every manner of merchandise taking one of a great number of lively little boats with gay striped awnings we rowed away under the sterns of great ships under tow ropes and cables against and among other boats and very much too near the sides of vessels that were faint with oranges to the marie antoinette a handsome steamer bound for genoa lying near the mouth of the harbour by and by the carriage that unwieldy trifle from the pantechnican on a flat barge bumping against everything and giving occasion for a prodigious quantity of oaths and grimaces came stupidly alongside and by five o'clock we were steaming out in the open sea the vessel was beautifully clean the mills were served under an awning on deck the night was calm and clear the quiet beauty of the sea and sky unspeakable we were off nice early next morning and coasted along within a few miles of the cornice road of which more in its place nearly all day we could see genoa before three and watching it as it gradually developed its splendid amphitheatre terrace rising above terrace garden above garden palace above palace height upon height was ample occupation for us till we ran into the stately harbour having been duly astonished here by the sight of a few cappuccini monks who were watching the fair weighing of some wood upon the wharf we drove off to albaro two miles distant where we had engaged a house the way lay through the main streets but not through the strada nuova or the strada balbi which are the famous streets of palaces i never in my life was so dismayed the wonderful novelty of everything the unusual smells the unaccountable filth though it is reckoned the cleanest of italian towns the disorderly jumbling of dirty houses 
one upon the roof of another, the passages more squalid and more close than any in St. Giles or Old Paris, in and out of which not vagabonds but well-dressed women with white veils and great fans were passing and repassing, the perfect absence of resemblance in any dwelling-house or shop or wall or post or pillar to anything one had ever seen before, and the disheartening dirt, discomfort and decay perfectly confounded me. I fell into a dismal reverie. I am conscious of a feverish and bewildered vision of saints and virgin shrines at the street corners, of great numbers of friars, monks and soldiers, of vast red curtains waving in the doorways of the churches, of always going up hill and yet seeing every other street and passage going higher up, of fruit stools with fresh lemons and oranges hanging in garlands made of vine leaves, of a guard house and a drawbridge and some gateways and vendors of iced water sitting with little trays upon the margin of the kennel and this is all the consciousness I had until I was set down in a rank dull weedy courtyard attached to a kind of pink jail and was told I lived there. I little thought that day that I should ever come to have an attachment for the very stones in the streets of Genoa, and to look back upon the city with affection, as connected with many hours of happiness and quiet. But these are my first impressions honestly set down, and how they changed I will say. Chapter 4, Part 1 of Pictures from Italy by Charles Dickens. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Anthony Ogus. Genoa and its Neighbourhood. The first impressions of such a place as Albaro, the suburb of Genoa where I am now, as my American friends would say, located, can hardly fail, I should imagine, to be mournful and disappointing. It requires a little time and use to overcome the feeling of depression, consequent at first on so much ruin and neglect. Novelty, pleasant to most people, is particularly delightful, I think, to me. I am not easily dispirited when I have the means of pursuing my own fancies and occupations, and I believe I have some natural aptitude for accommodating myself to circumstances. But as yet I stroll about here, in all the holes and corners of the neighbourhood, in a perpetual state of forlorn surprise, and returning to my villa, the Villa Bagnarello, it sounds romantic, but Signor Bagnarello is a butcher hard by, have sufficient occupation in pondering over my new experiences, and comparing them, very much to my own amusement, with my expectations, until I wander out again. The Villa Bagnarello, or the Pink Jail, a far more expressive name for the mansion, is in one of the most splendid situations imaginable. The noble bay of Genoa, with the deep blue Mediterranean, lies stretched out near at hand. Monstrous old desolate houses and palaces are dotted all about. Lofty hills, with their tops often hidden in the clouds, and with strong forts perched high up on their craggy sides, are close upon the left, and in front, stretching from the walls of the house down to a ruined chapel which stands upon the bold and picturesque rocks on the seashore, are green vineyards, where you may wander all day long in partial shade through interminable vistas of grapes, trained on a rough trellis work across the narrow paths. This sequestered spot is approached by lanes so very narrow that when we arrived at the Custom House, we found the people here had taken the measure of the narrowest among them, and were waiting to apply it to the carriage, which ceremony was gravely performed in the street, while we all stood by in breathless suspense. It was found to be a very tight fit, but just a possibility and no more, as I am reminded every day by the sight of various large holes which it punched in the walls on either side as it came along. We are more fortunate, I am told, than an old lady who took a house in these parts not long ago, 
and who stuck fast in her carriage in a lane, and as it was impossible to open one of the doors, she was obliged to submit to the indignity of being hauled through one of the little front windows like a harlequin. When you've got through these narrow lanes, you come to an archway, imperfectly stopped up by a rusty old gate, my gate. The rusty old gate has a bell to correspond, which you ring as long as you like, and which nobody answers, as it has no connection whatever with the house. But there is a rusty old knocker too, very loose, so that it slides round when you touch it, and if you learn the trick of it and knock long enough, somebody comes. The brave courier comes and gives you admittance. You walk into a seedy little garden, all wild and weedy, from which the vineyard opens. Cross it, enter a square hall like a cellar, walk up a cracked marble staircase, and pass into a most enormous room with a vaulted roof and whitewashed walls not unlike a great Methodist chapel. This is the Sala. It has five windows and five doors, and is decorated with pictures which would gladden the heart of one of those picture cleaners in London, who hang up, as a sign, a picture divided like death and the lady, at the top of the old ballad, which always leaves you in a state of uncertainty whether the ingenious professor has cleaned one half or dirted the other. The furniture of this sala is a sort of red brocade. All the chairs are removable, and the sofa weighs several tons. On the same floor, and opening out of this same chamber, a dining-room, drawing-room, and diverse bedrooms, each with a multiplicity of doors and windows. Upstairs are diverse other gaunt chambers and a kitchen, and downstairs is another kitchen which, with all sorts of strange contrivances for burning charcoal, looks like an alchemical laboratory. There are also some half-dozen small sitting-rooms, where the servants in this hot July may escape from the heat of the fire, and where the brave courier plays all sorts of musical instruments of his own manufacture all the evening long. A mighty old, wandering, ghostly, echoing, grim, bare house it is, as ever I beheld or thought of. There is a little vine-covered terrace opening from the drawing-room, and under this terrace, and forming one side of the little garden, is what used to be the stable. It is now a cow-house, and has three cows in it, so that we get new milk by the bucketful. There is no pasturage near, and they never go out, but are constantly lying down and surfeiting themselves with vine-leaves, perfect Italian cows enjoying the dolce far niente all day long. They are presided over and slept with by an old man named Antonio and his son, two burnt Siena natives with naked legs and feet, who wear each a shirt, a pair of trousers, and a red sash, with a relic or some sacred charm like the bonbon of a twelfth cake hanging round the neck. The old man is very anxious to convert me to the Catholic faith, and exhorts me frequently. We sit upon a stone by the door sometimes in the evening, like Robinson Crusoe and Friday reversed, and he generally relates, towards my conversion, an abridgment of the history of St. Peter, chiefly, I believe, from the unspeakable delight he has in his imitation of the cock. The view, as I have said, is charming but in the day you must keep the lattice blinds close shut, or the sun would drive you mad, and when the sun goes down you must shut up all the windows, or the mosquitoes would tempt you to commit suicide. So at this time of the year you don't see much of the prospect within doors. As for the flies, you don't mind them, nor the fleas, whose size is prodigious, and whose name is legion, and who populate the coach-house to that extent that I daily expect to see the carriage going off bodily, drawn by myriads of industrious fleas in harness. The rats are kept away quite comfortably by scores of lean cats who roam about the garden for that purpose. The lizards, of course, nobody cares for. They play in the sun and don't bite. The little scorpions are merely curious. The beetles are rather late and have not appeared yet. The frogs are company. There is a preserve of them in the grounds of the next villa, and after nightfall 
one would think that scores upon scores of women in patterns were going up and down a whetstone pavement without a moment's cessation. That is exactly the noise they make. The ruined chapel on the picturesque and beautiful seashore was dedicated once upon a time to St John the Baptist. I believe there is a legend that St John's bones were received there with various solemnities when they were first brought to Genoa, for Genoa possesses them to this day. When there is any uncommon tempest at sea, they are brought out and exhibited to the raging weather, which they never fail to calm. In consequence of this connection of St John with the city, great numbers of the common people are christened Giovanni Baptista, which latter name is pronounced in the Genoese patois, Baticcia, like a sneeze. To hear everybody calling everybody else Baticcia, on a Sunday, or Festa day, when there are crowds in the streets, is not a little singular and amusing to a stranger. The narrow lanes have great villas opening into them, whose walls, outside walls I mean, are profusely painted with all sorts of subjects, grim and holy. But time and the sea air have nearly obliterated them, and they look like the entrance to Vauxhall Gardens on a sunny day. The courtyards of these houses are overgrown with grass and weeds. All sorts of hideous patches cover the bases of the statues, as if they were afflicted with a cutaneous disorder. The outer gates are rusty, and the iron bars outside the lower windows are all tumbling down. Firewood is kept in halls, where costly treasures might be heaped up, mountains high. Waterfalls are dry and choked. Fountains, too dull to play and too lazy to work, have just enough recollection of their identity and their sleep to make the neighbourhood damp, and the Sirocco wind is often blowing over all these things for days together, like a gigantic oven out for a holiday. Not long ago there was a festa day in honour of the Virgin's mother, when the young men of the neighbourhood, having worn green wreaths of the vine in some procession or other, bathed in them by scores. It looked very odd and pretty, though I am bound to confess, not knowing of the festa at that time, that I thought, and was quite satisfied, they wore them as horses do, to keep the flies off. Soon afterwards there was another festa day, in honour of St. Nazaro. One of the Albaro young men brought two large bouquets soon after breakfast, and coming upstairs into the great sala, presented them himself. This was a polite way of begging for a contribution towards the expense of some music in the saint's honour, so we gave him whatever it may have been, and his messenger departed, well satisfied. At six o'clock in the evening we went to the church, close at hand, a very gaudy place, hung all over with festoons and bright draperies, and filled from the altar to the main door with women all seated. They wear no bonnets here, simply a long white veil, the metzero, and it was the most gauzy, ethereal-looking audience I ever saw. The young women are not generally pretty, but they walk remarkably well, and in their personal carriage and the management of their veils display much innate grace and elegance. There were some men present, not very many, and a few of these were kneeling about the aisles, while everybody else tumbled over them. Innumerable tapers were burning in the church. The bits of silver and tin about the saints, especially in the Virgin's necklace, sparkled brilliantly. The priests were seated about the chief altar. The organ played away lustily, and a full band did the like, while a conductor in a little gallery opposite to the band hammered away on the desk before him with a scroll, and a tenor, without any voice, sang. The band played one way, the organ played another, the singer went a third, and the unfortunate conductor banged and banged and flourished his scroll on some principle of his own, apparently well satisfied with the whole performance. I never did hear such a discordant din. The heat was intense all the time. The men in red caps and with loose coats hanging on their shoulders, they never put them on, were playing bowls and buying sweetmeats immediately outside the church. When half a dozen of them finished a game, they came into the aisle, crossed themselves with the holy water, 
knelt on one knee for an instant, and walked off again to play another game at bowls. They are remarkably expert at this diversion, and will play in the stony lanes and streets, and on the most uneven and disastrous ground for such a purpose, with as much nicety as on a billiard table. But the most favourite game is the national one of Mora, which they pursue with surprising ardour, and at which they will stake everything they possess. It is a destructive kind of gambling, requiring no accessories but the ten fingers, which are always, I intend no pun, at hand. Two men play together. One calls a number, say the extreme one ten. He marks what portion of it he pleases by throwing out three or four or five fingers, and his adversary has, in the same instant at hazard, and without seeing his hand, to throw out as many fingers as will make the exact balance. Their eyes and hands become so used to this, and act with such astonishing rapidity, that an uninitiated bystander would find it very difficult, if not impossible, to follow the progress of the game. The initiated, however, of whom there is always an eager group looking on, devour it with the most intense avidity, and as they are always ready to champion one side or the other in case of a dispute, and are frequently divided in their partisanship, it is often a very noisy proceeding. It is never the quietest game in the world, for the numbers are always called in a loud, sharp voice, and follow as close upon each other as they can be counted. On a holiday evening, standing at a window, or walking in a garden, or passing through the streets, or sauntering in any quiet place about the town, you will hear this game in progress in a score of wine-shops at once, and looking over any vineyard walk, or turning almost any corner, will come upon a knot of players in full cry. It is observable that most men have a propensity to throw out some particular number oftener than another and the vigilance with which two sharp-eyed players will mutually endeavour to detect this weakness and adapt their game to it is very curious and entertaining. The effect is greatly heightened by the universal suddenness and vehemence of gesture, two men playing for half a farthing with an intensity as all-absorbing as if the stake were life. Hard by here is a large palazzo, formerly belonging to some member of the Brignole family, but just now hired by a school of Jesuits for their summer quarters. I walked into its dismantled precincts the other evening about sunset, and couldn't help pacing up and down for a little time, drowsily taking in the aspect of the place, which is repeated hereabouts in all directions. I loitered to and fro under a colonnade, forming two sides of a weedy, grass-grown courtyard, whereof the house formed a third side, and a low terrace walk overlooking the garden and the neighbouring hills the fourth. I don't believe there was an uncracked stone in the whole pavement. In the centre was a melancholy statue, so piebald in its decay that it looked exactly as if it had been covered with sticking plaster, and afterwards powdered. The stables, coach-houses, offices were all empty, all ruinous, all utterly deserted. Doors had lost their hinges and were holding on by their latches. Windows were broken, painted plaster had peeled off and was lying about in clods. Fowls and cats had so taken possession of the outbuildings that I couldn't help thinking of the fairy tales and eyeing them with suspicion as transformed retainers waiting to be changed back again. One old Tom in particular, a scraggy brute with a hungry green eye, a poor relation in reality I'm inclined to think, came prowling round and round me as if he half believed for the moment that I might be the hero come to marry the lady and set all to rights. But discovering his mistake, he suddenly gave a grim snarl and walked away with such a tremendous tail that he couldn't get into the little hole where he lived but was obliged to wait outside until his indignation and his tail had gone down together. In a sort of summer-house, or whatever it may be in this colonnade, some Englishmen have been living like grubs in a nut, but the Jesuits had given them notice to go, and they had gone, and that was shut up too. The house, a wandering, echoing, thundering barrack of a place, 
with the lower windows barred up as usual, was wide open at the door, and I have no doubt I might have got in, and gone to bed and gone dead, and nobody a bit the wiser. Only one suite of rooms on an upper floor was tenanted, and from one of these the voice of a young lady vocalist, practising bravura lustily, came flaunting out upon the silent evening. I went down into the garden, intended to be prim and quaint, with avenues and terraces and orange trees and statues, and water in stone basins, and everything was green, gaunt, weedy, straggling, undergrown or overgrown, mildewy, damp, redolent of all sorts of slabby, clammy, creeping and uncomfortable life. There was nothing bright in the whole scene but a firefly one solitary firefly, showing against the dark bushes like the last little speck of the departed glory of the house, and even it went flitting up and down at sudden angles, and leaving a place with a jerk, and describing an irregular circle, and returning to the same place with a twitch that startled one, as if it were looking for the rest of the glory, and wondering, heaven knows it might, what had become of it. In the course of two months, the flitting shapes and shadows of my dismal entering reverie gradually resolved themselves into familiar forms and substances, and I already began to think that when the time should come a year hence for closing the long holiday and turning back to England, I might part from Genoa with anything but a glad heart. It is a place that grows upon you every day. There seems to be always something to find out in it. There are the most extraordinary alleys and byways to walk about in. You can lose your way, what a comfort that is when you are idle, twenty times a day if you like, and turn up again under the most unexpected and surprising difficulties. It abounds in the strangest contrasts. Things that are picturesque, ugly, mean, magnificent, delightful and offensive break upon the view at every turn. They who would know how beautiful the country immediately surrounding Genoa is, should climb, in clear weather, to the top of Montefaccio, or at least ride round the city walls, a feat more easily performed. No prospect can be more diversified and lovely than the changing views of the harbour, and the valleys of the two rivers, the Polchevera and the Bisagno, from the heights along which the strongly fortified walls are carried like the Great Wall of China in Little. In not the least picturesque part of this ride, there is a fair specimen of real Genoese tavern, where the visitor may derive good entertainment from real Genoese dishes, such as tagliarini, ravioli, German sausages, strong of garlic, sliced and eaten with fresh green figs, Coxcombs and sheep kidneys, chopped up with mutton chops and liver, small pieces of some unknown part of a calf, twisted into small shreds, fried and served up in a great dish like white bait, and other curiosities of that kind. They often get wine at these suburban trattoria, from France and Spain and Portugal, which is brought over by small captains in little trading vessels. They buy it at so much a bottle, without asking what it is, or caring to remember if anybody tells them, and usually divide it into two heaps, of which they label one champagne, and the other Madeira. The various opposite flavours, qualities, countries, age and vintages, that are comprised under these two general heads, is quite extraordinary. The most limited range is probably from cool gruel up to old masala, and down again to apple tea. The great majority of the streets are as narrow as any thoroughfare can well be, where people, even Italian people, are supposed to live and walk about, being mere lanes with here and there a kind of well or breathing place. The houses are immensely high, painted in all sorts of colours, and are in every stage and state of damage, dirt and lack of repair. They are commonly let off in floors or flats, like the houses in the old town of Edinburgh, or many houses in Paris. There are few street doors, the entrance halls are for the most part looked upon as public property, 
and any moderately enterprising scavenger might make a fine fortune by now and then clearing them out. As it is impossible for coaches to penetrate into these streets, there are sedan chairs, gilded and otherwise, for hire in diverse places. A great many private chairs are also kept among the nobility and gentry, and at night these are trotted to and fro in all directions, preceded by bearers of great lanthorns made of linen stretched upon a frame. The sedans and lanthorns are the legitimate successors of the long strings of patient and much abused mules that go jingling their little bells through these confined streets all day long. They follow them as regularly as the stars the sun. When shall I forget the streets of palaces, the Strada Nuova and the Strada Balbi, or how the former looked one summer day when I first saw it underneath the brightest and most intensely blue of summer skies, which its narrow perspective of immense mansions reduced to a tapering and most precious strip of brightness looking down upon the heavy shade below. A brightness not too common even in July and August to be well esteemed, for if the truth must out, there were not eight blue skies in as many midsummer weeks, saving sometimes early in the morning, when looking out to sea the water and the firmament were one world of deep and brilliant blue. At other times there were clouds and haze enough to make an Englishman grumble in his own climate. The endless details of these rich palaces, the walls of some of them within, alive with masterpieces by Van Dyck, the great heavy stone balconies one above another, and tier over tier, with here and there one larger than the rest, towering high up, a huge marble platform, the doorless vestibules, massively barred lower windows, immense public staircases, thick marble pillars, strong dungeon-like arches, and dreary, dreaming, echoing vaulted chambers, among which the eye wanders again and again and again, as every palace is succeeded by another. The terrace gardens between house and house, with green arches of the vine and groves of orange trees, and blushing oleander in full bloom, twenty, thirty, forty feet above the street. The painted halls, mouldering and blotting and rotting in the damp corners, and still shining out in beautiful colours and voluptuous designs, where the walls are dry. The faded figures on the outsides of the houses, holding wreaths and crowns, and flying upward and downward, and standing in niches, and here and there looking fainter and more feeble than elsewhere, by contrast with some fresh little cupids, who on a more recently decorated portion of the front are stretching out what seems to be the semblance of a blanket, but is indeed a sundial. The steep, steep uphill streets of small palaces, but very large palaces for all that, with marble terraces looking down into close byways, the magnificent and innumerable churches, and the rapid passage from a street of stately edifices into a maze of the vilest squalor, steaming with unwholesome stenches, and swarming with half-naked children, and whole worlds of dirty people, make up altogether such a scene of wonder, so lively and yet so dead, so noisy and yet so quiet, so obtrusive and yet so shy and lowering, so wide awake and yet so fast asleep, that it is a sort of intoxication to a stranger to walk on and on and on, and look about him. A bewildering phantasmagoria, with all the inconsistency of a dream, and all the pain and all the pleasure of an extravagant reality. The different uses to which some of these palaces are applied, all at once, is characteristic. For instance, the English banker, my excellent and hospitable friend, has his office in a good-sized palazzo in the Strada Nuova. In the hall, every inch of which is elaborately painted, but which is as dirty as a police station in London, a hook-nosed Saracen's head with an immense quantity of black hair, there is a man attached to it, sells walking sticks. On the other side of the doorway, a lady with a showy handkerchief for headdress, wife to the Saracen's head, I believe, sells articles of her own knitting, and sometimes flowers. 
A little further in, two or three blind men occasionally beg. Sometimes they are visited by a man without legs on a little go-cart, but who has such a fresh-coloured, lively face, and such a respectable, well-conditioned body, that he looks as if he had sunk into the ground up to his middle, or had come, but partially, up a flight of cellar steps to speak to somebody. A little further in, a few men, perhaps, lie asleep in the middle of the day, or they may be chairmen waiting for their absent freight. If so, they have brought their chairs in with them, and there they stand also. On the left of the hall is a little room, a hatter's shop. On the first floor is the English bank. On the first floor also is a whole house and a good large residence too. Heaven knows what there may be above that, but when you are there you have only just begun to go upstairs. And yet coming downstairs again, thinking of this, and passing out at a great crazy door in the back of the hall, instead of turning the other way to get into the street again, it bangs behind you, making the dismalest and most lonesome echoes, and you stand in a yard, the yard of the same house, which seems to have been unvisited by human foot for a hundred years. Not a sound disturbs its repose, not a head thrust out of any of the grim, dark, jealous windows within sight makes the weeds in the cracked pavement faint of heart, by suggesting the possibility of there being hands to grub them up. Opposite to you is a giant figure carved in stone, reclining with an urn upon a lofty piece of artificial rockwork, and out of the urn dangles the fag-end of a leaden pipe, which once upon a time poured a small torrent down the rocks. But the eye-sockets of the giant are not drier than this channel is now, he seems to have given his urn, which is nearly upside down, a final tilt, and after crying like a sepulchral child, all gone, to have lapsed into a stony silence. In the streets of shops the houses are much smaller, but of great size, notwithstanding, and extremely high. They are very dirty, quite undrained, if my nose be at all reliable and emit a peculiar fragrance, like the smell of a very bad cheese kept in very hot blankets. Notwithstanding the height of the houses, there would seem to have been a lack of room in the city, for new houses are thrust in everywhere. Wherever it has been possible to cram a tumble-down tenement into a crack or corner, in it has gone. If there be a nook or angle in the wall of a church, or a crevice in any other dead wall of any sort, there you are sure to find some kind of habitation, looking as if it had grown there like a fungus. Against the government house, against the old senate house, round about any large building, little shops stick so close like parasite vermin to the great carcass. And for all this, look where you may, up steps, down steps, anywhere, everywhere, there are irregular houses, receding, starting forward, tumbling down, leaning against their neighbours, crippling themselves or their friends by some means or other, until one more irregular than the rest chokes up the way, and you can't see any further. One of the rottenest-looking parts of the town, I think, is down by the landing wharf, though it may be that its being associated with a great deal of rottenness on the evening of our arrival has stamped it deeper in my mind. Here again the houses are very high, and are of an infinite variety of deformed shapes, and have, as most of the houses have, something hanging out of a great many windows, and wafting its frowsy fragrance on the breeze. Sometimes it is a curtain, sometimes it is a carpet, sometimes it is a bed, sometimes a whole line full of clothes, but there is almost always something. Before the basement of these houses is an arcade over the pavement, very massive, dark and low, like an old crypt. The stone or plaster of which it is made has turned quite black, and against every one of these black piles all sorts of filth and garbage seem to accumulate spontaneously. Beneath some of the arches, the cellars of macaroni and polenta establish their stalls, which are by no means inviting. The offal of a fish market near at hand, that is to say of a back lane, where people sit upon the ground, 
and on various old bulkheads and sheds, and sell fish when they have any to dispose of, and of a vegetable market constructed on the same principle, are contributed to the decoration of this quarter, and as all the mercantile business is transacted here, and it is crowded all day, it has a very decided flavour about it. The Porto Franco, or Free Port, where goods brought in from foreign countries pay no duty until they are sold and taken out, as in a bonded warehouse in England, is down here also. And two portentous officials in cocked hats stand at the gate to search you if they choose, and to keep out monks and ladies. For sanctity as well as beauty has been known to yield to the temptation of smuggling, and in the same way, that is to say, by concealing the smuggled property beneath the loose folds of its dress. So sanctity and beauty may by no means enter. The streets of Genoa would be all the better for the importation of a few priests of prepossessing appearance. Every fourth or fifth man in the streets is a priest or a monk, and there is pretty sure to be at least one itinerant ecclesiastic inside or outside every hackney carriage on the neighbouring roads. I have no knowledge elsewhere of more repulsive countenances than are to be found among these gentry. If nature's handwriting be at all legible, greater varieties of sloth, deceit and intellectual torpor could hardly be observed among any class of men in the world. Mr. Pepys once heard a clergyman assert in his sermon, in illustration of his respect for the priestly office, that if he could meet a priest and angel together, he would salute the priest first. I am rather of the opinion of Petrarch, who, when his pupil Boccaccio wrote to him in great tribulation, that he had been visited and admonished for his writings by a Carthusian friar, who claimed to be a messenger immediately commissioned by heaven for that purpose, replied that for his own part he would take the liberty of testing the reality of the commission by personal observation of the messenger's face, eyes, forehead, behaviour and discourse. I cannot but believe myself from similar observation that many unaccredited celestial messengers may be seen skulking through the streets of Genoa or droning away their lives in other Italian towns. Perhaps the Cappuccini, though not a learned body, are, as an order, the best friends of the people. They seem to mingle with them more immediately as their counsellors and comforters, and to go among them more when they are sick, and to pry less than some other orders into the secrets of families, for the purpose of establishing a baleful ascendancy over their weaker members, and to be influenced by a less fierce desire to make converts, and once made to let them go to ruin soul and body. They may be seen in their coarse dress in all parts of the town at all times, and begging in the markets early in the morning. The Jesuits, too, muster strong in the streets, and go slinking noiselessly about in pairs like black cats. In some of the narrow passages distinct trades congregate, there is a street of jewellers, and there is a row of booksellers. But even down in places where nobody ever can or ever could penetrate in a carriage, there are mighty old palaces shut in among the gloomiest and closest walls, and almost shut out from the sun. Very few of the tradesmen have any idea of setting forth their goods, or disposing them for show. If you, a stranger, want to buy anything, you usually look round the shop till you see it, then clutch it if it be within reach, and inquire how much. Everything is sold at the most unlikely place. If you want coffee, you go to a sweetmeat shop, and if you want meat, you will probably find it behind an old check curtain down half a dozen steps, in some sequestered nook as hard to find, as if the commodity were poison, and Genoa's law were death to any that uttered it. Most of the apothecary's shops are great lounging places. Here grave men with sticks sit down in the shade for hours together, passing a meagre Genoa paper from hand to hand, and talking drowsily and sparingly about the news. Two or three of these are poor physicians, ready to proclaim themselves on an emergency and tear off with any messenger who may arrive. 
you may know them by the way in which they stretch their necks to listen when you enter and by the sigh with which they fall back again into their dull corners on finding that you only want medicine few people lounge in the barber's shops though they are very numerous as hardly any man shaves himself but the apothecary's has its group of loungers who sit back among the bottles with their hands folded over the tops of their sticks so still and quiet that either you don't see them in the darkened shop or mistake them as i did one ghostly man in bottle green one day with a hat like a stopper for horse chapter four part two of pictures from italy by charles dickens this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Anthony Ogus. On a summer evening the Genoese are as fond of putting themselves, as their ancestors were of putting houses, in every available inch of space in and about the town. In all the lanes and alleys, and up every little ascent, and on every dwarf wall, and on every flight of steps, they cluster like bees. Meanwhile, and especially on fester days, the bells of the churches ring incessantly, not in peals or any known form of sound, but in a horrible, irregular jerking, dingle, 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 with a sudden stop at every fifteenth dingle or so, which is maddening. This performance is usually achieved by a boy up in the steeple, who takes hold of the clapper, or a little rope attached to it, and tries to dingle louder than every other boy similarly employed. The noise is supposed to be particularly obnoxious to evil spirits, but looking up into the steeples and seeing and hearing these young Christians thus engaged, one might very naturally mistake them for the enemy. Fester days early in the autumn are very numerous. All the shops were shut up twice within a week for these holidays, and one night all the houses in the neighbourhood of a particular church were illuminated, while the church itself was lighted outside with torches, and a grove of blazing links was erected in an open space outside one of the city gates. This part of the ceremony is prettier and more singular a little way in the country, where you can trace the illuminated cottages all the way up a steep hillside and where you pass festoons of tapers wasting away in the starlight night before some lonely little house upon the road. On these days they always dress the church of the saint in whose honour the fester is holden very gaily. Gold-embroidered festoons of different colours hang from the arches. The altar furniture is set forth, and sometimes even the lofty pillars are swathed from top to bottom in tight-fitting draperies. The cathedral is dedicated to San Lorenzo. On San Lorenzo's day we went into it, just as the sun was setting. Although these decorations are usually in very indifferent taste, the effect just then was very superb indeed, for the whole building was dressed in red, and the sinking sun, streaming in through a great red curtain in the chief doorway, made all the gorgeousness its own. When the sun went down, and it gradually grew quite dark inside, except for a few twinkling tapers on the principal altar, and some small dangling silver lamps, it was very mysterious and effective. But sitting in any of the churches towards evening is like a mild dose of opium. With the money collected at a festa, they usually pay for the dressing of the church, and for the hiring of the band, and for the tapers. If there be any left, which seldom happens, I believe, the souls in purgatory get the benefit of it. They are also supposed to have the benefit of the exertions of certain small boys who shake money-boxes before some mysterious little buildings like rural turnpikes, which, usually shut up close, fly open on red-letter days and disclose an image and some flowers inside. Just without the city gate on the Albara road is a small house with an altar in it and a stationary money box, also for the benefit of the souls in purgatory. Still further to stimulate the charitable, there is a monstrous painting on the plaster on either side of the grated door, 
representing a select party of souls frying. One of them has a grey moustache and an elaborate head of grey hair, as if he had been taken out of a hairdresser's window and cast into the furnace. There he is, a most grotesque and hideously comic old soul, forever blistering in the real sun and melting in the mimic fire, for the gratification and improvement, and the contributions, of the poor Genoese. They are not a very joyous people, and are seldom seen to dance on their holidays, the staple places of entertainment among the women being the churches and the public walks. They are very good-tempered, obliging, and industrious. Industry has not made them clean, for their habitations are extremely filthy, and their usual occupation on a fine Sunday morning is to sit at their doors hunting in each other's heads. But their dwellings are so close and confined that if those parts of the city had been beaten down by Massena in the time of the terrible blockade, it would at least have occasioned one public benefit among many misfortunes. The peasant women with naked feet and legs are so constantly washing clothes in the public tanks and in every stream and ditch that one cannot help wondering, in the midst of all this dirt, who wears them when they are clean. The custom is to lay the wet linen which is being operated upon on a smooth stone and hammer away at it with a flat wooden mallet. This they do as furiously as if they were revenging themselves on dress in general for being connected with the fall of mankind. It is not unusual to see, lying on the edge of the tank at these times, or on another flat stone, an unfortunate baby, tightly swathed up, arms and legs and all, in an enormous quantity of wrapper, so that it is unable to move a toe or finger. This custom, which we often see represented in old pictures, is universal among the common people. A child is left anywhere without the possibility of crawling away, or is accidentally knocked off a shelf, or tumbled out of bed, or is hung up to a hook now and then, and left dangling like a doll at an English rag-shop, without the least inconvenience to anybody. I was sitting one Sunday, soon after my arrival, in the little country church of San Martino, a couple of miles from the city, while a baptism took place. I saw the priest and an attendant with a large taper, and a man and a woman and some others, but I had no more idea until the ceremony was over that it was a baptism, or that the curious little stiff instrument that was passed from one to another in the course of the ceremony by the handle, like a short poker, was a child, than I had that it was my own christening. I borrowed the child afterwards for a minute or two, it was lying across the font then, and found it very red in the face, but perfectly quiet, and not to be bent on any terms. The number of cripples in the street soon ceased to surprise me. There are plenty of saints and virgin shrines, of course, generally at the corners of streets. The favourite memento to the faithful about Genoa is a painting, representing a peasant on his knees with a spade and some other agricultural implements beside him, and the Madonna, with the infant saviour in her arms, appearing to him in a cloud. This is the legend of the Madonna della Guardia, a chapel on a mountain within a few miles which is in high repute. It seems that this peasant lived all alone by himself, tilling some land atop of the mountain, where... Being a devout man, he daily said his prayers to the Virgin in the open air, for his hut was a very poor one. Upon a certain day the Virgin appeared to him as in the picture, and said, Why do you pray in the open air and without a priest? The peasant explained, because there was neither priest nor church at hand, a very uncommon complaint indeed in Italy. I should wish then, said the celestial visitor, to have a chapel built here, in which the prayers of the faithful may be offered up. But, Santissima Madonna, said the peasant, I am a poor man, and chapels cannot be built without money. They must be supported too, Santissima, for to have a chapel and not support it liberally is a wickedness, a deadly sin. This sentiment gave great satisfaction to the visitor. Go, said she, there is such a village in the valley on the left, and such another village in the valley on the right, and such another village elsewhere that will gladly contribute to the building of a chapel. Go to them. 
relate what you have seen, and do not doubt that sufficient money will be forthcoming to erect my chapel, or that it will afterwards be handsomely maintained. All of which, miraculously, turned out to be quite true. And in proof of this prediction and revelation, there is the chapel of the Madonna della Guardia, rich and flourishing at this day. The splendour and variety of the Genoese churches can hardly be exaggerated. The Church of the Annunciata especially, built like many of the others at the cost of one noble family, and now in slow progress of repair, from the outer door to the utmost height of the high cupola, is so elaborately painted and set in gold that it looks, as Simon describes it in his charming book on Italy, like a great enamelled stuff-box. Most of the richer churches contain some beautiful pictures or other embellishments of great price, almost universally set side by side with sprawling effigies of maudlin monks and the various trash and tinsel ever seen. It may be a consequence of the frequent direction of the popular mind and pocket to the souls in purgatory, but there is very little tenderness for the bodies of the dead here. For the very poor, there are immediately outside one angle of the walls and behind a jutting point of the fortification near the sea, certain common pits, one for every day in the year, which all remain closed up until the turn of each comes for the daily reception of dead bodies. Among the troops in the town there are usually some Swiss, more or less. When any of these die, they are buried out of a fund maintained by such of their countrymen as a resident in Genoa. Their providing coffins for these men is a matter of great astonishment to the authorities. Certainly the effect of this promiscuous and indecent splashing down of dead people in so many wells is bad. It surrounds death with the revolting associations that insensibly become connected with those whom death is approaching. Indifference and avoidance are the natural result, and all the softening influences of the great sorrow are harshly disturbed. There is a ceremony when an old cavalier or the like expires, of erecting a pile of benches in the cathedral to represent his bier, covering them over with a pall of black velvet, putting his hat and sword on the top, making a little square of seats about the whole, and sending out formal invitations to his friends and acquaintances to come and sit there and hear mass, which is performed at the principal altar, decorated with an infinity of candles for that purpose. When the better kind of people die, or at the point of death, their nearest relations generally walk off, retiring into the country for a little change, and leaving the body to be disposed of without any superintendence from them. The procession is usually formed, and the coffin borne, and the funeral conducted, by a body of persons called a confraternita, who, as a kind of voluntary penance, undertake to perform these offices in regular rotation for the dead, but who, mingling something of pride with their humility, are dressed in a loose garment covering their whole person, and wear a hood concealing the face, with breathing holes and apertures for the eyes. The effect of this costume is very ghastly, especially in the case of a certain blue confraternita belonging to Genoa, who, to say the least of them, are very ugly customers, and who look, suddenly encountered in their pious ministration in the streets, as if they were ghouls or demons bearing off the body for themselves. Although such a custom may be liable to the abuse attendant on many Italian customs, of being recognised as a means of establishing a current account with heaven, on which to draw too easily for future bad actions, or as an expiation for past misdeeds, it must be admitted to be a good one, and a practical one, and one involving unquestionably good works. A voluntary service like this is surely better than the imposed penance, not at all an infrequent one, of giving so many licks to such and such a stone in the pavement of the cathedral, or than a vow to the Madonna to wear nothing but blue for a year or two. This is supposed to give great delight above, blue being, as is well known, the Madonna's favourite colour. Women who have devoted themselves to this act of faith are very commonly seen walking in the streets. There are three theatres in the city, besides an old one now rarely open. 
the most important, the Carlo Felici, the opera house of Genoa, is a very splendid, commodious and beautiful theatre. A company of comedians were acting there when we arrived, and soon after their departure a second-rate opera company came. The great season is not until the carnival time in the spring. Nothing impressed me so much in my visits here, which were pretty numerous, as the uncommonly hard and cruel character of the audience, who resent the slightest defect, take nothing good-humouredly, seem to be always lying in wait for an opportunity to hiss, and spare the actresses as little as the actors. But as there is nothing else of a public nature at which they are allowed to express the least disapprobation, perhaps they are resolved to make the most of the opportunity. There are a great number of Piedmontese officers, too, who are allowed the privilege of kicking their heels in the pit for next to nothing, gratuitous or cheap accommodation for these gentlemen being insisted on by the governor in all public or semi-public entertainments. They are lofty critics in consequence, and infinitely more exacting than if they made the unhappy manager's fortune. The Teatro di Orno, or Day Theatre, is a covered stage in the open air, where the performance takes place by daylight in the cool of the afternoon, commencing at four or five o'clock, and lasting some three hours. It is curious, sitting among the audience, to have a fine view of the neighbouring hills and houses, and to see the neighbours at their windows looking on, and to hear the bells of the churches and convents ringing at most complete cross-purposes with the scene. Beyond this, and the novelty of seeing a play in the fresh pleasant air, with the darkening in evening closing in, there is nothing very exciting or characteristic in the performances. The actors are indifferent, and though they sometimes represent one of Goldoni's comedies, the staple of the drama is French. Anything like nationality is dangerous to despotic governments and Jesuit beleaguered kings. The Theatre of Puppets, or Marionetti, a famous company from Milan, is, without any exception, the drollest exhibition I ever beheld in my life. I never saw anything so exquisitely ridiculous. They look between four and five feet high, but are really much smaller, for when a musician in the orchestra happens to put his hat on the stage, it becomes alarmingly gigantic, and almost blots out an actor. They usually play a comedy and a ballet. The comic man in the comedy I saw one summer night is a waiter in a hotel. There never was such a locomotive actor since the world began. Great pains are taken with him. He has extra joints in his legs and a practical eye with which he winks at the pit in a manner that is absolutely insupportable to a stranger, but which the initiated audience, mainly composed of the common people, receive, so they do everything else, quite as a matter of course, and as if he were a man. His spirits are prodigious. He continually shakes his legs and winks his eye. And there is a heavy father with grey hair, who sits down on the regular conventional stage bank and blesses his daughter in the regular conventional way, who is tremendous. No one would suppose it possible that anything short of a real man could be so tedious. It is the triumph of art. In the ballet, an enchanter runs away with the bride in the very hour of her nuptials. He brings her to his cave and tries to soothe her. They sit down on a sofa the regular sofa in the regular place, O.P. second entrance, and a procession of musicians enters, one creature playing a drum and knocking himself off his legs at every blow. These failing to delight her, dancers appear, four first, then two, the two, the flesh-coloured two. The way in which they dance, the height to which they spring, the impossible and inhuman extent to which they pirouette, the revelation of their preposterous legs, the coming down with a pause on the very tips of their toes when the music requires it, the gentleman's retiring up when it is the lady's turn, and the lady's retiring up when it is the gentleman's turn, the final passion of a pas de deux, and the going off with a bound. I shall never see a real ballet with a composed countenance again. I went another night to see these puppets act a play called St. Helena, or the death of Napoleon. 
It begins by the disclosure of Napoleon with an immense head, seated on a sofa in his chamber at Santa Helena, to whom his valet enters with this obscure announcement. So you would see on Lao, the hours in cow. Sir Hudson, that you could have seen his regimentals, was a perfect mammoth of a man to Napoleon, hideously ugly with a monstrously disproportionate face and a great clump for his lower jaw to express his tyrannical and obdurate nature. He began his system of persecution by calling his prisoner General Bonaparte, to which the latter replied with the deepest tragedy, "'So you would see on Lao, call me not thus. Repeat that phrase and leave me. I am Napoleon, Emperor of France.' So you would see on, nothing daunted, proceeded to entertain him with an ordinance of the British government, regulating the state he should preserve, and the furniture of his rooms, and limiting his attendance to four or five persons. Four or five for me?' said Napoleon. "'Me? One hundred thousand men were lately at my sole command, and this English officer talks of four or five for me.' Throughout the piece, Napoleon, who talked very like the real Napoleon and was forever having small soliloquies by himself, was very bitter on these English officers and these English soldiers, to the great satisfaction of the audience, who were perfectly delighted to have Lowe bullied, and who did, whenever Lowe said General Bonaparte, which he always did, always receiving the same correction, quite execrated him. It would be hard to say why, for Italians have little cause to sympathise with Napoleon, heaven knows. There was no plot at all, except that a French officer, disguised as an Englishman, came to propound a plan of escape, and being discovered, but not before Napoleon had magnanimously refused to steal his freedom, was immediately ordered off by Lowe to be hanged. In two very long speeches, which Lowe made memorable by winding up with Yuz to show that he was English, which brought down thunders of applause, Napoleon was so affected by this catastrophe that he fainted away on the spot and was carried out by two other puppets. Judging from what followed, it would appear that he never recovered the shock, for the next act showed him in a clean shirt in his bed, curtains crimson and white, where a lady, prematurely dressed in mourning, brought two little children, who kneeled down by the bedside, while he made a decent end, the last words on his lips being, Vatalo! It was unspeakably ludicrous. Bonaparte's boots were so wonderfully beyond control, and did such marvellous things of their own accord, doubling themselves up and getting under tables and dangling in the air and sometimes skating away with him, out of all human knowledge when he was in full speech, mischances which were not rendered the less absurd by a settled melancholy depicted in his face. To put an end to one conference with Lowe, he had to go to a table and read a book, when it was the finest spectacle I ever beheld to see his body bending over the volume like a bootjack and his sentimental eyes glaring obstinately into the pit. He was prodigiously good in bed, with an immense collar to his shirt and his little hands outside the coverlet. So was Dr. Antomarchi, represented by a puppet with long lank hair like moorworms, who in consequence of some derangement of his wires hovered about the couch like a vulture, and gave medical opinions in the air. He was almost as good as Lowe, though the latter was great at all times, a decided brute and villain beyond all possibility of mistake. Lowe was especially fine at the last, when, hearing the doctor and the valet say, The emperor is dead, he pulled out his watch and wound up the piece, not the watch, by exclaiming with characteristic brutality, Ha ha! Eleven minutes to six, the general dead and the spy hanged. This brought the curtain down, triumphantly. There is not in Italy, they say, and I believe them, a lovelier residence than the Palazzo Pescieri, or Palace of the Fish Ponds, whither we removed as soon as our three months' tenancy of the pink jail at Albaro had ceased and determined. It stands on a height within the walls of Genoa, 
but aloof from the town, surrounded by beautiful gardens of its own, adorned with statues, vases, fountains, marble basins, terraces, walks of orange trees and lemon trees, groves of roses and camellias. All its apartments are beautiful in their proportions and decorations. But the great hall, some fifty feet in height, with three large windows at the end, overlooking the whole town of Genoa, the harbour and the neighbouring sea, affords one of the most fascinating and delightful prospects in the world. Any house more cheerful and habitable than the great rooms are within, it will be difficult to conceive and certainly nothing more delicious than the scene without, in sunshine or in moonlight, could be imagined. It is more like an enchanted place in an eastern story than a grave and sober lodging. How you may wander on from room to room, and never tire of the wild fancies on the walls and ceilings, as bright in their fresh colouring as if they had been painted yesterday, or how one floor, or even the great hall which opens on eight other rooms, is a spacious promenade, or how there are corridors and bedchambers above, which we never use and rarely visit, and scarcely know the way through, or how there is a view of a perfectly different character on each of the four sides of the building, matters little. But that prospect from the hall is like a vision to me. I go back to it in fancy, as I have done in calm reality a hundred times a day, and stand there looking out, with the sweet scents from the garden rising up about me, in a perfect dream of happiness. There lies all Genoa in beautiful confusion, with its many churches, monasteries and convents, pointing up into the sunny sky. And down below me, just where the roofs begin, a solitary convent parapet, fashioned like a gallery, with an iron across at the end, where sometimes early in the morning I have seen a little group of dark-veiled nuns gliding sorrowfully to and fro, and stopping now and then to peep down upon the waking world in which they have no part. Old Monte Faccio, brightest of hills in good weather, but sulkiest when storms are coming on, is here upon the left. The fort within the walls, the good king built it to command the town, and beat the houses of the Genoese about their ears in case they should be discontented, commands that height upon the right. The broad sea lies beyond, in front there, and that line of coast, beginning by the lighthouse and tapering away, a mere speck in the rosy distance, is the beautiful coast road that leads to Nice. The garden near at hand, among the roofs and houses, all red with roses and fresh with little fountains, is the Aquasola, a public promenade where the military band plays gaily and the white veils cluster thick and the Genoese nobility ride round and round and round in state clothes and coaches at least, if not in absolute wisdom. Within a stone's throw, as it seems, the audience of the day theatre sit, their faces turned this way. But as the stage is hidden, it is very odd, without a knowledge of the cause, to see their faces change so suddenly from earnestness to laughter, and odder still to hear the rounds upon rounds of applause, rattling in the evening air, to which the curtain falls. But being Sunday night, they act their best and most attractive play, and now the sun is going down in such magnificent array of red and green and golden light as neither pen nor pencil could depict, and to the ringing of the vesper bells darkness sets in at once without a twilight. Then lights begin to shine in Genoa and on the country road, and the revolving lanthorn out at sea there, flashing for an instant on this palace front and portico, illuminates it as if there were a bright moon bursting from behind a cloud, then merges it in deep obscurity. And this, so far as I know, is the only reason why the Genoese avoid it after dark and think it haunted. My memory will haunt it many nights in time to come, but nothing worse I will engage. The same ghost will occasionally sail away, as I did one pleasant autumn evening, into the bright prospect and sniff the morning air at Marseilles. The corpulent hairdresser was still sitting in his slippers outside his shop door there, 
but the twirling ladies in the window, with the natural inconstancy of their sex, had ceased to twirl, and were languishing, stock still, with their beautiful faces addressed to blind corners of the establishment, where it was impossible for admirers to penetrate. The steamer had come from Genoa in a delicious run of eighteen hours, and we were going to run back again by the Cornish road from Nice, not being satisfied to have seen only the outsides of the beautiful towns that rise in picturesque white clusters from among the olive woods and rocks and hills upon the margin of the sea. The boat which started for Nice that night at eight o'clock was very small, and so crowded with goods that there was scarcely room to move, neither was there anything to eat on board except bread, nor to drink except coffee. But being due at Nice at about eight or so in the morning, this was of no consequence, so when we began to wink at the bright stars in involuntary acknowledgement of their winking at us, we turned into our berths in a crowded but cool little cabin, and slept soundly till morning. The boat, being as dull and dogged a little boat as ever was built, it was within an hour of noon when we turned into Nice Harbour, where we very little expected anything but breakfast, but we were laden with wool. Wool must not remain in the custom house at Marseille more than twelve months at a stretch without paying duty. It is the custom to make fictitious removals of unsold wool to evade this law, to take it somewhere when the twelve months are nearly out, bring it straight back again and warehouse it as a new cargo for nearly twelve months longer. This wool of ours had come originally from some place in the east. It was recognised as eastern produce the moment we entered the harbour. Accordingly, the gay little Sunday boats, full of holiday people, which had come off to greet us, were warned away by the authorities. We were declared in quarantine, and a great flag was solemnly run up to the masthead on the wharf to make it known to all the town. It was a very hot day indeed. We were unshaved, unwashed, undressed, unfed, and could hardly enjoy the absurdity of lying blistering in a lazy harbour, with the town looking on from a respectful distance, all manner of whiskered men in cocked hats discussing our fate at a remote guardhouse, with gestures, we looked very hard at them through telescopes, expressive of a week's detention at least, and nothing whatever the matter all the time. But even in this crisis the brave courier achieved a triumph. He telegraphed somebody, I saw nobody, either naturally connected with the hotel or put en rapport with the establishment for that occasion only. The telegraph was answered, and in half an hour or less there came a loud shout from the guardhouse. The captain was wanted. Everybody helped the captain into his boat. Everybody got his luggage and said we were going. The captain rode away and disappeared behind a little jutting corner of the galley slave's prison, and presently came back with something very sulkily. The brave courier met him at the side and received the something as its rightful owner. It was a wicker basket folded in a linen cloth, and in it were two great bottles of wine, a roast fowl, some salt fish chopped with garlic, a great loaf of bread, a dozen or so of peaches, and a few other trifles. When we had selected our own breakfast, the brave courier invited a chosen party to partake of these refreshments, and assured them that they need not be deterred by motives of delicacy, as he would order a second basket to be furnished at their expense, which he did, no one knew how, and by and by the captain being again summoned, again sulkily returned with another something, over which my popular attendant presided as before, carving with a clasp knife his own personal property, something smaller than a Roman sword. The whole party on board were made merry by these unexpected supplies, but none more so than a loquacious little Frenchman who got drunk in five minutes and a sturdy cappuccino friar who had taken everybody's fancy mightily and was one of the best friars in the world, I verily believe. He had a free open countenance and a rich brown flowing beard and was a remarkably handsome man of about fifty. 
He had come up to us early in the morning and inquired whether we were sure to be at Nice by eleven, saying that he particularly wanted to know because if we reached it by that time he would have to perform mass and must deal with the consecrated wafer fasting, whereas if there were no chance of his being in time he would immediately breakfast. He made this communication under the idea that the brave courier was the captain, and indeed he looked much more like it than anybody else on board. Being assured that we should arrive in good time, he fasted, and talked fasting to everybody with the most charming good humour, answering jokes at the expense of friars, with other jokes at the expense of laymen, and saying that friar as he was, he would engage to take up the two strongest men on board, one after the other with his teeth, and carry them along the deck. Nobody gave him the opportunity, but I dare say he could have done it, for he was a gallant noble figure of a man, even in the cappuccino dress, which is the ugliest and most ungainly that can well be. All this had given great delight to the loquacious Frenchman, who gradually patronised the friar very much, and seemed to commiserate him as one who might have been born a Frenchman himself, but for an unfortunate destiny. Although his patronage was such as a mouse might bestow upon a lion, he had a vast opinion of its condescension, and in the warmth of that sentiment occasionally rose on tiptoe to slap the friar on the back. When the baskets arrived, it being then too late for mass, the friar went to work bravely, eating prodigiously of the cold meat and bread, drinking deep draughts of the wine, smoking cigars, taking snuff, sustaining an uninterrupted conversation with all hands, and occasionally running to the boat's side and hailing somebody on shore, with the intelligence that we must be got out of this quarantine somehow or other, as he had to take part in a great religious procession in the afternoon. After this he would come back laughing lustily from pure good humour, while the Frenchman wrinkled his small face into ten thousand creases, and said how droll it was, and what a brave boy was that friar. At length the heat of the sun without and the wine within made the Frenchman sleepy, so in the noontide of his patronage of his gigantic protégé he lay down among the wool and began to snore. It was four o'clock before we were released, and the Frenchman, dirty and woolly and snuffy, was still sleeping when the friar went ashore. As soon as we were free, we all hurried away to wash and dress, that we might make a decent appearance at the procession, and I saw no more of the Frenchman until we took up our station in the main street to see it pass, when he squeezed himself into a front place elaborately renovated threw back his little coat to show a broad-barred velvet waistcoat, sprinkled all over with stars, then adjusted himself in his cane, so as utterly to bewilder and transfix the friar when he should appear. The procession was a very long one, and included an immense number of people divided into small parties, each party chanting nasally on its own account, without reference to any other, and producing a most dismal result. There were angels, crosses, virgins carried on flat boards, surrounded by cupids, crowns, saints, missals, infantry, tapers, monks, nuns, relics, dignitaries of the church in green hats, walking under crimson parasols, and here and there a species of sacred street lamp hoisted on a pole. We looked out anxiously for the cappuccini, and presently their brown robes and corded girdles were seen coming on in a body. I observed the little Frenchman chuckle over the idea that when the friar saw him in the broad-barred waistcoat, he would mentally exclaim, "'Is this my patron, that distinguished man?' and would be covered with confusion. Ah, never was the Frenchman so deceived. As our friend the Cappuccino advanced with folded arms, he looked straight into the visage of the little Frenchman, with a bland, serene, composed abstraction not to be described. There was not the faintest trace of recognition or amusement on his features, not the smallest consciousness of bread and meat, wine, snuff, or cigars. C'est lui-même, I heard the little Frenchman say in some doubt. Oh, yes, it was himself. 
It was not his brother or his nephew very like him. It was he. He walked in great state, being one of the superiors of the order, and looked his part to admiration. There never was anything so perfect of its kind as the contemplative way in which he allowed his placid gaze to rest on us, his late companions, as if he had never seen us in his life and didn't see us then. The Frenchman, quite humbled, took off his hat at last, but the friar still passed on with the same imperturbable serenity, and the broad-barred waistcoat fading into the crowd was seen no more. The procession wound up with a discharge of musketry that shook all the windows in the town. Next afternoon we started for Genoa by the famed Cornice Road. The half-French, half-Italian veterino, who undertook with his little rattling carriage and pair to convey us thither in three days, was a careless, good-looking fellow, whose light-heartedness and singing propensities knew no bounds as long as we went on smoothly. So long he had a word and a smile and a flick of his whip for all the peasant girls, and odds and ends of the sonambula for all the echoes. So long he went jingling through every little village, with bells on his horses and rings in his ears, a very meteor of gallantry and cheerfulness. But it was highly characteristic to see him under a slight reverse of circumstances, when in one part of the journey we came to a narrow place where a wagon had broken down and stopped up the road. His hands were twined in his hair immediately, as if a combination of all the direst accidents in life had suddenly fallen on his devoted head. He swore in French, prayed in Italian, and went up and down, beating his feet on the ground in a very ecstasy of despair. There were various carters and mule drivers assembled round the broken wagon, and at last some man of an original turn of mind proposed that a general and joint effort should be made to get things to rights again and clear the way, an idea which I verily believe would never have presented itself to our friend, though we had remained there until now. It was done at no great cost of labour, but at every pause in the doing his hands were wound in his hair again, as if there were no ray of hope to lighten his misery. The moment he was on his box once more, and clattering briskly downhill, he returned to the sonambula and the peasant girls, as if it were not in the power of misfortune to depress him. Much of the romance of the beautiful towns and villages on this beautiful road disappears when they are entered, for many of them are very miserable. The streets are narrow, dark and dirty, the inhabitants lean and squalid, and the withered old women with their wiry grey hair twisted up into a knot on the top of the head, like a pad to carry loads on, are so intensely ugly, both along the Riviera and in Genoa too, that seen straggling about in dim doorways with their spindles, or crooning together in by-corners, they are like a population of witches, except that they are certainly not to be suspected of brooms or any other instrument of cleanliness. Neither are the pigskins in common use to hold wine, and hung out in the sun in all directions by any means ornamental, as they always preserve the form of very bloated pigs, with their heads and legs cut off, dangling upside down by their own tails. These towns, as they are seen in the approach, however, nestling with their clustering roofs and towers among trees on steep hillsides, or built upon the brink of noble bays, are charming. The vegetation is everywhere luxuriant and beautiful, and the palm tree makes a novel feature in the novel scenery. In one town, San Remo, a most extraordinary place, built on gloomy open arches so that one might ramble underneath the whole town, there are pretty terrace gardens. In other towns there is the clang of shipwrights' hammers and the building of small vessels on the beach. In some of the broad bays the fleets of Europe might ride at anchor. In every case each little group of houses presents in the distance some enchanting confusion of picturesque and fanciful shapes. The road itself, now high above the glittering sea which breaks against the foot of the precipice, now turning inland to sweep the shore of a bay, now crossing the stony bed of a mountain stream, 
now low down on the beach, now winding among riven rocks of many forms and colours, now chequered by a solitary ruined tower, one of a chain of towers built in old time to protect the coast from the invasions of the Barbary Corsairs, presents new beauties every moment. When its own striking scenery is past, and it trails on through a long line of suburb, lying on the flat sea shore to Genoa, then the changing glimpses of that noble city and its harbour awaken a new source of interest. Freshened by every huge, unwieldy, half-inhabited old house in its outskirts, and coming to its climax when the city gate is reached, and all Genoa, with its beautiful harbour and neighbouring hills, bursts proudly on the view. Chapter 5 of Pictures from Italy by Charles Dickens. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Anthony Ogus. To Parma, Modena, and Bologna. I strolled away from Genoa on the 6th of November, bound for a good many places, England among them, but first for Piacenza, for which town I started in the coupe of a machine something like a travelling caravan, in company with a brave courier and a lady with a large dog, who howled dolefully at intervals all night. It was very wet and very cold, very dark and very dismal. We travelled at the rate of barely four miles an hour, and stopped nowhere for refreshment. At ten o'clock next morning we changed coaches at Alessandria, where we were packed up in another coach, the body whereof would have been small for a fly, in company with a very old priest, a young Jesuit his companion, who carried their breviaries and other books, and who in the exertion of getting into the coach had made a gash of pink leg between his black stocking and his black knee-shorts that reminded one of Hamlet in Ophelia's closet, only it was visible on both legs, a provincial avocado, and a gentleman with a red nose that had an uncommon and singular sheen upon it, which I never observed in the human subject before. In this way we travelled on until four o'clock in the afternoon, the roads being still very heavy and the coach very slow. To mend the matter, the old priest was troubled with cramps in his legs, so that he had to give a terrible yell every ten minutes or so, and be hoisted out by the united efforts of the company, the coach always stopping for him with great gravity. This disorder and the roads form the main subject of conversation. Finding in the afternoon that the coupé had discharged two people and had only one passenger inside, a monstrous ugly Tuscan with a great purple moustache, of which no man could see the ends when he had his hat on, I took advantage of its better accommodation, and in company with this gentleman, who was very conversational and good-humoured, travelled on until nearly eleven o'clock at night, when the driver reported that he couldn't think of going any further, and we accordingly made a halt at a place called Stradella. The inn was a series of strange galleries surrounding a yard, where our coach and a wagon or two, and a lot of fowls and firewood, were all heaped up together higgledy-piggledy, so that you didn't know and couldn't have taken your oath which was a fowl and which was a cart. We followed a sleepy man with a flaring torch into a great cold room, where there were two immensely broad beds on what looked like two immensely broad deal dining tables, another deal table of similar dimensions in the middle of the bare floor, four windows and two chairs. Somebody said it was my room, and I walked up and down it for half an hour or so, staring at the Tuscan, the old priest, the young priest and the avocado, Red Nose lived in the town and had gone home, who sat upon their beds and stared at me in return. The rather dreary whimsicality of this stage of the proceedings is interrupted by an announcement from the Brave, he had been cooking, that supper is ready, and to the priest's chamber, the next room and the counterpart of mine, we all adjourn. The first dish is a cabbage, boiled with a great quantity of rice in a tureen full of water, 
and flavoured with cheese. It is so hot, and we are so cold, that it appears almost jolly. The second dish is some little bits of pork fried with pig's kidneys. The third, two red fowls. The fourth, two little red turkeys. The fifth, a huge stew of garlic and truffles, and I don't know what else. And this concludes the entertainment. Before I can sit down in my own chamber and think it of the dampest, the door opens, and the brave comes moving in, in the middle of such a quantity of fuel that he looks like Burnham Wood taking a winter walk. He kindles this heap in a twinkling, and produces a jorum of hot brandy and water, for that bottle of his keeps company with the seasons, and now holds nothing but the purest eau de vie. When he has accomplished this feat, he retires for the night, and I hear him for an hour afterwards, and indeed until I fall asleep, making jokes in some outhouse, apparently under the pillow, where he is smoking cigars with a party of confidential friends. He never was in the house in his life before, but he knows everybody everywhere, before he has been anywhere five minutes, and is certain to have attracted to himself in the meantime the enthusiastic devotion of the whole establishment. This is at twelve o'clock at night. At four o'clock next morning he is up again, fresher than a full-blown rose, making blazing fires without the least authority from the landlord, producing mugs of scalding coffee where nobody else can get anything but cold water, and going out into the dark streets, and roaring for fresh milk, on the chance of somebody with a cow getting up to supply it. While the horses are coming, I stumble out into the town too. It seems to be all one little piazza with a cold, damp wind blowing in and out of the arches alternately in a sort of pattern. But it is profoundly dark and raining heavily, and I shouldn't know it tomorrow if I were taken there to try, which heaven forbid. The horses arrive in about an hour. In the interval the driver swears, sometimes Christian oaths, sometimes pagan oaths, Sometimes, when it is a long compound oath, he begins with Christianity and merges into paganism. Various messengers are dispatched, not so much after the horses as after each other, for the first messenger never comes back, and all the rest imitate him. At length the horses appear, surrounded by all the messengers, some kicking them, and some dragging them, and all shouting abuse to them. Then the old priest, the young priest, the avocato, the Tuscan, and all of us take our places, and sleepy voices proceeding from the doors of extraordinary hutches in diverse parts of the yard cry out, Addio, Corrieri mio, buon viaggio, Corrieri, salutations which the courier, with his face one monstrous grin, returns in like manner as we go jolting and wallowing away through the mud. At Piacenza, which was four or five hours' journey from the inn at Stradella, we broke up our little company before the hotel door, with diverse manifestations of friendly feeling on all sides. The old priest was taken with the cramp again, before he had got halfway down the street, and the young priest laid the bundle of books on a doorstep, while he dutifully rubbed the old gentleman's legs. The client of the avocado was waiting for him at the yard gate, and kissed him on each cheek, with such a resounding smack, that I am afraid he had either a very bad case, or a scantily furnished purse. The Tuscan, with a cigar in his mouth, went loitering off, carrying his hat in his hand, that he might the better trail up the ends of his dishevelled moustache, and the brave courier, as he and I strolled away to look about us, began immediately to entertain me with the private histories and family affairs of the whole party. A brown, decayed old town, Piacenza is, a deserted, solitary, grass-grown place, with ruined ramparts, half-filled up trenches which afford a frowsy pasturage to the lean kine that wander about them, and streets of stern houses moodily frowning at the other houses over the way. The sleepiest and shabbiest of soldiery go wandering about, with a double curse of laziness and poverty, uncouthly wrinkling their misfitting regimentals. 
the dirtiest of children play with their impromptu toys, pigs and mud, in the feeblest of gutters, and the gauntest of dogs trot in and out of the dullest of archways, in perpetual search of something to eat which they never seem to find. A mysterious and solemn palace guarded by two colossal statues, twin genii of the place, stands gravely in the midst of the idle town, and the king with the marble legs, who flourished in the time of the thousand and one nights, might live contentedly inside of it, and never have the energy in his upper half of flesh and blood to want to come out. What a strange, half-sorrowful and half-delicious doze it is, to ramble through these places gone to sleep and basking in the sun. Each in its turn appears to be, of all the mouldy, dreary, God-forgotten towns in the wide world, the chief. Sitting on this hillock where a bastion used to be, and where a noisy fortress was, in the time of the old Roman station here, I became aware that I have never known till now what it is to be lazy. A dormouse must surely be in very much the same condition before he retires under the wool in his cage, or a tortoise before he buries himself. I feel that I am getting rusty, that any attempt to think would be accompanied with a creaking noise, that there is nothing anywhere to be done or needing to be done, that there is no more human progress, motion, effort or advancement of any kind beyond this that the whole scheme stopped here centuries ago and laid down to rest until the day of judgment. Never while the brave courier lives. Behold him jingling out of Piacenza and staggering this way in the tallest posting chase ever seen, so that he looks out of the front window as if he were peeping over a garden wall, while the postillion, concentrated essence of all the shabbiness of Italy, pauses for a moment in his animated conversation to touch his hat to a blunt-nosed little virgin, hardly less shabby than himself, enshrined in a plaster punch's show outside the town. In Genoa and thereabouts they train the vines on trellis work, supported on square clumsy pillars, which in themselves are anything but picturesque. But here they twine them around trees and let them trail among the hedges, and the vineyards are full of trees regularly planted for this purpose, each with its own vine twining and clustering about it. Their leaves are now of the brightest gold and deepest red, and never was anything so enchantingly graceful and full of beauty. Through miles of these delightful forms and colours the road winds its way, the wild festoons, the elegant wreaths and crowns and garlands of all shapes the fairy nets flung over great trees and making them prisoners in sport, the tumbled heaps and mounds of exquisite shapes upon the ground. How rich and beautiful they are! And every now and then a long, long line of trees will be all bound and garlanded together, as if they had taken hold of one another and were coming dancing down the field. Parma has cheerful, stirring streets for an Italian town, and consequently is not so characteristic as many places of less note, always excepting the retired piazza where the cathedral, baptistry and campanile, ancient buildings of a sombre brown, embellished with innumerable grotesque monsters and dreamy-looking creatures carved in marble and red stone, are clustered in a noble and magnificent repose. Their silent presence was only invaded when I saw them, by the twittering of the many birds that were flying in and out of the crevices in the stones and little nooks in the architecture where they had made their nests. They were busy rising from the cold shade of temples made with hands into the sunny air of heaven. Not so the worshippers within, who were listening to the same drowsy chaunt or kneeling before the same kinds of images and tapers or whispering with their heads bowed down in the self-same dark confessionals as I had left in Genoa and everywhere else. The decayed and mutilated paintings with which this church is covered have, to my thinking, a remarkably mournful and depressing influence. It is miserable to see great works of art, something of the souls of painters, perishing and fading away like human forms. This cathedral is odorous with the rotting of Correggio's frescoes in the cupola. 
Heaven knows how beautiful they may have been at one time. Connoisseurs fall into raptures with them now, but such a labyrinth of arms and legs, such heaps of foreshortened limbs, entangled and involved and jumbled together, no operative surgeon gone mad could imagine in his wildest delirium. There is a very interesting subterranean church here. The roof supported by marble pillars, behind each of which there seemed to be at least one beggar in ambush, to say nothing of the tombs and secluded altars. From every one of these lurking places, such crowds of phantom-looking men and women, leading other men and women with twisted limbs, or chattering jaws, or paralytic gestures, or idiotic heads, or some other sad infirmity, came hobbling out to beg, that if the ruined frescoes in the cathedral above had been suddenly animated and had retired to this lower church, they could hardly have made a greater confusion or exhibited a more confounding display of arms and legs. There is Petrarch's monument too, and there is the baptistry with its beautiful arches and immense font, and there is a gallery containing some very remarkable pictures, whereof a few were being copied by hairy-faced artists, with little velvet caps more off their heads than on. There is the Farnese Palace, too, and in it one of the dreariest spectacles of decay that ever was seen, a grand old gloomy theatre, mouldering away. It is a large wooden structure of the horseshoe shape, the lower seats arranged upon the Roman plan, but above them great heavy chambers rather than boxes, where the nobles sat remote in their proud state. Such desolation as has fallen on this theatre, enhanced in the spectator's fancy by its gay intention and design, none but worms can be familiar with. A hundred and ten years have passed since any play was acted here, the sky shines in through the gashes in the roof. The boxes are dropping down, wasting away, and only tenanted by rats. Damp and mildew smear the faded colours and make spectral maps upon the panels. Lean rags are dangling down where there were gay festoons on the proscenium. The stage has rotted so that a narrow wooden gallery is thrown across it, or it would sink beneath the tread and bury the visitor in the gloomy depth beneath. The desolation and decay impress themselves on all the senses. The air has a mouldering smell and an earthy taste. Any stray outer sounds that straggle in with some lost sunbeam are muffled and heavy. And the worm, the maggot and the rot have changed the surface of the wood beneath the touch, as time will seem and roughen a smooth hand. If ever ghosts act plays, they act them on this ghostly stage. It was most delicious weather when we came into Modena, where the darkness of the sombre colonnades over the footways skirting the main street on either side was made refreshing and agreeable by the bright sky, so wonderfully blue. I passed from all the glory of the day into a dim cathedral, where high mass was performing, feeble tapers were burning, people were kneeling in all directions before all manner of shrines, and officiating priests were crooning the usual chant in the usual low, dull, drawling, melancholy tone. Thinking how strange it was to find in every stagnant town this same heart beating with the same monotonous pulsation, the centre of the same torpid, listless system, I came out by another door, and was suddenly scared to death by a blast from the shrillest trumpet that ever was blown. Immediately came tearing round the corner an equestrian company from Paris, marshalling themselves under the walls of the church, and flouting with their horses' heels the griffins, lions, tigers, and other monsters in stone and marble decorating its exterior. First there came a stately nobleman with a great deal of hair and no hat, bearing an enormous banner on which was inscribed Mazeppa, tonight. Then a Mexican chief with a great pear-shaped club on his shoulder like Hercules. Then six or eight Roman chariots, each with a beautiful lady in extremely short petticoats and unnaturally pink tights erect within. 
shedding beaming looks upon the crowd in which there was a latent expression of discomposure and anxiety for which i couldn't account until as the open back of each chariot presented itself i saw the immense difficulty with which the pink legs maintained their perpendicular over the uneven pavement of the town which gave me quite a new idea of the ancient romans and britons the procession was brought to a close by some dozen indomitable warriors of different nations riding two and two and haughtily surveying the tame population of medena among whom however they occasionally condescended to scatter largesse in the form of a few handbills after caracoling among the lions and tigers and proclaiming that evening's entertainments with blast of trumpet it then filed off by the other end of the square and left a new and greatly increased dullness behind when the procession had so entirely passed away that the shrill trumpet was mild in the distance and the tail of the last horse was hopelessly round the corner the people who had come out of the church to stare at it went back again but one old lady kneeling on the pavement within near the door had seen it all and had been immensely interested without getting up and this old lady's eye at that juncture i happened to catch to our mutual confusion she cut our embarrassment very short however by crossing herself devoutly and going down at full length on her face before a figure in a fancy petticoat and a gilt crown which was so like one of the procession figures that perhaps at this hour she may think the whole appearance a celestial vision anyhow i must certainly have forgiven her her interest in the circus though i had been her father confessor there was a little fiery-eyed old man with a crooked shoulder in the cathedral who took it very ill that i made no effort to see the bucket kept in an old tower which the people of medena took away from the people of bologna in the fourteenth century and about which there was a war made and a mock heroic poem by tassone too being quite content however to look at the outside of the tower and feast in imagination on the bucket within and preferring to loiter in the shade of the tall campanile and about the cathedral i have no personal knowledge of this bucket even at the present time indeed we were at bologna before the little old man or the guide-book would have considered that we had half done justice to the wonders of medena but it is such a delight to me to leave new scenes behind and still go on encountering newer scenes and moreover i have such a perverse disposition in respect of sights that are cut and dried and dictated that i fear i sin against similar authorities in every place i visit be this as it may in the pleasant cemetery at bologna i found myself walking next sunday morning among the stately marble tombs and colonnades in company with a crowd of peasants and escorted by a little cicerone of that town who was excessively anxious for the honour of the place and most solicitous to divert my attention from the bad monuments whereas he was never tired of extolling the good ones seeing this little man a good-humoured little man he was who seemed to have nothing in his face but shining teeth and eyes looking wistfully at a certain plot of grass i asked him who was buried there the poor people signore he said with a shrug and a smile and stopping to look back at me for he always went on a little before and took off his hat to introduce every new monument only the poor signore it's very cheerful it's very lively how green it is how cool it's like a meadow there are five holding up all the fingers of his right hand to express the number which an italian peasant will always do if it be within the compass of his ten fingers there are five of my little children buried there signore just there a little to the right well thanks to god it's very cheerful how green it is how cool it is it's quite a meadow he looked me very hard in the face, and seeing I was sorry for him, took a pinch of snuff, every Cicerone takes snuff, and made a little bow, partly in deprecation of his having alluded to such a subject, and partly in memory of the children and of his favourite saint. It was as unaffected and as perfectly natural a little bow as ever man made. Immediately afterwards he took his hat off altogether, 
and begged to introduce me to the next monument, and his eyes. Chapter Six of Pictures from Italy by Charles Dickens. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Anthony Ogus. Through Bologna and Ferrara. There was such a very smart official in attendance at the cemetery where the little Cicerone had buried his children that when the little Cicerone suggested to me in a whisper that there would be no offence in presenting this officer, in return for some slight extra service, with a couple of pools, about ten pence English money, I looked incredulously at his cocked hat, wash-leather gloves, well-made uniform and dazzling buttons, and rebuked the little Cicerone with a grave shake of the head, for in splendour of appearance he was at least equal to the deputy usher of the black rod, and the idea of his carrying, as Jeremy Diddler would say, such a thing as tenpence away with him, seemed monstrous. He took it in excellent part, however, when I made bold to give it him, and pulled off his cocked hat with a flourish that would have been a bargain at double the money. It seemed to be his duty to describe the monuments to the people, at all events he was doing so, and when I compared him like Gulliver in Brobdingnag with the institutions of my own beloved country, I could not refrain from tears of pride and exultation. He had no pace at all, no more than a tortoise. He loitered as the people loitered, that they might gratify their curiosity, and positively allowed them now and then to read the inscriptions on the tombs. He was neither shabby, nor insolent, nor churlish, nor ignorant. He spoke his own language with perfect propriety, and seemed to consider himself in his way a kind of teacher of the people, and to entertain a just respect both for himself and them. They would no more have such a man for a verger in Westminster Abbey than they would let the people in, as they do at Bologna, to see the monuments for nothing. Again an ancient sombre town under the brilliant sky, with heavy arcades over the footways of the older streets, and lighter and more cheerful archways in the newer portions of the town. Again brown piles of sacred buildings, with more birds flying in and out of chinks in the stones, and more snarling monsters for the bases of the pillars. Again rich churches, drowsy masses, curling incense, tinkling bells, priests in bright vestments, pictures, tapers, laced altar-cloths, crosses, images, and artificial flowers. There is a grave and learned air about the city, and a pleasant gloom upon it that would leave it a distinct and separate impression in the mind, among a crowd of cities, though it were not still further marked in the traveller's remembrance by the two brick-leaning towers, sufficiently unsightly in themselves, it must be acknowledged, inclining crosswise as if they were bowing stiffly to each other, a most extraordinary termination to the perspective of some of the narrow streets. The colleges and churches, too, and palaces, and above all the Academy of Fine Art, where there are a host of interesting pictures, especially by Guido, Domenichino, and Ludovico Caracci, give it a place of its own in the memory. Even though these were not, and they were nothing else to remember it by, the great meridian on the pavement of the church of San Petronio, where the sunbeams mark the time among the kneeling people, would give it a fanciful and pleasant interest. Bologna, being very full of tourists, detained there by an inundation which rendered the road to Florence impassable, I was quartered up at the top of an hotel in an out-of-the-way room which I never could find, containing a bed big enough for a boarding school which I couldn't fall asleep in. The chief among the waiters who visited this lonely retreat, where there was no other company but the swallows in the broad eaves over the window, 
was a man of one idea in connection with the English, and the subject of this harmless monomania was Lord Byron. I made the discovery by accidentally remarking to him at breakfast that the matting with which the floor was covered was very comfortable at that season, when he immediately replied that Milor Biron had been much attached to that kind of matting. Observing at the same moment that I took no milk, he exclaimed with enthusiasm that Milor Biron had never touched it. At first I took it for granted in my innocence that he had been one of the Biron servants, but no, he said no, he was in the habit of speaking about my lord to English gentlemen, that was all. He knew all about him, he said. In proof of it, he connected him with every possible topic, from the Montepulciano wine at dinner, which was grown on an estate he had owned, to the big bed itself, which was the very model of his. When I left the inn, he coupled with his final bow in the yard, a parting assurance that the road by which I was going had been Milor Biron's favourite ride and before the horse's feet had well begun to clatter on the pavement, he ran briskly upstairs again, I dare say to tell some other Englishman, in some other solitary room, that the guest who had just departed was Lord Biron's living image. I had entered Bologna by night, almost midnight, and all along the road thither, after our entrance into the papal territory, which is not in any part supremely well governed, St. Peter's keys being rather rusty now. The driver had so worried about the danger of robbers in travelling after dark, and had so infected the brave courier, and the two had been so constantly stopping and getting up and down to look after a portmanteau which was tied on behind, that I should have felt almost obliged to anyone who would have had the goodness to take it away. Hence it was stipulated that, whenever we left Bologna, we should start so as not to arrive at Ferrara later than eight at night, and a delightful afternoon and evening journey it was, albeit through a flat district which gradually became more marshy from the overflow of brooks and rivers in the recent heavy rains. At sunset, when I was walking on alone while the horses rested, I arrived upon a little scene which, by one of those singular mental operations of which we are all conscious, seemed perfectly familiar to me, and which I see distinctly now. There was not much in it. In the blood-red light there was a mournful sheet of water, just stirred by the evening wind, upon its margin a few trees. In the foreground was a group of silent peasant girls leaning over the parapet of a little bridge, and looking now up at the sky, now down into the water, in the distance a deep bell, the shade of approaching night on everything. If I had been murdered there in some former life, I could not have seemed to remember the place more thoroughly, or with a more emphatic chilling of the blood and the mere remembrance of it, acquired in that minute, is so strengthened by the imaginary recollection that I hardly think I could forget it. More solitary, more depopulated, more deserted, old Ferrara, than any city of the solemn brotherhood, the grass so grows up in the silent streets that any one might make hay there, literally, while the sun shines. But the sun shines with diminished cheerfulness in grim Ferrara, and the people are so few who pass and repass through the places, that the flesh of its inhabitants might be grass indeed, and growing in the squares. I wonder why the head coppersmith in an Italian town always lives next door to the hotel or opposite, making the visitor feel as if the beating hammers were his own heart, palpitating with a deadly energy. I wonder why jealous corridors surround the bedroom on all sides, and fill it with unnecessary doors that can't be shut, and will not open, and a butt on pitchy darkness. I wonder why it is not enough that these distrustful genii stand agape at one's dreams all night, but there must also be round open portholes, high in the wall, suggestive, when a mouse or rat is heard behind the wainscot, 
of a somebody scraping the wall with his toes in his endeavours to reach one of these portholes and look in. I wonder why the faggots are so constructed as to know of no effect but an agony of heat when they are lighted and replenished, and an agony of cold and suffocation at all other times. I wonder above all why it is the great feature of domestic architecture in Italian inns that all the fire goes up the chimney except the smoke. The answer matters little. Coppersmiths, doors, portholes, smoke and faggots are welcome to me. Give me the smiling face of the attendant, man or woman, the courteous manner, the amiable desire to please and to be pleased, the light-hearted, pleasant, simple air, so many jewels set in dirt, and I am theirs again to-morrow. Ariosto's house, Tasso's prison, a rare old Gothic cathedral, and more churches, of course, are the sights of Ferrara. But the long silent streets and the dismantled palaces, where ivy waves in lieu of banners, and where rank weeds are slowly creeping up the long untrodden stairs, are the best sights of all. The aspect of this dreary town, half an hour before sunrise, one fine morning, when I left it, was as picturesque as it seemed unreal and spectral. It was no matter that the people were not yet out of bed, for if they had all been up and busy, they would have made but little difference in that desert of a place. It was best to see it without a single figure in the picture, a city of the dead without one solitary survivor. Pestilence might have ravaged streets, squares and market-places, and sack and siege have ruined the old houses, battered down their doors and windows, and made breaches in their roofs. In one part a great tower rose into the air, the only landmark in the melancholy view. In another a prodigious castle with a moat about it stood aloof, a sullen city in itself. In the black dungeons of this castle Parisina and her lover were beheaded in the dead of night. The red light, beginning to shine when I looked back upon it, stained its walls without, as they have many a time been stained within, in old days. But for any sign of life they gave, the castle and the city might have been avoided by all human creatures, from the moment when the axe went down upon the last of the two lovers, and might have never vibrated to another sound. Beyond the blow that to the block pierced through with forced and sullen shock. Coming to the Po, which was greatly swollen and running fiercely, we crossed it by a floating bridge of boats, and so came into the Austrian territory and resumed our journey, through a country of which, for some miles, a great part was under water. The brave courier and the soldiery had first quarrelled for a half an hour or more, over our eternal passport, but this was a daily relaxation with the brave, who was always stricken deaf when shabby functionaries in uniform came, as they constantly did come, plunging out of wooden boxes to look at it, or in other words to beg, and who, stone deaf to my entreaties that the man might have a trifle given him, and we resume our journey in peace, was wont to sit reviling the functionary in broken English, while the unfortunate man's face was a portrait of mental agony framed in the coach window from his perfect ignorance of what was being said to his disparagement. There was a postillion in the course of this day's journey, as wild and savagely good-looking a vagabond as you would desire to see. He was a tall, stout-made, dark-complexioned fellow, with a profusion of shaggy black hair hanging all over his face, and great black whiskers stretching down his throat. His dress was a torn suit of rifle green, garnished here and there with red. A steeple-crowned hat, innocent of nap, with a broken and bedraggled feather stuck in the band, and a flaming red neckerchief hanging on his shoulders. He was not in the saddle, but reposed quite at his ease on a sort of low footboard in front of the post-chaise, down amongst the horse's tails, convenient for having his brains kicked out at any moment. 
To this brigand, the brave courier, when we were at a reasonable trot, happened to suggest the practicability of going faster. He received the proposal with a perfect yell of derision, brandished his whip about his head, such a whip, it was more like a home-made bow, flung up his heels much higher than the horses, and disappeared in a paroxysm somewhere in the neighbourhood of the axle-tree. I fully expected to see him lying in the road a hundred yards behind, but up came the steeple-crowned hat again next minute, and he was seen reposing, as on a sofa, entertaining himself with the idea, and crying, Ha ha! What next? Oh, the devil! Faster too! Shoo hoo hoo! This last ejaculation, an inexpressibly defiant hoot. Being anxious to reach our immediate destination that night, I ventured by and by to repeat the experiment on my own account. It produced exactly the same effect. Round flew the whip with the same scornful flourish, up came the heels, down went the steeple-crowned hat, and presently he reappeared, reposing as before, and saying, Chapter 7 of Pictures from Italy by Charles Dickens. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Anthony Ogus. An Italian Dream. I had been travelling for some days, resting very little in the night and never in the day. The rapid and unbroken succession of novelties that had passed before me came back like half formed dreams and a crowd of objects wandered in the greatest confusion through my mind as I travelled on by a solitary road. At intervals some one among them would stop, as it were, in its restless flitting to and fro, and enable me to look at it quite steadily and behold it in full distinctness. After a few moments it would dissolve, like a view in a magic lantern, and while I saw some part of it quite plainly, and some faintly, and some not at all, would show me another of the many places I had lately seen, lingering behind it, and coming through it. This was no sooner visible than, in its turn, it melted into something else. At one moment I was standing again before the brown old rugged churches of Medena. As I recognised the curious pillars with grim monsters for their bases, I seemed to see them, standing by themselves in the quiet square at Padua, where there were the staid old university and the figures, demurely gowned, grouped here and there in the open space about it. Then I was strolling in the outskirts of that pleasant city, admiring the unusual neatness of the dwelling-houses, gardens and orchards, as I had seen them a few hours before. In their stead arose, immediately, the two towers of Bologna, and the most obstinate of all these objects failed to hold its ground a minute before the monstrous moated castle of Ferrara, which, like an illustration to a wild romance, came back again in the red sunrise, lording it over the solitary, grass-grown, withered town. In short, I had that incoherent but delightful jumble in my brain which travellers are apt to have and are indolently willing to encourage. Every shake of the coach in which I sat, half dozing in the dark, appeared to jerk some new recollection out of its place, and to jerk some other new recollection into it, and in this state I fell asleep. I was awakened after some time, as I thought, by the stopping of the coach. It was now quite night, and we were at the waterside. There lay here a black boat, with a little house or cabin in it of the same mournful colour, when I had taken my seat in this, the boat was paddled by two men towards a great light lying in the distance on the sea. Ever and again there was a dismal sigh of wind. It ruffled the water and rocked the boat, and sent the dark clouds flying before the stars. I could not but think how strange it was to be floating away at that hour, leaving the land behind and going on towards this light upon the sea. It soon began to burn brighter, 
and from being one light became a cluster of tapers twinkling and shining out of the water as the boat approached towards them by a dreamy kind of track marked out upon the sea by posts and piles we had floated on five miles or so over the dark water when i heard it rippling in my dream against some obstruction near at hand looking out attentively i saw through the gloom a something black and massive like a shore but lying close and flat upon the water like a raft which we were gliding past the chief of the two rowers said it was a burial place full of the interest and wonder which a cemetery lying out there in the lonely sea inspired I turned to gaze upon it as it should recede in our path, when it was quickly shut out from my view. Before I knew by what or how, I found that we were gliding up a street, a phantom street, the houses rising on both sides from the water, and the black boat gliding on beneath their windows. Lights were shining from some of these casements, plumbing the depth of the black stream with their reflected rays, but all was profoundly silent. So we advanced into this ghostly city, continuing to hold our course through narrow streets and lanes, all filled and flowing with water. Some of the corners where our way branched off were so acute and narrow that it seemed impossible for the long slender boat to turn them, but the rowers with a low melodious cry of warning sent it skimming on without a pause. Sometimes the rowers of another black boat like our own echoed the cry and, slackening their speed, as I thought we did ours, would come flitting past us like a dark shadow. Other boats of the same sombre hue were lying moored, I thought, to painted pillars, near to dark mysterious doors that opened straight upon the water. Some of these were empty. In some the rowers lay asleep. Towards one I saw some figures coming down a gloomy archway, from the interior of a palace, gaily dressed and attended by torch-bearers. It was but a glimpse I had of them, for a bridge so low and close upon the boat that it seemed ready to fall down and crush us, one of the many bridges that perplexed the dream, blotted them out instantly. On we went, floating towards the heart of this strange place, with water all about us where never water was elsewhere, clusters of houses churches heaps of stately buildings growing out of it and everywhere the same extraordinary silence presently we shot across a broad and open stream and passing as i thought before a spacious paved quay where the bright lamps with which it was illuminated showed long rows of arches and pillars of ponderous construction and great strength but as light to the eye as garlands of hoar-frost or gossamer and where for the first time I saw people walking, arrived at a flight of steps leading from the water to a large mansion, where, having passed through corridors and galleries innumerable, I lay down to rest, listening to the black boat stealing up and down below the window on the rippling water, till I fell asleep. The glory of the day that broke upon me in this dream, its freshness, motion, buoyancy, its sparkles of the sun in water, its clear blue sky and rustling air, no waking words can tell. But from my window I look down on boats and barks, on masts, sails, cordage, flags, on groups of busy sailors working at the cargoes of these vessels, on wide quays strewn with bales, casks, merchandise of many kinds on great ships lying near at hand in stately indolence, on islands crowned with gorgeous domes and turrets, and where golden crosses glittered in the light atop of wondrous churches springing from the sea. Going down upon the margin of the green sea, rolling on before the door and filling all the streets, I came upon a place of such surpassing beauty and such grandeur that all the rest was poor and faded, in comparison with its absorbing loveliness. It was a great piazza, as I thought, anchored like all the rest in the deep ocean. On its broad bosom was a palace, more majestic and magnificent in its old age, than all the buildings of the earth, in the high prime and fullness of their youth. Cloisters and galleries, 
so light they might have been the work of fairy hands, so strong that centuries had battered them in vain, wound round and round this palace, and enfolded it with a cathedral, gorgeous in the wild, luxuriant fancies of the East. At no great distance from its porch, a lofty tower, standing by itself, and rearing its proud head alone into the sky, looked out upon the Adriatic Sea. Near to the margin of the stream were two ill-omened pillars of red granite, one having on its top a figure with a sword and shield, the other a winged lion. Not far from these again a second tower, richest of the rich in all its decorations, even here where all was rich, sustained aloft a great orb, gleaming with gold and deepest blue, the twelve signs painted on it, and a mimic sun revolving in its course and round them, while above two bronze giants hammered out the hours upon a sounding bell. An oblong square of lofty houses of the whitest stone, surrounded by a light and beautiful arcade, formed part of this enchanted scene, and here and there gay masts for flags rose, tapering from the pavement of the unsubstantial ground. I thought I entered the cathedral and went in and out amongst its many arches, traversing its whole extent, a grand and dreamy structure of immense proportions, golden with old mosaics, redolent of perfumes, dim with the smoke of incense, costly in treasure of precious stones and metals, glittering through iron bars, holy with the bodies of deceased saints, rainbow-hued with windows of stained glass, dark with carved woods and coloured marbles, obscure in its vast heights and lengthened distances, shining with silver lamps and winking lights, unreal, fantastic, solemn, inconceivable throughout. I thought I entered the old palace, pacing silent galleries and council chambers, where the old rulers of this mistress of the waters looked sternly out in pictures from the walls, and where her high proud galleys, still victorious on canvas, fought and conquered as of old. I thought I wandered through its halls of state and triumph, bare and empty now, and musing on its pride and might, extinct, for that was past, all past heard a voice say, some tokens of its ancient rule and some consoling reasons for its downfall may be traced here yet. I dreamed that I was led on then into some jealous rooms communicating with a prison near the palace, separated from it by a lofty bridge crossing a narrow street, and called, I dreamed, the Bridge of Sighs. But first I passed two jagged slits in a stone wall, the lion's mouths now toothless, where, in the distempered horror of my sleep, I thought denunciations of innocent men to the old wicked council had been dropped through many a time, when the night was dark. So when I saw the council room to which such prisoners were taken for examination, and the door by which they passed out when they were condemned, a door that never closed upon a man with life and hope before him, my heart appeared to die within me. It was smitten harder, though, when, torch in hand, I descended from the cheerful day into two ranges, one below another, of dismal, awful, horrible stone cells. They were quite dark. Each had a loophole in its massive wall, where, in the old time, every day, a torch was placed, I dreamed, to light the prisoner within for half an hour. The captives, by the glimmering of these brief rays, had scratched and cut inscriptions in the blackened vaults. I saw them. For their labour with a rusty nail's point had outlived their agony and them through many generations. One cell I saw, in which no man remained for more than four and twenty hours, being marked for dead before he entered it. Hard by another, and a dismal one, where to at midnight the confessor came, a monk, brown-robed and hooded, ghastly in the day and free bright air, but in the midnight of that murky prison, hope's extinguisher and murder's herald. I had my foot upon the spot where, at the same dread hour, the shriven prisoner was strangled, 
and struck my hand upon the guilty door, low-browed and stealthy, through which the lumpish sack was carried out into a boat and rowed away, and drowned where it was death to cast a net. Around this dungeon stronghold, and above some part of it, licking the rough walls without and smearing them with damp and slime within, stuffing dank weeds and refuse into chinks and crevices, as if the very stones and bars had mouths to stop, furnishing a smooth road for the removal of the bodies of the secret victims of the state, a road so ready that it went along with them, and ran before them like a cruel officer, flowed the same water that filled this dream of mine, and made it seem one even at the time. Descending from the palace by a staircase, called, I thought, the Giants, I had some imaginary recollection of an old man abdicating, coming more slowly and more feebly down it, when he heard the bell proclaiming his successor. I glided off in one of the dark boats, until we came to an old arsenal guarded by four marble lions. To make my dream more monstrous and unlikely, one of these had words and sentences upon its body, inscribed there at an unknown time and in an unknown language, so that their purport was a mystery to all men. There was little sound of hammers in this place for building ships, and little work in progress, for the greatness of the city was no more, as I have said. Indeed, it seemed a very wreck found drifting on the sea a strange flag hoisted in its honourable stations, and strangers standing at its helm. A splendid barge in which its ancient chief had gone forth pompously at certain periods to wed the ocean lay here, I thought, no more. But in its place there was a tiny model made from recollection like the city's greatness, and it told of what had been, so are the strong and weak confounded in the dust, almost as eloquently as the massive pillars, arches, roofs, reared to overshadow stately ships that had no other shadow now upon the water or the earth. An armoury was there yet, plundered and despoiled, but an armoury, with a fierce standard taken from the Turks, drooping in the dull air of its cage. Rich suits of mail worn by great warriors were hoarded there, crossbows and bolts, quivers full of arrows, spears, swords, daggers, maces, shields, and heavy-headed axes, plates of wrought steel and iron to make the gallant horse a monster cased in metal scales, and one spring weapon, easy to be carried in the breast, designed to do its office noiselessly, and made for shooting men with poison darts. One press or case I saw, full of accursed instruments of torture, horribly contrived to cramp and pinch and grind and crush men's bones and tear and twist them with the torment of a thousand deaths. Before it were two iron helmets with breast pieces made to close up tight and smooth upon the heads of living sufferers and fastened on to each was a small knob or anvil where the directing devil could repose his elbow at his ease and listen near the walled-up ear to the lamentations and confessions of the wretch within. There was that grim resemblance in them to the human shape. There were such moulds of sweating faces, pained and cramped, that it was difficult to think them empty, and terrible distortions lingering within them seemed to follow me when, taking to my boat again, I rowed off to a kind of garden or public walk in the sea, where there were grass and trees but I forgot them when I stood upon its farthest brink. I stood there in my dream, and looked along the ripple to the setting sun, before me in the sky and on the deep a crimson flush, and behind me the whole city, resolving into streaks of red and purple on the water. In the luxurious wonder of so rare a dream, I took but little heed of time, and had but little understanding of its flight, but there were days and nights in it, and when the sun was high, and when the rays of lamps were crooked in the running water, I was still afloat, I thought, plashing the slippery walls and houses with the cleavings of the tide, as my black boat, borne upon it, skimmed along the streets. Sometimes, alighting at the doors of churches and vast palaces, 
I wandered on from room to room, from aisle to aisle, through labyrinths of rich altars, ancient monuments, decayed apartments where the furniture, half awful, half grotesque, was mouldering away. Pictures were there, replete with such enduring beauty and expression, with such passion, truth and power, that they seemed so many young and fresh realities among a host of spectres. I thought these, often intermingled with the old days of the city, with its beauties, tyrants, captains, patriots, merchants, counters, priests, nay, with its very stones and bricks and public places, all of which lived again about me on the walls. Then coming down some marble staircase where the water lapped and oozed against the lower steps, I passed into my boat again, and went on in my dream. Floating down narrow lanes where carpenters at work with plane and chisel in their shops tossed the light shaving straight upon the water where it lay like weed or ebbed away before me in a tangled heap. Past open doors, decayed and rotten from long steeping in the wet through which some scanty patch of vine shone green and bright making unusual shadows on the pavement with its trembling leaves past quays and terraces where women gracefully veiled were passing and repassing and where idlers were reclining in the sunshine on flagstones and on flights of steps past bridges where there were idlers too loitering and looking over below stone balconies erected at a giddy height before the loftiest windows of the loftiest houses past plots of garden theatres shrines prodigious piles of architecture gothic saracenic fanciful with all the fancies of all times and countries past buildings that were high and low and black and white and straight and crooked mean and grand crazy and strong twining among a tangled lot of boats and barges and shooting out at last into a grand canal there in the errant fancy of my dream i saw old shylock passing to and fro upon a bridge all built upon with shops and humming with the tongues of men a form i seemed to know for desdemona's leaned down through a latticed blind to pluck a flower and in the dream i thought that shakespeare's spirit was abroad upon the water somewhere stealing through the city at night when two votive lamps burnt before an image of the virgin in a gallery outside the great cathedral near the roof i fancied that the great piazza of the winged lion was a blaze of cheerful light and that its whole arcade was thronged with people while crowds were diverting themselves in splendid coffee-houses opening from it which were never shut i thought but open all night long When the bronze giant struck the hour of midnight on the bell, I thought the life and animation of the city were all centred here, and as I rode away abreast the silent quays, I only saw them dotted here and there with sleeping boatmen wrapped up in their cloaks and lying at full length upon the stones. But close about the quays and churches, palaces and prisons, sucking at their walls and welling up into the secret places of the town, crept the water always. Noiseless and watchful, coiled round and round it in its many folds like an old serpent, waiting for the time, I thought, when people should look down into its depths for any stone of the old city that had claimed to be its mistress. Thus it floated me away until I awoke in the old market-place at Verona. I have many and many a time thought since of this strange dream upon the water, half one Chapter 8 of Pictures from Italy by Charles Dickens. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Anthony Ogus. By Verona, Mantua, and Milan, across the pass of the Samplon into Switzerland. I had been half afraid to go to Verona, lest it should at all put me out of conceit with Romeo and Juliet but I was no sooner come into the old market-place than the misgiving vanished. 
It is so fanciful, quaint, and picturesque a place, formed by such an extraordinary and rich variety of fantastic buildings, that there could be nothing better at the core of even this romantic town, scene of one of the most romantic and beautiful of stories. It was natural enough to go straight from the marketplace to the house of the Capulets, now degenerated into a most miserable little inn. Noisy vetterini and muddy market carts were disputing possession of the yard, which was ankle-deep in dirt, with a brood of splashed and bespattered geese, and there was a grim-visaged dog, viciously panting in a doorway, who would certainly have had Romeo by the leg the moment he put it over the wall, if he had existed and been at large in those times. The orchard fell into other hands, and was parted off many years ago, but there used to be one attached to the house, or at all events there may have been, and the hat, capello, the ancient cognizance of the family, may still be seen carved in stone over the gateway of the yard. The geese, the market carts, their drivers and the dog, were somewhat in the way of the story, it must be confessed, and it would have been pleasanter to have found the house empty and to have been able to walk through the disused rooms. But the hat was unspeakably comfortable, and the place where the garden used to be hardly less so. Besides, the house is a distrustful, jealous-looking house, as one would desire to see, though of a very moderate size, so I was quite satisfied with it as the veritable mansion of the old Capulet, and was correspondingly grateful in my acknowledgments to an extremely unsentimental middle-aged lady, the padrona of the hotel, who was lounging on the threshold looking at the geese, and who at least resembled the Capulets in the one particular of being very great indeed in the family way. From Juliet's home to Juliet's tomb is a transition as natural to the visitor as to fair Juliet herself, or to the proudest Juliet that ever has taught the torches to burn bright in any time. So I went off with a guide to an old, old garden, once belonging to an old, old convent, I suppose, and being admitted at a shattered gate by a bright-eyed woman who was washing clothes, went down some walks where fresh plants and young flowers were prettily growing among fragments of old wall and ivy-coloured mounds, and was shown a little tank or water trough which the bright-eyed woman, drying her arms upon her kerchief, called La Tomba de Gioletta La Sfortunata. With the best disposition in the world to believe, I could do no more than believe that the bright-eyed woman believed, so I gave her that much credit and her customary fee in ready money. It was a pleasure rather than a disappointment that Juliet's resting place was forgotten. However consolatory it may have been to Yorick's ghost to hear the feet upon the pavement overhead and twenty times a day the repetition of his name, it is better for Juliet to lie out of the track of tourists and to have no visitors but such as come to graves in spring rain and sweet air and sunshine. Pleasant Verona, with its beautiful old palaces and charming country in the distance, seen from terrace walks, and stately balustraded galleries, with its Roman gates still spanning the fair street and casting on the sunlight of today the shade of fifteen hundred years ago, with its marble-fitted churches, lofty towers, rich architecture, and quaint old quiet thoroughfares, where shouts of Montagues and Capulets once resounded, and made Verona's ancient citizens cast by their grave beseeming ornaments to wield old partisans. With its fast-rushing river, picturesque old bridge, great castle, waving cypresses, and prospects so delightful and so cheerful, pleasant Verona. In the midst of it, in the Piazza di Bra, a spirit of old time among the familiar realities of the passing hour, is the great Roman amphitheatre so well preserved and carefully maintained that every row of seats is there unbroken. Over certain of the arches the old Roman numerals may yet be seen, 
and there are corridors and staircases and subterranean passages for beasts and winding ways above ground and below as when the fierce thousands hurried in and out intent upon the bloody shows of the arena nestling in some of the shadows and hollow places of the walls now are smiths with their forges and a few small dealers of one kind or other and there are green weeds and leaves and grass upon the parapet but little else is greatly changed when I had traversed all about it with great interest, and had gone up to the topmost round of seats, and turning from the lovely panorama closed in by the distant Alps, looked down into the building, it seemed to lie before me like the inside of a prodigious hat of plaited straw, with an enormous broad brim and a shallow crown, the plaits being represented by the four-and-forty rows of seats. The comparison is a homely and fantastic one, in sober remembrance and on paper, but it was irresistibly suggested at the moment, nevertheless. An equestrian troop had been there a short time before, the same troop, I dare say, that appeared to the old lady in the church at Medena, and had scooped out a little ring at one end of the arena, where their performances had taken place, and where the marks of their horses' feet were still fresh. I could not but picture to myself a handful of spectators gathered together on one or two of the old stone seats, and a spangled cavalier being gallant, or a polchinello funny, with the grim walls looking on. Above all, I thought, how strangely those Roman mutes would gaze upon the favourite comic scene of the travelling English, where a British nobleman, Lord John, with a very loose stomach, dressed in a blue-tailed coat down to his heels, bright yellow breeches and a white hat, comes abroad, riding double on a rearing horse with an English lady, Lady Betsy, in a straw bonnet and green veil and a red spencer, and who always carries a gigantic reticule and a put-up parasol. I walked through and through the town all the rest of the day, and could have walked there until now, I think. In one place there was a very pretty modern theatre, where they had just performed the opera, always popular in Verona, of Romeo and Juliet. In another there was a collection under a colonnade of Greek, Roman and Etruscan remains, presided over by an ancient man who might have been an Etruscan relic himself, for he was not strong enough to open the iron gate when he had unlocked it, and had neither voice enough to be audible when he described the curiosities, nor sight enough to see them, he was so very old. In another place there was a gallery of pictures, so abominably bad that it was quite delightful to see them mouldering away. But anywhere, in the churches, among the palaces, in the streets, on the bridge, or down beside the river, it was always pleasant Verona, and in my remembrance always will be. I read Romeo and Juliet in my room at the inn that night, of course no Englishman had ever read it there before, and set out for Mantua next day at sunrise, repeating to myself in the coupé of an omnibus, and next to the conductor who was reading the mysteries of Paris, there is no world without Verona's walls but purgatory, torture, hell itself. Hence banished is banished from the world, and world's exile is death. Which reminded me that Romeo was only banished five and twenty miles after all, and rather disturbed my confidence in his energy and boldness. Was the way to Mantua as beautiful in his time, I wonder? Did it wind through pasture land as green, bright, with the same glancing streams, and dotted with fresh clumps of graceful trees. Those purple mountains lay on the horizon then for certain, and the dresses of these peasant girls, who wear a great knobbed silver pin like an English life preserver through their hair behind, can hardly be much changed. The hopeful feeling of so bright a morning and so exquisite a sunrise can have been no stranger even to an exiled lover's breast, and Mantua itself must have broken on him in the prospect, with its towers and walls and water, pretty much as on a commonplace and matrimonial omnibus. 
he made the same sharp twists and turns, perhaps, over two rumbling drawbridges, passed through the like long covered wooden bridge, and leaving the marshy water behind, approached the rusty gate of stagnant Mantua. If ever a man were suited to his place of residence and his place of residence to him, the lean apothecary and Mantua came together in a perfect fitness of things. It may have been more stirring then, perhaps. If so, the apothecary was a man in advance of his time, and knew what Mantua would be in 1844. He fasted much, and that assisted him in his foreknowledge. I put up at the Hotel of the Golden Lion, and was in my own room arranging plans with the brave courier, when there came a modest little tap at the door, which opened on an outer gallery surrounding a courtyard, and an intensely shabby little man looked in to inquire if the gentleman would have a cicerone to show the town. His face was so wistful and anxious in the half-open doorway, and there was so much poverty expressed in his faded suit and little pinched hat, and in the threadbare worsted glove with which he held it, not expressed the less because these were evidently his genteel clothes, hastily slipped on, that I would as soon have trodden on him as dismissed him. I engaged him on the instant, and he stepped in directly. While I finished the discussion in which I was engaged, he stood beaming by himself in a corner, making a feint of brushing my hat with his arm. If his fee had been as many Napoleons as it was Frank's, there could not have shot over the twilight of his shabbiness such a gleam of sun as lighted up the whole man now that he was hired. Well, said I when I was ready, shall we go out now? If the gentleman pleases, it is a beautiful day, a little fresh but charming, altogether charming. The gentleman will allow me to open the door. This is the inn-yard, the courtyard of the golden lion. The gentleman will please to mind his footing on the stairs. We were now in the street. This is the street of the golden lion, this the outside of the golden lion. The interesting window up there on the first piano, where the pane of glass is broken, is the window of the gentleman's chamber. Having viewed all these remarkable objects, I inquired if there were much to see in Mantua. "'Well, truly, no, not much. So-so,' he said, shrugging his shoulders apologetically. "'Many churches?' "'No, nearly all suppressed by the French. Monasteries or convents?' "'No, the French again, nearly all suppressed by Napoleon.' "'Much business?' "'Very little business.' "'Many strangers? Ah, heaven!' I thought he would have fainted. "'Then, when we have seen the two large churches yonder, what shall we do next?' said I. He looked up the street and down the street, and rubbed his chin timidly, and then said, glancing in my face as if a light had broken on his mind, yet with a humble appeal to my forbearance that was perfectly irresistible, "'We can take a little turn about the town, signore.' Si può far un piccolo giro della città. It was impossible to be anything but delighted with the proposal, so we set off together in great good humour. In the relief of his mind, he opened his heart and gave up as much of Mantua as a Cicerone could. One must eat, he said, but bar it was a dull place without doubt. He made as much as possible of the Basilica of Santo Andrea a noble church, and of an enclosed portion of the pavement about which tapers were burning and a few people kneeling, and under which is said to be preserved the Sangreal of the old romances. This church disposed of, and another after it, the Cathedral of San Pietro, we went to the museum which was shut up. It was all the same, he said, bah, there was not much inside. Then we went to see the Piazza del Diavolo, built by the devil, for no particular purpose, in a single night. Then the Piazza Virgiliana, then the statue of Virgil. Our poet, my little friend said, plucking up a spirit for the moment and putting his hat a little on one side. Then we went to a dismal sort of farmyard by which a picture gallery was approached. 
The moment the gate of this retreat was opened, some five hundred geese came waddling round us, stretching out their necks and clamouring in the most hideous manner, as if they were ejaculating, "'Oh, here's somebody come to see the pictures! Don't go up! Don't go up!' While we went up, they waited very quietly about the door in a crowd, cackling to one another occasionally in a subdued tone. But the instant we appeared again, their necks came out like telescopes, and setting up a great noise, which meant, I have no doubt, "'What, you would go, would you? What do you think of it? How do you like it?' They attended us to the outer gate and cast us forth derisively into Mantua. The geese who saved the capital were, as compared to these, pork to the learned pig. What a gallery it was! I would take their opinion on a question of art, in preference to the discourses of Sir Joshua Reynolds. Now that we were standing in the street, after being thus ignominiously escorted thither, my little friend was plainly reduced to the piccolo giro, or little circuit of the town, he had formerly proposed but my suggestion that we should visit the palazzo te of which i had heard a great deal as a strange wild place imparted new life to him and away we went the secret of the length of midas's ears would have been more extensively known if that servant of his who whispered it to the reeds had lived in mantua where there are reeds and rushes enough to have published it to all the world the Palazzo Te stands in a swamp amongst this sort of vegetation, and is indeed as singular a place as I ever saw. Not for its dreariness, though it is very dreary, not for its dampness, though it is very damp, nor for its desolate condition, though it is so desolate and neglected as house can be, but chiefly for the unaccountable nightmares with which its interior has been decorated, among other subjects of more delicate execution, by Giulio Romano. There is a leering giant over a certain chimney-piece, and there are dozens of giants, titans warring with Jove, on the walls of another room, so inconceivably ugly and grotesque, that it is marvellous how any man can have imagined such creatures. In the chamber in which they abound, these monsters, with swollen faces and cracked cheeks, and every kind of distortion of look and limb, are depicted as staggering under the weight of falling buildings, and being overwhelmed in the ruins, upheaving masses of rock, and burying themselves beneath, vainly striving to sustain the pillars of heavy roofs that topple down upon their heads, and, in a word, undergoing and doing every kind of mad and demoniacal destruction. The figures are immensely large and exaggerated to the utmost pitch of uncouthness. The colouring is harsh and disagreeable, and the whole effect more like, I should imagine, a violent rush of blood to the head of the spectator than any real picture set before him by the hand of an artist. This apoplectic performance was shown by a sickly-looking woman whose appearance was referable, I dare say, to the bad air of the marshes but it was difficult to help feeling as if she were too much haunted by the giants, and they were frightening her to death all alone in that exhausted cistern of a palace, among the reeds and rushes, with the mists hovering about outside, and stalking round and round it continually. Our walk through Mantua showed us, in almost every street, some suppressed church, now used for a warehouse, now for nothing at all, all as crazy and dismantled as they could be, short of tumbling down bodily. The marshy town was so intensely dull and flat that the dirt upon it seemed not to have come there in the ordinary course, but to have settled and mantled on its surface as on standing water. And yet there were some business dealings going on, and some profits realising, for there were arcades full of Jews, where those extraordinary people were sitting outside their shops, contemplating their stores of stuffs and woollens and bright handkerchiefs and trinkets, and looking in all respects as wary and business-like as their brethren in Houndsditch, London. 
Having selected a veterino from among the neighbouring Christians, who agreed to carry us to Milan in two days and a half, and to start next morning as soon as the gates were opened, I returned to the Golden Lion, and dined luxuriously in my own room, in a narrow passage between two bedsteads, confronted by a smoky fire and backed up by a chest of drawers. At six o'clock next morning we were jingling in the dark through the wet, cold mist that enshrouded the town, and before noon the driver, a native of Mantua, and sixty years of age or thereabouts, began to ask the way to Milan. It lay through Bozzolo, formerly a little republic, and now one of the most deserted and poverty-stricken of towns, where the landlord of the miserable inn, God bless him, it was his weekly custom, was distributing infinitesimal coins among a clamorous herd of women and children whose rags were fluttering in the wind and rain outside his door, where they were gathered to receive his charity. It lay through mist and mud and rain, and vines trained low upon the ground all that day and the next, the first sleeping place being Cremona, memorable for its dark brick churches and immensely high tower the terrazzo to say nothing of its violins of which it certainly produces none in these degenerate days and the second lodi then we went on through more mud mist and rain and marshy ground and through such a fog as englishmen strong in the faith of their own grievances are apt to believe is nowhere to be found but in their own country until we entered the paved streets of Milan. The fog was so dense here that the spire of the far-famed cathedral might as well have been at Bombay for anything that could be seen of it at that time. But as we halted to refresh for a few days then and returned to Milan again next summer, I had ample opportunities of seeing the glorious structure in all its majesty and beauty. All Christian homage to the saint who lies within it. There are many good and true saints in the calendar, but San Carlo Borromeo has, if I may quote Mrs. Primrose on such a subject, my warm heart. A charitable doctor to the sick, a munificent friend to the poor, and this not in any spirit of blind bigotry, but as the bold opponent of enormous abuses in the Romish church, I honour his memory. I honour it none the less because he was nearly slain by a priest, suborned by priest to murder him at the altar, in acknowledgement of his endeavours to reform a false and hypocritical brotherhood of monks. Heaven shield all imitators of San Carlo Borromeo as it shielded him. A reforming pope would need a little shielding even now. The subterranean chapel in which the body of San Carlo Borromeo is preserved presents as striking and as ghastly a contrast, perhaps, as any place can show. The tapers which are lighted down there flash and gleam on alti rilievi in gold and silver, delicately wrought by skilful hands, and representing the principal events in the life of the saint. Jewels and precious metals shine and sparkle on every side. A windlass slowly removes the front of the altar, and within it, in a gorgeous shrine of gold and silver, is seen through alabaster the shriveled mummy of a man, the pontifical robes with which it is adorned, radiant with diamonds, emeralds, rubies, every costly and magnificent gem. The shrunken heap of poor earth in the midst of this great glitter is more pitiful than if it lay upon a dunghill. There is not a ray of imprisoned light in all the flash and fire of jewels, but seems to mock the dusty holes where eyes were once. Every thread of silk in the rich vestments seems only a provision from the worms that spin, for the behoof of worms that propagate in sepulchres. In the old refectory of the dilapidated convent of St. Maria della Grazia is the work of art perhaps better known than any other in the world, The Last Supper by Leonardo da Vinci, with a door cut through it by the intelligent Dominican friars to facilitate their operations at dinner-time. 
I am not mechanically acquainted with the art of painting, and have no other means of judging of a picture than as I see it resembling and refining upon nature, and presenting graceful combinations of forms and colours. I am, therefore, no authority whatever in reference to the touch of this or that master, though I know very well, as anybody may who chooses to think about the matter, that few very great masters can possibly have painted, in the compass of their lives, one half of the pictures that bear their names, and that are recognised by many aspirants to a reputation for taste as undoubted originals. But this, by the way, of the Last Supper I would simply observe that in its beautiful composition and arrangement there is at Milan a wonderful picture, and that in its original colouring, or in its original expression of any single face or feature, there it is not. Apart from the damage it has sustained from damp decay or neglect, it has been, as Barry shows, so retouched upon and repainted, and that so clumsily, that many of the heads are now positive deformities, with patches of paint and plaster sticking upon them like wens, and utterly distorting the expression. Where the original artist set that impress of his genius on a face, which almost in a line or touch separated him from meaner painters, and made him what he was, succeeding bunglers filling up or painting across seams and cracks have been quite unable to imitate his hand, and putting in some scowls or frowns or wrinkles of their own, have blotched and spoiled the work. This is so well established as an historical fact, that I should not repeat it at the risk of being tedious, but for having observed an English gentleman before the picture, who was at great pains to fall into what I may describe as mild convulsions at certain minute details of expression which are not left in it whereas it would be comfortable and rational for travellers and critics to arrive at a general understanding that it cannot fail to have been a work of extraordinary merit once, when with so few of its original beauties remaining, the grandeur of the general design is yet sufficient to sustain it as a piece replete with interest and dignity. We achieved the other sights of Milan in due course, and a fine city it is, though not so unmistakably Italian as to possess the characteristic qualities of many towns far less important in themselves. The Corso, where the Milanese gentry ride up and down in carriages, and rather than not do which they would half starve themselves at home, is a most notable public promenade, shaded by long avenues of trees. In the splendid theatre of La Scala, there was a ballet of action performed after the opera under the title of Prometheus, in the beginning of which some hundred or two of men and women represented our mortal race before the refinements of the arts and sciences and loves and graces came on earth to soften them. I never saw anything more effective. Generally speaking, the pantomimic action of the Italians is more remarkable for its sudden and impetuous character than for its delicate expression, but in this case the drooping monotony, the weary, miserable, listless, moping life, the sordid passions and desires of human creatures, destitute of those elevating influences to which we owe so much, and to whose promoters we render so little, were expressed in a manner really powerful and affecting. I should have thought it almost impossible to present such an idea so strongly on the stage, without the aid of speech. Milan soon lay behind us at five o'clock in the morning, and before the golden statue on the summit of the cathedral spire was lost in the blue sky, the Alps, stupendously confused in lofty peaks and ridges, clouds and snow, were towering in our path. Still we continued to advance towards them until nightfall, and all day long the mountain tops presented strangely shifting shapes as the road displayed them in different points of view. The beautiful day was just declining when we came upon the Lago Maggiore with its lovely islands, 
for however fanciful and fantastic the isola bella may be and is it still is beautiful anything springing out of that blue water with that scenery around it must be it was ten o'clock at night when we got to domodossola at the foot of the pass of the samplon but as the moon was shining brightly and there was not a cloud in the starlit sky it was no time for going to bed or going anywhere but on so we got a little carriage after some delay and began the ascent it was late in november and the snow lying four or five feet thick in the beaten road on the summit in other parts the new drift was already deep the air was piercing cold but the serenity of the night and the grandeur of the road with its impenetrable shadows and deep glooms and its sudden turns into the shining of the moon and its incessant roar of falling water rendered the journey more and more sublime at every step soon leaving the calm italian villages below us sleeping in the moonlight the road began to wind among dark trees and after a time emerged upon a barer region very steep and toilsome where the moon shone bright and high by degrees the roar of water grew louder and the stupendous track after crossing the torrent by a bridge struck in between two massive perpendicular walls of rock that quite shut out the moonlight and only left a few stars shining in the narrow strip of sky above then even this was lost in the thick darkness of a cavern in the rock through which the way was pierced the terrible cataract thundering and roaring close below it and its foam and spray hanging in a mist about the entrance emerging from this cave and coming again into the moonlight and across a dizzy bridge it crept and twisted upward through the gorge of gondo savage and grand beyond description with smooth fronted precipices rising up on either hand and almost meeting overhead thus we went climbing on our rugged way higher and higher all night without a moment's weariness lost in the contemplation of the black rocks the tremendous heights and depths the fields of smooth snow lying in the clefts and hollows and the fierce torrents thundering headlong down the deep abyss towards daybreak we came among the snow where a keen wind was blowing fiercely having with some trouble awakened the inmates of a wooden house in this solitude round which the wind was howling dismally catching up the snow in wreaths and hurling it away we got some breakfast in a room built of rough timbers but well warmed by a stove and well contrived as it had need to be for keeping out the bitter storms a sledge being then made ready and four horses harnessed to it we went ploughing through the snow still upward but now in the cold light of morning and with the great white desert on which we travelled plain and clear we were well upon the summit of the mountain and had before us the rude cross of wood denoting its greatest altitude above the sea when the light of the rising sun struck all at once upon the waste of snow and turned it a deep red the lonely grandeur of the scene was then at its height as we went sledging on there came out of the hospice founded by napoleon a group of peasant travellers with staves and knapsacks who had rested there last night attended by a monk or two their hospitable entertainers trudging slowly forward with them for company's sake it was pleasant to give them good morning and pretty looking back a long way after them to see them looking back at us and hesitating presently when one of our horses stumbled and fell whether or no they should return and help us but he was soon up again with the assistance of a rough wagoner whose team had stuck fast there too and when we had helped him out of his difficulty in return we left him slowly ploughing towards them and went slowly and swiftly forward on the brink of a steep precipice among the mountain pines taking to our wheels again soon afterwards we began rapidly to descend passing under everlasting glaciers by means of arched galleries hung with clusters of dripping icicles 
under and over foaming waterfalls, near places of refuge and galleries of shelter against sudden danger, through caverns over whose arched roofs the avalanches slide in spring and bury themselves in the unknown gulf beneath, down over lofty bridges and through horrible ravines, a little shifting speck in the vast desolation of ice and snow, and monstrous granite rocks, down through the deep gorge of the Saltina, and deafened by the torrent plunging madly down among the riven blocks of rock into the level country far below. Gradually down by zigzag roads, lying between an upward and downward precipice, into warmer weather, calmer air, and softer scenery, until there lay before us, glittering like gold or silver in the thaw and sunshine, the metal-covered, red-green-yellow domes and church spires of a Swiss town. The business of these recollections being with Italy, and my business consequently being to scamper back thither as fast as possible, I will not recall, though I am sorely tempted, how the Swiss villages, clustered at the feet of giant mountains, looked like playthings, or how confusedly the houses were heaped and piled together, or how there were very narrow streets to shut the howling winds out in the winter time and broken bridges which the impetuous torrents suddenly released in spring had swept away, or how there were peasant women here with great round fur caps, looking when they peeped out of casements, and only their heads were seen, like a population of sword-bearers to the Lord Mayor of London, or how the town of Eve, lying on the smooth lake of Geneva, was beautiful to see, or how the statue of St. Peter in the street at Fribourg grasped the largest key that ever was beheld, or how Fribourg is illustrious for its two suspension bridges and its grand cathedral organ, or how between that town and Baal the road meandered among thriving villages of wooden cottages with overhanging thatched roofs and low protruding windows glazed with small round panes of glass like crown pieces, or how in every little Swiss homestead with its cart or wagon carefully stowed away beside the house, its little garden, stock of poultry and groups of red-cheeked children, there was an air of comfort, very new and very pleasant after Italy. Or how the dresses of the women changed again, and there were no more sword-bearers to be seen, and fair white stomachers and great black fan-shaped gauzy-looking caps prevailed instead. Or how the country by the Jura mountains, sprinkled with snow and lighted by the moon, and musical with falling water, was delightful, or how below the windows of the great hotel of the Three Kings at Baal the swollen Rhine ran fast and green, or how at Strasbourg it was quite as fast but not as green, and was said to be foggy lower down, and at that late time of the year was a far less certain means of progress than the highway road to Paris, or how Strasbourg itself in its magnificent old Gothic cathedral and its ancient houses with their peaked roofs and gables, made a little gallery of quaint and interesting views, or how a crowd was gathered inside the cathedral at noon to see the famous mechanical clock in motion striking twelve, how when it struck twelve a whole army of puppets went through many ingenious evolutions, and among them a huge puppet cock perched on the top crowed twelve times loud and clear or how it was wonderful to see this cock at great pains to clap its wings and strain its throat but obviously having no connection whatever with its own voice which was deep within the clock a long way down or how the road to paris was one sea of mud and thence to the coast a little better for a hard frost or how the cliffs of dover were a pleasant sight and England was so wonderfully neat, though dark and lacking colour on a winter's day, it must be conceded, or how a few days afterwards it was cool, recrossing the channel, with ice upon the decks and snow lying pretty deep in France, 
or how the malpost scrambled through the snow headlong drawn in the hilly parts by any number of stout horses at a canter or how there were outside the post office yard in paris before daybreak extraordinary adventurers in heaps of rags groping in the snowy streets with little rakes in search of odds and ends or how between paris and marseilles the snow being then exceeding deep a thaw came on and the mail waded rather than rolled for the next three hundred miles or so breaking springs on sunday nights and putting out its two passengers to warm and refresh themselves pending the repairs in miserable billiard-rooms where hairy company collected above stoves were playing cards the cards being very like themselves extremely limp and dirty or how there was detention at marseilles from stress of weather and steamers were advertised to go which did not go or how the good steam packet charlemagne at length put out and met such weather that now she threatened to run into toulon and now into nice but the wind moderating did neither but ran on into genoa harbour instead where the familiar bells rang sweetly in my ear or how there was a travelling party on board of whom one member was very ill in the cabin next to mine and being ill was cross and therefore declined to give up the dictionary which he kept under his pillow thereby obliging his companions to come down to him constantly to ask what was the italian for a lump of sugar a glass of brandy and water what's a clock and so forth which he always insisted on looking out with his own seasick eyes declining to entrust the book to any man alive like grumio i might have told you in detail all this and something more but to as little purpose were i not deterred by the remembrance that my business is with italy therefore like grumio's Chapter 9 of Pictures from Italy by Charles Dickens. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Anthony Ogus. To Rome by Pisa and Siena. There is nothing in Italy more beautiful to me than the coast road between Genoa and Spezia. On one side, sometimes far below, sometimes nearly on a level with the road, and often skirted by broken rocks of many shapes, there is the free blue sea, with here and there a picturesque felucca gliding slowly on. On the other side are lofty hills, ravines besprinkled with white cottages, patches of dark olive woods, country churches with their light open towers, and country houses gaily painted. On every bank and knoll by the wayside, the wild cactus and aloe flourish in exuberant profusion, and the gardens of the bright villages along the road are seen all blushing in the summer time, with clusters of the belladonna, and are fragrant in the autumn and winter with golden oranges and lemons. Some of the villages are inhabited almost exclusively by fishermen, and it is pleasant to see their great boats hauled up on the beach, making little patches of shade, where they lie asleep, or where the women and children sit romping and looking out to sea, while they mend their nets upon the shore. There is one town, Camoglia, with its little harbour on the sea, hundreds of feet below the road, where families of mariners live, who, time out of mind, have owned coasting vessels in that place, and have traded to Spain and elsewhere. Seen from the road above, it is like a tiny model on the margin of the dimpled water, shining in the sun. Descended into by the winding mule tracks, it is a perfect miniature of a primitive seafaring town, the saltest, roughest, most piratical little place that ever was seen. Great rusty iron rings and mooring chains, capstans and fragments of old masts and spars choke up the way, 
hardy rough weather boats and seamen's clothing flutter in the little harbour or are drawn out on the sunny stones to dry on the parapet of the rude pier a few amphibious looking fellows lay asleep with their legs dangling over the wall as though earth or water were all one to them and if they slipped in they would float away dozing comfortably among the fishes the church is bright with trophies of the sea and votive offerings in commemoration of escape from storm and shipwreck the dwellings not immediately abutting on the harbour are approached by blind low archways and by crooked steps as if in darkness and in difficulty of access they should be like holds of ships or inconvenient cabins under water and everywhere there is a smell of fish and seaweed an old rope the coast road whence camolia is described so far below is famous in the warm season especially in some parts near genoa for fireflies walking there on a dark night i have seen it made one sparkling firmament by these beautiful insects so that the distant stars were pale against the flash and glitter that spangled every olive wood and hillside and pervaded the whole air it was not in such a season however that we traversed this road on our way to rome the middle of january was only just past and it was very gloomy and dark weather very wet besides in crossing the fine pass of bracco we encountered such a storm of mist and rain that we travelled in a cloud the whole way there might have been no Mediterranean in the world for anything that we saw of it there, except when a sudden gust of wind, clearing the mist before it for a moment, showed the agitated sea at a great depth below, lashing the distant rocks and spouting up its foam furiously. The rain was incessant, every brook and torrent was greatly swollen, and such a deafening leaping and roaring and thundering of water I never heard the like of in my life. Hence, when we came to Spezia, we found that the Magra, an unbridged river on the high road to Pisa, was too high to be safely crossed in the ferry boat, and were fain to wait until the afternoon of next day, when it had in some degree subsided. Spezia, however, is a good place to tarry at, by reason firstly of its beautiful bay, secondly of its ghostly inn, thirdly of the headdress of the women, who wear on one side of their head a small doll's straw hat stuck onto their hair, which is certainly the oddest and most roguish headgear that ever was invented. The Magra safely crossed in the ferry-boat, the passage is not by any means agreeable when the current is swollen and strong, we arrived at Carrara within a few hours, in good time next morning we got some ponies and went out to see the marble quarries there are four or five great glens running up into a range of lofty hills until they can run no longer and are stopped by being abruptly strangled by nature the quarries or caves as they call them there are so many openings high up in the hills on either side of these passes where they blast and excavate for marble which may turn out good or bad, may make a man's fortune very quickly, or ruin him by the great expense of working what is worth nothing. Some of these caves were opened by the ancient Romans, and remain as they left them to this hour. Many others are being worked at this moment. Others are to be begun tomorrow, next week, next month. Other is unbought, unthought of, and marble enough for more ages than have passed since the place was resorted to lies hidden everywhere, patiently awaiting its time of discovery. As you toil and clamber up one of these steep gorges, having left your pony soddening his girths in water a mile or two lower down, you hear every now and then echoing among the hills in a low tone, more silent than the previous silence, a melancholy warning bugle, a signal to the miners to withdraw. Then there is a thundering and echoing from hill to hill, and perhaps a splashing up of great fragments of rock into the air, and on you toil again, 
until some other bugle sounds in a new direction and you stop directly lest you should come within range of the new explosion there were numbers of men working high up in these hills on the sides clearing away and sending down the broken masses of stone and earth to make way for the blocks of marble that had been discovered as these came rolling down from unseen hands into the narrow valley i could not help thinking of the deep glen just the same sort of glen where the rock left simbad the sailor and where the merchants from the heights above flung down great pieces of meat for the diamonds to stick to there were no eagles here to darken the sun in their swoop and pounce upon them but it was as wild and fierce as if there had been hundreds but the road the road down which the marble comes however immense the blocks the genius of the country and the spirit of its institutions pave that road repair it watch it keep it going conceive a channel of water running over a rocky bed beset with great heaps of stone of all shapes and sizes winding down the middle of this valley and that being the road because it was the road five hundred years ago imagine the clumsy carts of five hundred years ago being used to this hour and drawn as they used to be five hundred years ago by oxen whose ancestors were worn to death five hundred years ago as their unhappy descendants are now in twelve months by the suffering and agony of this cruel work two pair four pair ten pair twenty pair to one block according to its size down it must come this way in their struggling from stone to stone with their enormous loads behind them they die frequently upon the spot and not they alone for their passionate drivers sometimes tumbling down in their energy are crushed to death beneath the wheels but it was good five hundred years ago and it must be good now and a railroad down one of these steeps the easiest thing in the world will be flat blasphemy when we stood aside to see one of these cars drawn by only a pair of oxen for it had but one small block of marble on it coming down i hailed in my heart the man who sat upon the heavy yoke to keep it on the neck of the poor beasts and who faced backwards not before him as the very devil of true despotism he had a great rod in his hand with an iron point and when they could plough and force their way through the loose bed of the torrent no longer and came to a stop he poked it into their bodies beat it on their heads screwed it round and round in their nostrils got them on a yard or two in the madness of intense pain repeated all these persuasions with increased intensity of purpose when they stopped again got them on once more forced and goaded them to an abrupter point of the descent and when their writhing and smarting and the weight behind them bore them plunging down the precipice in a cloud of scattered water whirled his rod above his head and gave a great whoop and hello as if he had achieved something and had no idea that they might shake him off and blindly mash his brains upon the road in the noontide of his triumph standing in one of the many studii of carrara that afternoon for it is a great workshop full of beautifully finished copies in marble of almost every figure group and bust we know it seemed at first so strange to me that those exquisite shapes replete with grace and thought and delicate repose should grow out of all this toil and sweat and torture but i soon found a parallel to it and an explanation of it in every virtue that springs up in miserable ground and every good thing that has its birth in sorrow and distress and looking out of the sculptor's great window upon the marble mountains all red and glowing in the decline of day but stern and solemn to the last i thought my god how many quarries of human hearts and souls capable of far more beautiful results are left shut up and mouldering away while pleasure travellers through life avert their faces as they pass and shudder at the gloom and ruggedness that conceal them 
the then reigning duke of modena to whom this territory in part belonged claimed the proud distinction of being the only sovereign in europe who had not recognised louis philippe as king of the french he was not a wag but quite in earnest he was also much opposed to railroads and if certain lines in contemplation by the potentates on either side of him had been executed would have probably enjoyed the satisfaction of having an omnibus plying to and fro across his not very vast dominions to forward travellers from one terminus to another carrara shut in by great hills is very picturesque and bold few tourists stay there and the people are nearly all connected in one way or other with the working of marble there are also villages among the caves where the workmen live it contains a beautiful little theatre newly built and it is an interesting custom there to form the chorus of labourers in the marble quarries who are self-taught and sing by ear i heard them in a comic opera and in an act of norma and they acquitted themselves very well unlike the common people of italy generally who with some exceptions among the neapolitans sing vilely out of tune and have very disagreeable singing voices from the summit of a lofty hill beyond carrara the first view of the fertile plain in which the town of pisa lies with leghorn a purple spot in the flat distance is enchanting nor is it only distance that lends enchantment to the view for the fruitful country and rich woods of olive trees through which the road subsequently passes render it delightful the moon was shining when we approached pisa and for a long time we could see behind the wall the leaning tower all awry in the uncertain light the shadowy original of the old pictures in school books setting forth the wonders of the world like most things connected in their first associations with school books and school times it was too small i felt it keenly it was nothing like so high above the wall as i had hoped it was another of the many deceptions practised by mr harris bookseller at the corner of st paul's churchyard london his tower was a fiction but this was a reality and by comparison a short reality still it looked very well and very strange and was quite as much out of the perpendicular as harris had represented it to be the quiet air of pisa too the big guard-house at the gate with only two little soldiers in it the streets with scarcely any show of people in them and the arno flowing quaintly through the centre of the town were excellent so i bore no malice in my heart against mr harris remembering his good intentions but forgave him before dinner and went out full of confidence to see the tower next morning i might have known better but somehow i had expected to see it casting its long shadow on a public street where people came and went all day it was a surprise to me to find it in a grave retired place apart from the general resort and carpeted with smooth green turf but the group of buildings clustered on and about this verdant carpet comprising the tower the baptistry the cathedral and the church of the campo santo is perhaps the most remarkable and beautiful in the whole world and from being clustered there together away from the ordinary transactions and details of the town they have a singularly venerable and impressive character it is the architectural essence of a rich old city with all its common life and common habitations pressed out and filtered away simon compares the tower to the usual pictorial representations in children's books of the tower of babel it is a happy simile and conveys a better idea of the building than chapters of laboured description nothing can exceed the grace and lightness of the structure nothing can be more remarkable than its general appearance in the course of the ascent to the top which is by an easy staircase the inclination is not very apparent but at the summit it becomes so 
and gives one the sensation of being in a ship that has heeled over through the action of an ebb tide. The effect upon the low side, so to speak, looking over from the gallery and seeing the shaft recede to its base, is very startling, and I saw a nervous traveller hold on to the tower involuntarily, after glancing down, as if he had some idea of propping it up. The view within from the ground, looking up as through a slanted tube, is also very curious. It certainly inclines as much as the most sanguine tourist could desire. The natural impulse of ninety-nine people out of a hundred, who are about to recline upon the grass below it, to rest and contemplate the adjacent buildings, would probably be not to take up their position under the leaning side. It is so very much a slant. The manifold beauties of the cathedral and baptistry need no recapitulation from me, though in this case, as in a hundred others, I find it difficult to separate my own delight in recalling them from your weariness in having them recalled. There is a picture of St. Agnes by Andrea del Sarto in the former, and there are a variety of rich columns in the latter that tempt me strongly. It is, I hope, no breach of my resolution not to be tempted into elaborate descriptions to remember the Campo Santo, where grass-grown graves are dug in earth brought more than six hundred years ago from the Holy Land, and where there are surrounding them such cloisters, with such playing lights and shadows falling through their delicate tracery on the stone pavement, as surely the dullest memory could never forget. On the walls of this solemn and lovely place are ancient frescoes, very much obliterated and decayed, but very curious. As usually happens in almost any collection of paintings of any sort in Italy, where there are many heads, there is in one of them a striking accidental likeness of Napoleon. At one time I used to please my fancy with the speculation whether these old painters at their work had a foreboding knowledge of the man who would one day arise to wreak such destruction upon art, whose soldiers would make targets of great pictures and stable their horses among triumphs of architecture. But the same Corsican face is so plentiful in some parts of Italy at this day that a more commonplace solution of the coincidence is unavoidable. If Pisa be the seventh wonder of the world in right of its tower, it may claim to be at least the second or third in right of its beggars. They waylay the unhappy visitor at every turn, escort him to every door he enters at, and lie in wait for him with strong reinforcements at every door by which they know he must come out. The grating of the portal on its hinges is the signal for a general shout, and the moment he appears he is hemmed in and fallen on, by heaps of rags and personal distortions. The beggars seem to embody all the trade and enterprise of Pisa. Nothing else is stirring but warm air. Going through the streets, the fronts of the sleepy houses look like backs. They are all so still and quiet, and unlike houses with people in them, that the greater part of the city has the appearance of a city at daybreak, or during a general siesta of the population or it is yet more like those backgrounds of houses in common prints or old engravings, where windows and doors are squarely indicated, and one figure, a beggar of course, is seen walking off by itself into illimitable perspective. Not so Leghorn, made illustrious by Smollett's grave, which is a thriving, business-like, matter-of-fact place where idleness is shouldered out of the way by commerce. The regulations observed there in reference to trade and merchants are very liberal and free, and the town, of course, benefits by them. Leghorn had a bad name in connection with Stabbers, and with some justice it must be allowed, for not many years ago there was an assassination club there, the members of which bore no ill-will to anybody in particular, but stabbed people, quite strangers to them, in the streets at night for the pleasure and excitement of the recreation. I think the president of this amiable society was a shoemaker. He was taken, however, and the club was broken up. 
it would probably have disappeared in the natural course of events before the railroad between Leghorn and Pisa, which is a good one, and has already begun to an astonish Italy with a precedent of punctuality, order, plain dealing and improvement, the most dangerous and heretical astonisher of all. There must have been a slight sensation as of earthquakes, surely, in the Vatican, when the first Italian railroad was thrown open. Returning to Pisa, and hiring a good-tempered veterino and his four horses to take us on to Rome, we travelled through pleasant Tuscan villages and cheerful scenery all day. The roadside crosses in this part of Italy are numerous and curious. There is seldom a figure on the cross, though there is sometimes a face, but they are remarkable for being garnished with little models in wood, of every possible object that can be connected with the Saviour's death. The cock that crowed when Peter had denied his master thrice is usually perched on the tip-top, and an ornithological phenomenon he generally is. Under him is the inscription, then hung on to the cross-beam of the spear, the reed with a sponge of vinegar and water at the end, the coat without seam for which the soldiers cast lots, the dice-box with which they threw for it, the hammer that drove in the nails, the pincers that pulled them out, the ladder which was set against the cross, the crown of thorns, the instrument of flagellation, the lanthorn with which Mary went to the tomb, I suppose, and the sword with which Peter smote the servant of the high priest, a perfect toy-shop of little objects, repeated at every four or five miles all along the highway. On the evening of the second day from Pisa, we reached the beautiful old city of Siena. There was what they called a carnival in progress, but as its secret lay in a score or two of melancholy people walking up and down the principal street in common toy-shop masks, and being more melancholy, if possible, than the same sort of people in England, I say no more of it. We went off betimes next morning to see the cathedral, which is wonderfully picturesque inside and out, especially the latter, also the market-place or great piazza, which is a large square with a great broken-nosed fountain in it, some quaint Gothic houses, and a high square brick tower, outside the top of which, a curious feature in such views in Italy, hangs an enormous bell. It is like a bit of Venice without the water. There are some curious old palazzi in the town, which is very ancient, and without having, for me, the interest of Verona or Genoa, it is very dreamy and fantastic, and most interesting. We went on again as soon as we had seen these things, and going over a rather bleak country, there had been nothing but vines until now, mere walking sticks at that season of the year, stopped as usual between one and two hours in the middle of the day to rest the horses, that being a part of every veterino contract. We then went on again through a region gradually becoming bleaker and wilder, until it became as bare and desolate as any Scottish moors. Soon after dark we halted for the night at the Osteria of La Scala, a perfectly lone house where the family were sitting round a great fire in the kitchen, raised on a stone platform three or four feet high, and big enough for the roasting of an ox. On the upper and only other floor of this hotel, there was a great wild rambling sala, with one very little window in a by-corner, and four black doors opening into four black bedrooms in various directions. To say nothing of another large black door, opening into another large black sala, with the staircase coming abruptly through a kind of trap-door in the floor, and the rafters of the roof looming above, a suspicious little press skulking in one obscure corner, and all the knives in the house lying about in various directions. The fireplace was of the purest Italian architecture, so that it was perfectly impossible to see it for the smoke. The waitress was like a dramatic brigand's wife, and wore the same style of dress upon her head. The dogs barked like mad, the echoes returned the compliments bestowed upon them, 
there was not another house within twelve miles, and things had a dreary and rather a cut-throat appearance. They were not improved by rumours of robbers having come out, strong and boldly, within a few nights, and of their having stopped the mail very near that place. They were known to have waylaid some travellers not long before, on Mount Vesuvius itself, and were the talk at all the roadside inns. As they were no business of ours, however, for we had very little with us to lose, we made ourselves merry on the subject, and were very soon as comfortable as need be. We had the usual dinner in this solitary house, and a very good dinner it is when you are used to it. There is something with a vegetable or some rice in it which is a sort of shorthand or arbitrary character for soup, and which tastes very well when you have flavoured it with plenty of grated cheese, lots of salt, and abundance of pepper. There is the half-fowl of which this soup had been made. There is a stewed pigeon with the gizzards and livers of himself and other birds stuck all around him. There is a bit of roast beef, the size of a small French roll. There are a scrap of parmesan cheese and five little withered apples, all huddled together on a small plate and crowding one upon the other, as if each were trying to save itself from the chance of being eaten. Then there is coffee, and then there is bed. You don't mind brick floors, you don't mind yawning doors, nor banging windows. You don't mind your own horses being stabled under the bed and so close that every time a horse coughs or sneezes he wakes you. If you are good-humoured to the people about you, and speak pleasantly and look cheerful, take my word for it, you may be well entertained in the very worst Italian inn, and always in the most obliging manner, and may go from one end of the country to the other, despite all stories to the contrary, without any great trial of your patience anywhere especially when you get such wine in flasks as the Orvieto and the Montepulciano. It was a bad morning when we left this place, and we went for twelve miles over a country as barren, as stony and as wild as Cornwall in England, until we came to Radicofani, where there is a ghostly goblin inn, once a hunting seat belonging to the Dukes of Tuscany. It is full of such rambling corridors and gaunt rooms that all the murdering and phantom tales that ever were written might have originated in that one house. There are some horrible old palazzi in Genoa, one in particular not unlike it outside, but there is a winding, creaky, wormy, rustling, door-opening, foot-on-staircase-falling character about this Radicofani hotel such as I never saw anywhere else. The town, such as it is, hangs on a hillside above the house and in front of it. The inhabitants are all beggars, and as soon as they see a carriage coming, they swoop down upon it like so many birds of prey. When we got on the mountain pass which lies beyond this place, the wind, as they had forewarned us at the inn, was so terrific that we were obliged to take my other half out of the carriage, lest she should be blown over, carriage and all, and to hang to it on the windy side, as well as we could for laughing, to prevent its going heaven knows where. For mere force of wind this landstorm might have competed with an Atlantic gale, and had a reasonable chance of coming off victorious. The blast came sweeping down great gullies in a range of mountains on the right, so that we looked with positive awe at a great morass on the left, and saw that there was not a bush or twig to hold by. It seemed as if, once blown from our feet, we must be swept out to sea or away into space. There was snow and hail and rain and lightning and thunder, and there were rolling mists travelling with incredible velocity. It was dark, awful and solitary to the last degree. There were mountains above mountains, veiled in angry clouds, and there was such a wrathful, rapid, violent, tumultuous hurry everywhere as rendered the scene unspeakably exciting and grand. It was a relief to get out of it, notwithstanding, and to cross even the dismal, dirty papal frontier. 
after passing through two little towns in one of which aquapendente there was also a carnival in progress consisting of one man dressed and masked as a woman and one woman dressed and masked as a man walking ankle-deep through the muddy streets in a very melancholy manner we came at dusk within sight of the lake of bolzena on whose bank there is a little town of the same name much celebrated for malaria with the exception of this poor place there is not a cottage on the banks of the lake or near it for nobody dare sleep there not a boat upon its waters not a stick or stake to break the dismal monotony of seven and twenty watery miles we were late in getting in the roads being very bad from heavy rains and after dark the dullness of the scene was quite intolerable we entered on a very different and finer scene of desolation next night at sunset we had passed through monte Fiascione, famous for its wine and viterbo for its fountains and after climbing up a long hill of eight or ten miles extent came suddenly upon the margin of a solitary lake in one part very beautiful with a luxuriant wood in another very barren and shut in by bleak volcanic hills where this lake flows there stood of old a city it was swallowed up one day and in its stead this water rose there are ancient traditions common to many parts of the world of the ruined city having been seen below when the water was clear but however that may be from this spot of earth it vanished the ground came bubbling up above it and the water too and here they stand like ghosts on whom the other world closed suddenly and who have no means of getting back again they seem to be waiting the course of ages for the next earthquake in that place when they will plunge below the ground at its first yawning and be seen no more the unhappy city below is not more lost and dreary than these fire-charred hills and the stagnant water above the red sun looks strangely on them as with the knowledge that they were made for caverns and darkness and the melancholy water oozed and sucked the mud and crept quietly among the marshy grass and reeds as if the overthrow of all the ancient towers and housetops and the death of all the ancient people born and bred there were yet heavy on its conscience a short ride from this lake brought us to ronsidlione a little town like a large pigsty where we passed the night next morning at seven o'clock we started for rome as soon as we were out of the pigsty we entered on the campagna romana an undulating flat as you know where few people can live and where for miles and miles there is nothing to relieve the terrible monotony and gloom of all kinds of country that could by possibility lie outside the gates of rome this is the aptest and fittest burial ground for the dead city so sad so quiet so sullen so secret in its covering up of great masses of ruin and hiding them so like the waste places into which the men possessed with devils used to go and howl and rend themselves in the old days of jerusalem we had to traverse thirty miles of this campagna and for two and twenty we went on and on seeing nothing but now and then a lonely house or a villainous-looking shepherd with matted hair all over his face and himself wrapped to the chin in a frowsy brown mantle tending his sheep at the end of that distance we stopped to refresh the horses and to get some lunch in a common malaria-shaken despondent little public house whose every inch of wall and beam inside was according to custom painted and decorated in a way so miserable that every room looked like the wrong side of another room and with its wretched imitation of drapery and lopsided little daubs of liars seemed to have been plundered from behind the scenes of some travelling circus when we were fairly going off again we began in a perfect fever to strain our eyes for rome and when after another mile or two the eternal city appeared at length in the distance it looked like 
I am half afraid to write the word, like London. There it lay under a thick cloud, with innumerable towers and steeples and roofs of houses rising up into the sky, and high above them all one dome. I swear that keenly as I felt the seeming absurdity of the comparison, it was so like London at that distance, that if you could have shown it me in a glass, I should have taken it for... Chapter 10, Part 1 of Pictures from Italy by Charles Dickens. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Anthony Ogus. Rome. We entered the Eternal City at about four o'clock in the afternoon on the 30th of January by the Porta del Popolo, and came immediately, it was a dark, muddy day and there had been heavy rain, on the skirts of the carnival. We did not then know that we were only looking at the fag end of the masks who were driving slowly round and round the piazza until they could find a promising opportunity for falling into the stream of carriages and getting in good time into the thick of the festivity and coming among them so abruptly all travel-stained and weary was not coming very well prepared to enjoy the scene. We had crossed the Tiber by the Ponte Molle two or three miles before. It had looked as yellow as it ought to look, and hurrying on between its worn away and miry banks had a promising aspect of desolation and ruin. The masquerade dresses on the fringe of the carnival did great violence to this promise. There were no great ruins, no solemn tokens of antiquity to be seen. They all lie on the other side of the city. There seemed to be long streets of commonplace shops and houses, such as are to be found in any European town. There were busy people, equipages, ordinary walkers to and fro, a multitude of chattering strangers. It was no more my Rome, the Rome of anybody's fancy man or boy, degraded and fallen and lying asleep in the sun and among a heap of ruins, than the Place de la Concorde in Paris is. A cloudy sky, a dull cold rain and muddy streets I was prepared for, but not for this, and I confess to having gone to bed that night in a very indifferent humour and with a very considerably quenched enthusiasm. Immediately on going out next day we hurried off to St Peter's. It looked immense in the distance, but distinctly and decidedly small by comparison on a near approach. The beauty of the piazza on which it stands, with its clusters of exquisite columns and its gushing fountains, so fresh, so broad and free and beautiful, nothing can exaggerate. The first burst of the interior, in all its expansive majesty and glory, and most of all the looking up into the dome, is a sensation never to be forgotten. But there were preparations for a festa, the pillars of stately marble were swathed in some impertinent frippery of red and yellow. The altar and entrance to the subterranean chapel, which is before it, in the centre of the church, were like a goldsmith's shop, or one of the opening scenes in a very lavish pantomime. And though I had as high a sense of the beauty of the building, I hope, as it is possible to entertain, I felt no very strong emotion. I have been infinitely more affected in many English cathedrals when the organ has been playing, and in many English country churches when the congregation have been singing. I had a much greater sense of mystery and wonder in the Cathedral of St Mark at Venice. When we came out of the church again, we stood nearly an hour staring up into the dome, and would not have gone over the cathedral then for any money, we said to the coachman, Go to the Colosseum. In a quarter of an hour or so he stopped at the gate, and we went in. It is no fiction, but plain, sober, honest truth to say, so suggestive and distinct is it at this hour, that for a moment, actually in passing in, they who will may have the whole great pile before them as it used to be, 
with thousands of eager faces staring down into the arena, and such a whirl of strife and blood and dust going on there, as no language can describe. Its solitude, its awful beauty, and its utter desolation strike upon the stranger the next moment like a softened sorrow, and never in his life, perhaps, will he be so moved and overcome by any sight, not immediately connected with his own affections and afflictions. To see it crumbling there an inch a year, its walls and arches overgrown with green, its corridors open to the day, the long grass growing in its porches, young trees of yesterday springing up on its ragged parapets and bearing fruit, chance produce of the seeds dropped there by the birds who build their nest within its chinks and crannies, to see its pit of fight filled up with earth and the peaceful cross planted in the centre, to climb into its upper halls and look down on ruin, 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 all about it, the triumphal arches of Constantine, Septimus Severus and Titus, the Roman Forum, the Palace of the Caesars, the temples of the old religion fallen down and gone, is to see the ghost of old Rome, wicked, wonderful old city, haunting the very ground on which its people trod. It is the most impressive, the most stately, the most solemn, grand, majestic, mournful sight conceivable. Never in its bloodiest prime can the sight of the gigantic Colosseum, full and running over with the lustiest life, have moved one's heart as it must move all who look upon it now, a ruin. God be thanked, a ruin. As it tops the other ruins, standing there a mountain among graves, so do its ancient influences outlive all other remnants of the old mythology and old butchery of Rome, in the nature of the fierce and cruel Roman people. The Italian face changes as the visitor approaches the city. Its beauty becomes devilish, and there is scarcely one countenance in a hundred among the common people in the streets that would not be at home and happy in a renovated Colosseum tomorrow. Here was Rome indeed at last, and such a Rome as no one can imagine in its full and awful grandeur. We wandered out upon the Appian Way, and then went on through miles of ruined tombs and broken walls, with here and there a desolate and uninhabited house, past the circus of Romulus, where the course of the chariots, the stations of the judges, competitors and spectators, are yet as plainly to be seen as in old time, past the tomb of Cecilia Metella, past all enclosure, hedge or stake, wall or fence, away upon the open campagna, where on that side of Rome nothing is to be beheld but ruin, except where the distant Apennines bound the view upon the left, the whole wide prospect is one field of ruin, broken aqueducts left in the most picturesque and beautiful cluster of arches, broken temples, broken tombs, a desert of decay, sombre and desolate beyond all expression, and with a history in every stone that strews the ground. On Sunday the Pope assisted in the performance of High Mass at St. Peter's. The effect of the cathedral on my mind on that second visit was exactly what it was at first, and what it remains after many visits. It is not religiously impressive or affecting. It is an immense edifice, with no one point for the mind to rest upon and it tires itself with wandering round and round. The very purpose of the place is not expressed in anything you see there, unless you examine its details, and all examination of details is incompatible with the place itself. It might be a pantheon or a senate house, or a great architectural trophy, having no other object than an architectural triumph. There is a black statue of St. Peter, to be sure, under a red canopy, which is larger than life, and which is constantly having its great toe kissed by good Catholics. You cannot help seeing that, it is so very prominent and popular, but it does not heighten the effect of the temple as a work of art, and it is not expressive, to me at least, of its high purpose. 
A large space behind the altar was fitted up with boxes, shaped like those at the Italian opera in England, but in their decoration much more gaudy. In the centre of the kind of theatre thus railed off was a canopied dais with the Pope's chair upon it. The pavement was covered with a carpet of the brightest green, and what with this green and the intolerable reds and crimsons and gold borders of the hangings, the whole concern looked like a stupendous bonbon. On either side of the altar was a large box for lady strangers. These were filled with ladies in black dresses and black veils. The gentlemen of the Pope's guard, in red coats, leather breeches and jack boots, guarded all this reserved space with drawn swords that were very flashy in every sense, and from the altar all down the nave a broad lane was kept clear by the Pope's Swiss guard, who wear a quaint striped surcoat and striped tight legs, and carry halberds like those which are usually shouldered by those theatrical supernumeraries who never can get off the stage fast enough, and who may be generally observed to linger in the enemy's camp after the open country, held by the opposite forces, has been split up the middle by a convulsion of nature. I got upon the border of the green carpet, in company with a great many other gentlemen, attired in black, no other passport is necessary, and stood there at my ease during the performance of mass. The singers were in a crib of wirework, like a large meat safe or bird cage, in one corner, and sang most atrociously. All about the green carpet there was a slowly moving crowd of people, talking to each other, staring at the Pope through eyeglasses, defrauding one another in moments of partial curiosity out of precarious seats on the bases of pillars, and grinning hideously at the ladies. Dotted here and there were little knots of friars, Francescani or Cappuccini, in their coarse brown dresses and peaked hoods, making a strange contrast to the gaudy ecclesiastics of higher degree, and having their humility gratified to the utmost, by being shouldered about and elbowed right and left on all sides. Some of these had muddy sandals and umbrellas and stained garments, having trudged in from the country. The faces of the greater part were as coarse and heavy as their dress, their dogged, stupid, monotonous stare at all the glory and splendour, having something in it half miserable and half ridiculous. Upon the green carpet itself, and gathered round the altar, was a perfect army of cardinals and priests, in red, gold, purple, violet, white, and fine linen. Stragglers from these went to and fro among the crowd, conversing to and to, or giving and receiving introductions, and exchanging salutations. Other functionaries in black gowns and other functionaries in court dresses were similarly engaged. In the midst of all these, and stealthy Jesuits creeping in and out, and the extreme restlessness of the youth of England, who were perpetually wandering about, some few steady persons in black cassocks, who had knelt down with their faces to the wall, and were poring over their missiles, became unintentionally a sort of humane man-traps, and with their own devout legs tripped up other people's by the dozen. There was a great pile of candles lying down on the floor near me, which a very old man in a rusty black gown, with an open-work tippet, like a summer ornament for a fireplace in tissue paper, made himself very busy in dispensing to all the ecclesiastics, one apiece. They loitered about with these for some time, under their arms like walking-sticks, or in their hands like truncheons. At a certain period of the ceremony, however, each carried his candle up to the Pope, laid it across his two knees to be blessed, took it back again, and filed off. This was done in a very attenuated procession, as you may suppose, and occupied a long time. Not because it takes long to bless a candle through and through, but because there were so many candles to be blessed. At last they were all blessed, and then they were all lighted, and then the Pope was taken up, chair and all, and carried round the church. 
I must say that I never saw anything out of November so like the popular English commemoration of the fifth of that month. A bundle of matches and a lantern would have made it perfect. Nor did the Pope himself at all mar the resemblance, though he has a pleasant and venerable face. For as this part of the ceremony makes him Gideon sick, he shuts his eyes when it is performed. And having his eyes shut and a great mitre on his head, and his head itself wagging to and fro as they shook him in carrying, he looked as if his mask were going to tumble off. The two immense fans which were always borne, one on either side of him, accompanied him, of course, on this occasion. As they carried him along, he blessed the people with a mystic sign, and as he passed them they kneeled down. When he had made the round of the church, he was brought back again, and if I am not mistaken, this performance was repeated in the whole three times. There was certainly nothing solemn or effective in it, and certainly very much that was droll and tawdry. But this remark applies to the whole ceremony, except the raising of the host, when every man in the guard dropped on one knee instantly, and dashed his naked sword on the ground, which had a fine effect. The next time I saw the cathedral was some two or three weeks afterwards, when I climbed up into the ball, and then, the hangings being taken down and the carpet taken up, but all the framework left, the remnants of these decorations looked like an exploded cracker. The Friday and Saturday having been solemn festa days, and Sunday being always a dies non in carnival proceedings, we had looked forward with some impatience and curiosity to the beginning of the new week, Monday and Tuesday being the two last and best days of the carnival. On the Monday afternoon, at one or two o'clock, there began to be a great rattling of carriages into the courtyard of the hotel, a hurrying to and fro of all the servants in it, and now and then a swift shooting across some doorway or balcony of a straggling stranger in a fancy dress, not yet sufficiently well used to the same to wear it with confidence and defy public opinion. All the carriages were open and had the linings carefully covered with white cotton or calico to prevent their proper decorations from being spoiled by the incessant pelting of sugar plums, and people were packing and cramming into every vehicle as it waited for its occupants enormous sacks and baskets full of these confetti, together with such heaps of flowers, tied up in little nosegays, that some carriages were not only brimful of flowers, but literally running over, scattering at every shake and jerk of the springs some of their abundance on the ground. Not to be behindhand in these essential particulars, we caused two very respectable sacks of sugar plums, each about three feet high, and a large clothes basket full of flowers, to be conveyed into our hired barouche with all speed, and from our place of observation in one of the upper balconies of the hotel, we contemplated these arrangements with the liveliest satisfaction. The carriages now beginning to take up their company and move away, we got into ours and drove off too, armed with little wire masks for our faces, the sugar plums, like full staff's adulterated sack, having lime in their composition. The Corso is a street a mile long, a street of shops and palaces and private houses, sometimes opening into a broad piazza. There are verandas and balconies of all shapes and sizes, to almost every house, not on one storey alone, but often to one room or another on every storey, put there in general with so little order or regularity that if year after year and season after season it had rained balconies, hailed balconies, snowed balconies, blown balconies, they could scarcely have come into existence in a more disorderly manner. This is the great fountainhead and focus of the carnival. But all the streets in which the carnival is held, being vigilantly kept by dragoons, it is necessary for carriages in the first instance to pass in line down another thoroughfare and so come into the corso at the end remote from Piazza del Popolo, which is one of its terminations. Accordingly, we fell into the string of coaches and for some time jogged on quietly enough, 
now crawling on at a very slow walk, now trotting half a dozen yards, now backing fifty, and now stopping altogether, as the pressure in front obliged us. If any impetuous carriage dashed out of the rank and clattered forward with the wild idea of getting on faster, it was suddenly met or overtaken by a trooper on horseback, who, deaf as his own drawn sword to all remonstrances, immediately escorted it back to the very end of the row, and made it a dim speck in the remotest perspective. Occasionally we interchanged a volley of confetti with the carriage next in front, or the carriage next behind, but as yet this capturing of stray and errant coaches by the military was the chief amusement. Presently we came into a narrow street, where, besides one line of carriages going, there was another line of carriages returning. Here the sugar-plums and the nosegays began to fly about, pretty smartly, and I was fortunate enough to observe one gentleman attired as a Greek warrior catch a light-whiskered brigand on the nose. He was in the very act of tossing up a bouquet to a young lady in a first-floor window, with a precision that was much applauded by the bystanders. As this victorious Greek was exchanging a facetious remark with a stout gentleman in a doorway, one half black and one half white, as if he had been peeled up the middle, who had offered him his congratulations on this achievement, he received an orange from a housetop full on his left ear, and was much surprised, not to say discomfited especially as he was standing up at the time, and in consequence of the carriage moving on suddenly, at the same moment staggered ignominiously, and buried himself among his flowers. Some quarter of an hour of this sort of progress brought us to the Corso, and anything so gay, so bright and lively as the whole scene there, it would be difficult to imagine. From all the innumerable balconies, from the remotest and highest, no less than from the lowest and nearest, hangings of bright red, bright green, bright blue, white and gold, were fluttering in the brilliant sunlight. From windows and from parapets and tops of houses, streamers of the richest colours and draperies of the gaudiest and most sparkling hues were floating out upon the street. The building seemed to have been literally turned inside out, and to have all their gaiety towards the highway. Shop fronts were taken down, and the windows filled with company, like boxes at a shining theatre. Doors were carried off their hinges, and long tapestried groves, hung with garlands and flowers and evergreens, displayed within. Builders' scaffoldings were gorgeous temples, radiant in silver, gold and crimson, and in every nook and corner, from the pavement to the chimney-tops, where women's eyes could glisten, there they danced and laughed and sparkled, like the light in water. Every sort of bewitching madness of dress was there, little preposterous scarlet jackets, quaint old stomachers, more wicked than the smartest bodices, Polish pelisses, strained and tight as ripe gooseberries tiny greek caps all awry and clinging to the dark hair heaven knows how every wild quaint bold shy pettish madcap fancy had its illustration in a dress and every fancy was as dead forgotten by its owner in the tumult of merriment as if the three old aqueducts that still remain entire had brought lethe into rome upon their sturdy arches that morning The carriages were now three abreast, in broader places four, often stationary for a long time together, always one close mass of variegated brightness, showing the whole street full through the storm of flowers, like flowers of a larger growth themselves. In some, the horses were richly caparisoned in magnificent trappings, in others they were decked from head to tail with flowing ribbons. Some were driven by coachmen with enormous double faces, one face leering at the horses, the other cocking its extraordinary eyes into the carriage, and both rattling again under the hail of sugar-plums. Other drivers were attired as women, wearing long ringlets and no bonnets, and looking more ridiculous in any real difficulty with the horses, 
of which in such a concourse there were a great many, than tongue can tell, or pen describe. Instead of sitting in the carriages upon the seats, the handsome Roman women, to see and to be seen the better, sit in the heads of the barouches, at this time of general licence, with their feet upon the cushions. And oh, the flowing skirts and dainty waists, the blessed shapes and laughing faces, the free, good-humoured, gallant figures that they make. There were great vans, too, full of handsome girls, thirty or more together, perhaps, and the broad sides that were poured into and poured out of these fairy fire-shops splashed the air with flowers and bonbons for ten minutes at a time. Carriages delayed long in one place would begin a deliberate engagement with other carriages, or with people at the lower windows, and the spectators at some upper balcony or window, joining in the fray and attacking both parties, would empty down great bags of confetti that descended like a cloud and in an instant made them white as millers. Still, carriages on carriages, dresses on dresses, colours on colours, crowds upon crowds, without end. Men and boys clinging to the wheels of coaches and holding on behind and following in their wake, and diving in among the horses' feet to pick up scattered flowers to sell again. Maskers on foot, the drollest generally, in fantastic exaggeration of court dresses, surveying the throng through enormous eyeglasses, and always transported with an ecstasy of love on the discovery of any particularly old lady at a window, long strings of polichinelli laying about them with blown bladders at the end of sticks, a wagon full of madmen, screaming and tearing to the life, a coach full of grave mamelukes with their horse-tailed standards set up in the midst, a party of gypsy women engaged in terrific conflict with a ship full of sailors, a man monkey on a pole, surrounded by strange animals with pigs' faces and lions' tails, carried under their arms or worn gracefully over their shoulders, carriages on carriages, dresses on dresses, colours on colours, crowds upon crowds without end. Not many actual characters sustained or represented, perhaps, considering the number dressed, but the main pleasure of the scene consisting in its perfect good temper, in its bright and infinite and flashing variety, and in its entire abandonment to the mad humour of the time, an abandonment so perfect, so contagious, so irresistible, that the steadiest foreigner fights up to his middle in flowers and sugar-plums, like the wildest Roman of them all, and thinks of nothing else till half-past four o'clock, when he is suddenly reminded, to his great regret, that this is not the whole business of his existence, by hearing the trumpets sound, and seeing the dragoons begin to clear the street. How it ever is cleared for the race that takes place at five, or how the horses ever go through the race without going over the people, is more than I can say. But the carriages get out into the by-streets or up into the Piazza del Popolo, and some people sit in temporary galleries in the latter place, and tens of thousands line the corso on both sides when the horses are brought out into the piazza, to the foot of that same column which for centuries looked down upon the games and chariot races in the Circus Maximus. At a given signal they are started off. Down the live lane, the whole length of the Corso, they fly like the wind, riderless as all the world knows, with shining ornaments upon their backs and twisted in their plaited manes, and with heavy little balls stuck full of spikes dangling at their sides to goad them on. The jingling of these trappings and the rattling of their hooves upon the hard stones, the dash and fury of their speed along the echoing street, nay, the very cannon that are fired, these noises are nothing to the roaring of the multitude, their shouts, the clapping of their hands. But it is soon over, almost instantaneously. More cannon shake the town, the horses have plunged into the carpets put across the street to stop them, the goal is reached, the prizes are won, they are given in part by the poor Jews as a compromise for not running foot-races themselves, 
and there is an end to that day's sport. But if the scene be bright and gay and crowded on the last day but one, it attains on the concluding day to such a height of glittering colour, swarming life and frolicsome uproar, that the bare recollection of it makes me giddy at this moment. The same diversions, greatly heightened and intensified, in the ardour with which they are pursued, go on until the same hour. The race is repeated, the cannons are fired, the shouting and clapping of hands are renewed, the cannons are fired again, the race is over, and the prizes are won. But the carriages, ankle-deep with sugar-plums within, and so beflowered and dusty without, as to be hardly recognisable for the same vehicles that they were three hours ago, instead of scampering off in all directions, throng into the Corso, where they are soon wedged together in a scarcely moving mass. For the diversion of the Moccoletti, the last gay madness of the carnival, is now at hand, and sellers are little tapers like what are called Christmas candles in England, a shouting lustily on every side, Mockali, Mockali, Ecco Mockali, a new item in the tumult, quite abolishing that other item of Ecco Fiori, Ecco Fior, which has been making itself audible over all the rest at intervals the whole day through. As the bright hangings and dressings are all fading into one dull, heavy uniform colour in the decline of the day, Lights begin flashing here and there, in the windows, on the housetops, in the balconies, in the carriages, in the hands of the foot passengers, little by little, gradually, gradually, more and more, until the whole long street is one great glare and blaze of fire. Then everybody present has but one engrossing object, that is, to extinguish other people's candles and to keep his own alight. And everybody, man, woman or child, gentleman or lady, prince or peasant, native or foreigner, yells and screams and roars incessantly as a taunt to the subdued, Senza moccolo, senza moccolo, without a light, without a light, until nothing is heard but a gigantic chorus of those two words mingled with peals of laughter. The spectacle at this time is one of the most extraordinary that can be imagined. Carriages coming slowly by, with everybody standing on the seats or on the box, holding up their lights at arm's length for greater safety, some in paper shades, some with a bunch of undefended little tapers kindled altogether, some with blazing torches, some with feeble little candles, men on foot creeping along among the wheels, watching their opportunity to make a spring at some particular light and dash it out, other people climbing up into carriages to get hold of them by main force, others chasing some unlucky wanderer round and round his own coach to blow out the light he has begged or stolen somewhere before he can ascend to his own company and enable them to light their extinguished tapers, others with their hats off at a carriage door, humbly beseeching some kind-hearted lady to oblige them with a light for a cigar and when she is in the fullness of doubt whether to comply or no, blowing out the candle she is guarding so tenderly with her little hand. Other people at the windows, fishing for candles with lines and hooks, or letting down long willow wands with handkerchiefs at the end, and flapping them out dexterously when the bear is at the height of his triumph. Others binding their time in corners with an immense extinguishers like halberds, and suddenly coming down upon glorious torches, others gathering round one coach and sticking to it, others raining oranges and nosegays and an obdurate little lantern, or regularly storming a pyramid of men holding up one man among them who carries one feeble little wick above his head with which he defies them all. Senza moccolo, senza moccolo! Beautiful women standing up in coaches, pointing in derision at extinguished lights and clapping their hands as they pass on, crying, Senza moccolo, senza moccolo! Low balconies full of lovely faces and gay dresses, struggling with assailants in the streets, some repressing them as they climb up, some bending down, some leaning over, some shrinking back, 
delicate arms and bosoms, graceful figures, glowing lights, fluttering dresses, senza moccolo, senza moccolo, senza moccolo, when in the wildest enthusiasm of the cry and fullest ecstasy of the sport, the Ave Maria rings from the church steeples, and the carnival is over in an instant, put out like a taper, with a breath. There was a masquerade at the theatre at night, as dull and senseless as a London one, and only remarkable for the summary way in which the house was cleared at eleven o'clock, which was done by a line of soldiers forming along the wall at the back of the stage, and sweeping the whole company out before them like a broad broom. The game of the Moccoletti, the word in the singular Moccoletto is the diminutive of Moccolo, and means a little lamp or candle snuff, is supposed by some to be a ceremony of burlesque mourning for the death of the carnival, candles being indispensable to Catholic grief. But whether it be so, or be a remnant of the ancient Saturnalia, or an incorporation of both, or have its origin in anything else, I shall always remember it, and the frolic, as a brilliant and most captivating sight, no less remarkable for the unbroken good humour of all concerned, down to the very lowest, and among those who scaled the carriages were many of the commonest men and boys, than for its innocent vivacity. For odd as it may seem to say so of a sport so full of thoughtlessness and personal display, it is as free from any taint of immodesty as any general mingling of the two sexes can possibly be, and there seems to prevail during its progress a feeling of general, almost childish simplicity and confidence, which one thinks of with a pang when the Ave Maria has wrung it away for a whole Chapter 10, Part 2 of Pictures from Italy by Charles Dickens. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Anthony Ogus. Availing ourselves of a part of the quiet interval between the termination of the carnival and the beginning of the Holy Week, when everybody had run away from the one and few people had yet begun to run back again for the other, we went conscientiously to work to see Rome, and by dint of going out early every morning, and coming back late every evening, and labouring hard all day, I believe we made acquaintance with every post and pillar in the city and the country round, and in particular explored so many churches that I abandoned that part of the enterprise at last, before it was half finished, lest I should never of my own accord go to church again as long as I lived. But I managed almost every day at one time or other to get back to the Colosseum and out upon the open campagna beyond the tomb of Cecilia Metla. We often encountered in these expeditions a company of English tourists, with whom I had an ardent but ungratified longing to establish a speaking acquaintance. They were one Mr. Davis and a small circle of friends. It was impossible not to know Mrs. Davis's name, from her being always in great request among her party, and her party being everywhere. During the Holy Week they were in every part of every scene of every ceremony. For a fortnight or three weeks before it, they were in every tomb, and every church, and every ruin, and every picture gallery. And I hardly ever observed Mrs. Davis to be silent for a moment. Deep underground, high up in St. Peter's, out on the Campagna, and stifling in the Jews' quarter, Mrs. Davis turned up all the same. I don't think she ever saw anything, or ever looked at anything, and she had always lost something out of a straw hand-basket, and was trying to find it with all her might and main, among an immense quantity of English halfpence which lay like sands upon the seashore at the bottom of it. There was a professional cicerone always attached to the party, which had been brought over from London fifteen or twenty strong, by contract, and if he so much as looked at Mrs. Davis, she invariably cut him short by saying, there, God bless the man, don't worry at me. 
I don't understand a word you say, and shouldn't if you was to talk till you was black in the face. Mr. Davis always had a snuff-coloured great coat on, and carried a great green umbrella in his hand, and had a slow curiosity constantly devouring him, which prompted him to do extraordinary things, such as taking the covers off urns in tombs, and looking in at the ashes as if they were pickles, and tracing out inscriptions with a ferrule of his umbrella, and saying with intense thoughtfulness, "'Is a B, you see, and there's an R, and this is the way we goes on in, is it?' His antiquarian habits occasioned his being frequently in the rear of the rest, and one of the agonies of Mrs. Davis and the party in general was an ever-present fear that Davis would be lost. This caused them to scream for him in the strangest places and at the most improper seasons, and when he came slowly emerging out of some sepulchre or other, like a peaceful ghoul, saying, "'Here I am!' Mrs. Davis invariably replied, "'You'll be buried alive in a foreign country, Davis, and it's no use trying to prevent you.' Mr. and Mrs. Davis and their party had probably been brought from London in about nine or ten days. Eighteen hundred years ago, the Roman legions under Claudius protested against being led into Mr. and Mrs. Davis's country, urging that it lay beyond the limits of the world. Among what may be called the cubs or minor lions of Rome, there was one that amused me mightily. It is always to be found there, and its den is on the great flight of steps that lead from the Piazza di Spagna to the church of Trinità del Monte. In plainer words, these steps are the great place of resort for the artist's models, and there they are constantly waiting to be hired. The first time I went up there I could not conceive why the faces seemed familiar to me, why they appeared to have beset me for years in every possible variety of action and costume, and how it came to pass that they started up before me in Rome in the broad day like so many saddled and bridled nightmares. I soon found that we had made acquaintance and improved it for several years on the walls of various exhibition galleries. There is one old gentleman with long white hair and an immense beard, who to my knowledge has gone half through the catalogue of the Royal Academy. This is the venerable or patriarchal model. He carries a long staff, and every knot and twist in that staff I have seen faithfully delineated innumerable times. There is another man in a blue cloak, who always pretends to be asleep in the sun, when there is any, and who, I need not say, is always very wide awake, and very attentive to the disposition of his legs. This is the dolce far niente model. There is another man in a brown cloak, who leans against a wall, with his arms folded in his mantle, and looks out of the corners of his eyes, which are just visible beneath his broad slouched hat. This is the assassin model. There is another man who constantly looks over his own shoulder and is always going away but never does. This is the haughty or scornful model. As to domestic happiness and holy families, they should come very cheap, for there are lumps of them all up the steps, and the cream of the thing is that they are all the falsest vagabonds in the world, especially made up for the purpose and having no counterparts in Rome or any other part of the habitable globe. My recent mention of the carnival reminds me of its being said to be a mock mourning, in the ceremony with which it closes, for the gaieties and merry-makings before Lent, and this again reminds me of the real funerals and mourning processions of Rome, which, like those in most other parts of Italy, are rendered chiefly remarkable to a foreigner by the indifference with which the mere clay is universally regarded after life has left it. And this is not from the survivors having had time to disassociate the memory of the dead from their well-remembered appearance and form on earth, for the interment follows too speedily after death for that, almost always taking place within four and twenty hours, and sometimes within twelve. At Rome there is the same arrangement of pits in a great, bleak, open, dreary space that I have already described as existing in Genoa. When I visited it at noonday, I saw a solitary coffin of plain deal. 
uncovered by any shroud or pall, and so slightly made that the hoof of any wandering mule would have crushed it in, carelessly tumbled down all on one side on the door of one of the pits, and there left by itself in the wind and sunshine. "'How does it come to be left here?' I asked the man who showed me the place. "'It was brought here half an hour ago, Signore,' he said. I remember to have met the procession on its return, straggling away at a good round pace. "'When will it be put in the pit?' I asked him. "'When the cart comes and it is open to-night,' he said. "'How much does it cost to be brought here in this way instead of coming in the cart?' I asked him. "'Den Scudi,' he said. "'About two pounds two and sixpence, English.' The other bodies for whom nothing is paid are taken to the church of the Santa Maria della Consolazione, he continued, and brought here altogether in the cart at night. I stood a moment looking at the coffin which had two initial letters scrawled upon the top and turned away with an expression in my face, I suppose, of not much liking its exposure in that manner. For he said, shrugging his shoulders with great vivacity and giving a pleasant smile, but he's dead, signor, he's dead. Why not? Among the innumerable churches there is one I must select for separate mention. It is the church of the Aracurli, supposed to be built on the site of the old temple of Jupiter Ferretrius, and approached on one side by a long steep flight of steps which seem incomplete without some group of bearded soothsayers on the top. It is remarkable for the possession of a miraculous bambino or wooden doll representing the infant saviour, and I first saw this miraculous bambino in legal phrase, in manner following, that is to say. We had strolled into the church one afternoon and were looking down its long vista of gloomy pillars, for all these ancient churches built upon the ruins of old temples are dark and sad, when the brave came running in with a grin upon his face that stretched it from ear to ear and implored us to follow him without a moment's delay as they were going to show the bambino to a select party we accordingly hurried off to a sort of chapel or sacristy hard by the chief altar but not in the church itself where the select party consisting of two or three catholic gentlemen and ladies not italians were already assembled and where one hollow-cheeked young monk was lighting up diverse candles, while another was putting on some clerical robes over his coarse brown habit. The candles were on a kind of altar, and above it were two delectable figures, such as you would see at any English fair, representing the Holy Virgin and St. Joseph, as I suppose, bending in devotion over a wooden box or coffer, which was shut. The hollow-cheeked monk number one, having finished lighting the candles, went down on his knees in a corner before this set piece, and the monk number two, having put on a pair of highly ornamented and gold-bespattered gloves, lifted down the coffer with great reverence and set it on the altar. Then, with many genuflections and muttering certain prayers, he opened it and let down the front, and took off sundry coverings of satin and lace from the inside. The ladies had been on their knees from the commencement, and the gentleman now dropped down devoutly as he exposed to view a little wooden doll, in face very like General Tom Thumb, the American dwarf, gorgeously dressed in satin and gold lace, and actually blazing with rich jewels. There was scarcely a spot upon its little breast or neck or stomach, but was sparkling with the costly offerings of the faithful. Presently he lifted it out of the box, and carrying it round among the kneelers, set its face against the forehead of every one, and tendered its clumsy foot to them to kiss, a ceremony which they all performed down to a dirty little ragamuffin of a boy who had walked in from the street. When this was done, he laid it in the box again, and the company rising drew near and commended the jewels in whispers. In good time he replaced the coverings, shut up the box, put it back in its place, locked up the whole concern, holy family and all, behind a pair of folding doors, took off his priestly vestments, and received the customary small charge, while his companion, by means of an extinguisher fastened to the end of a long stick, 
put out the lights one after another. The candles being all extinguished and the money all collected, they retired, and so did the spectators. I met this same bambino in the street a short time afterwards, going, in great state, to the house of some sick person. It is taken to all parts of Rome for this purpose constantly, but I understand that it is not always as successful as could be wished for making its appearance at the bedside of weak and nervous people in extremity accompanied by a numerous escort it not unfrequently frightens them to death it is most popular in cases of childbirth where it has done such wonders that if a lady be longer than usual in getting through her difficulties a messenger is dispatched with all speed to solicit the immediate attendance of the bambino it is a very valuable property and much confided in, especially by the religious body to whom it belongs. I am happy to know that it is not considered immaculate by some who are good Catholics and who are behind the scenes, from what was told me by the near relation of a priest, himself a Catholic, and a gentleman of learning and intelligence. The priest made my informant promise that he would on no account allow the bambino to be born into the bedroom of a sick lady in whom they were both interested. For, said he, if they, the monks, trouble her with it and intrude themselves into her room, it will certainly kill her. My informant accordingly looked out of the window when it came, and with many thanks declined to open the door. He endeavoured in another case of which he had no other knowledge than such as he gained as a passer-by at the moment, to prevent its being carried into a small unwholesome chamber where a poor girl was dying. But he strove against it unsuccessfully, and she expired while the crowd were pressing round her bed. Among the people who drop into St. Peter's at their leisure to kneel on the pavement and say a quiet prayer, there are certain schools and seminaries, priestly and otherwise, that come in twenty or thirty strong. These boys always kneel down in single file, one behind the other, with a tall grim master in a black gown bringing up the rear, like a pack of cards arranged to be tumbled down at a touch, with a disproportionately large knave of clubs at the end. When they have had a minute or so at the chief altar, they scramble up, and filing off to the chapel of the Madonna, or the sacrament, flop down again in the same order, so that if anybody did stumble against the master, a general and sudden overthrow of the whole line must inevitably ensue. The scene in all the churches is the strangest possible, the same monotonous, heartless, drowsy chaunting always going on, the same dark building, darker from the brightness of the street without, the same lamps dimly burning, the self-same people kneeling here and there, turned towards you from one altar or other, the same priest's back, with the same large cross embroidered on it, however different in size, in shape, in wealth, in architecture, this church is from that, it is the same thing still. There are the same dirty beggars stopping in their muttered prayers to beg, the same miserable cripples exhibiting their deformity at the doors, the same blind men rattling little pots like kitchen pepper casters, their depositories for arms, the same preposterous crowns of silver stuck upon the painted heads of single saints and virgins in crowded pictures, so that a little figure on a mountain has a headdress bigger than the temple in the foreground or adjacent miles of landscape. The same favourite shrine or figure, smothered with little silver hearts and crosses and the like, the staple trade and show of all the jewellers. The same odd mixture of respect and indecorum, faith and phlegm, kneeling on the stones and spitting on them loudly, getting up from prayers to beg a little or to pursue some other worldly matter, and then kneeling down again to resume the contrite supplication at the point where it was interrupted. In one church, a kneeling lady got up from her prayer for a moment to offer us her card as a teacher of music, and in another, a sedate gentleman with a very thick walking staff arose from his devotions to belabour his dog who was growling at another dog, 
and whose yelps and howls resounded through the church as his master quietly relapsed into his former train of meditation, keeping his eye upon the dog at the same time, nevertheless. Above all, there is always a receptacle for the contributions of the faithful in some form or other. Sometimes it is a money-box set up between the worshipper and the wooden life-size figure of the Redeemer. Sometimes it is a little chest for the maintenance of the Virgin. Sometimes an appeal on behalf of a popular bambino. Sometimes a bag at the end of a long stick thrust among the people here and there and vigilantly jingled by an active sacristan. But there it always is, and very often in many shapes in the same church, and doing pretty well in all. Nor is it wanting in the open air, the streets and roads, for often as you are walking along, thinking about anything rather than a tin canister, that object pounces out upon you from a little house by the wayside, and on its top is painted, For the Souls in Purgatory, an appeal which the bearer repeats a great many times as he rattles it before you, much as punch rattles the crack bell which his sanguine disposition makes an organ of. And this reminds me that some Roman altars of peculiar sanctity bear the inscription, Every Mass performed at this altar frees a soul from purgatory. I have never been able to find out the charge for one of these services, but they should needs be expensive. There are several crosses in Rome, too, the kissing of which confers indulgences for varying terms. That in the centre of the Colosseum is worth a hundred days, and people may be seen kissing it from morning to night. It is curious that some of these crosses seem to acquire an arbitrary popularity, this very one among them. In another part of the Colosseum there is a cross upon a marble slab, with the inscription... Who kisses this cross shall be entitled to 240 days indulgence. But I saw no one person kiss it, though day after day I sat in the arena and saw scores upon scores of peasants pass it on their way to kiss the other. To single out details from the great dream of Roman churches would be the wildest occupation in the world. But San Stefano Rotondo, a damp, mildewed vault of an old church in the outskirts of Rome, will always struggle uppermost in my mind by reason of the hideous paintings with which its walls are covered. These represent the martyrdoms of saints and early Christians, and such a panorama of horror and butchery no man could imagine in his sleep, though he were to eat a whole pig raw for supper. Grey-bearded men being boiled, fried, grilled, crimped, singed, eaten by wild beasts, worried by dogs, buried alive, torn asunder by horses, chopped up small with hatchets, women having their breasts torn with iron pinchers, their tongues cut out, their ears screwed off, their jaws broken, their bodies stretched upon the rack or skinned upon the stake, or crackled up and melted in the fire— these are among the mildest subjects, so insisted on and laboured at beside that every sufferer gives you the same occasion for wonder as poor old Duncan awoke in Lady Macbeth when she marvelled at his having so much blood in him. There is an upper chamber in the Mamertine prisons over what is said to have been, and very possibly may have been, the dungeon of St. Peter. This chamber is now fitted up as an oratory dedicated to that saint, and it lives as a distinct and separate place in my recollection too. It is very small and low-roofed, and the dread and gloom of the ponderous, obdurate old prison are on it, as if they had come up in a dark mist through the floor. Hanging on the walls, among the clustered votive offerings, are objects at once strangely in keeping and strangely at variance with the place, Rusty daggers, knives, pistols, clubs, divers instruments of violence and murder, brought here fresh from use, and hung up to propitiate offended heaven, as if the blood upon them would drain off in consecrated air, and have no voice to cry with. It is all so silent and so close and tomb-like, and the dungeons below are so black and stealthy and stagnant and naked, that this little dark spot becomes a dream within a dream, 
and in the vision of great churches which come rolling past me like a sea, it is a small wave by itself that melts into no other wave, and does not flow on with the rest. It is an awful thing to think of the enormous caverns that are entered from some Roman churches and undermine the city. Many churches have crypts and subterranean chapels of great size, which in the ancient time were baths and secret chambers of temples and what not, but I do not speak of them. Beneath the church of San Giovanni and San Paolo there are the jaws of a terrific range of caverns hewn out of the rock and said to have another outlet underneath the Colosseum, tremendous darknesses of vast extent, half buried in the earth and unexplorable, where the dull torches flashed by the attendants glimmer down long ranges of distant vaults branching to the right and left like streaks in a city of the dead and show the cold damp stealing down the walls drip drop drip drop to join the pools of water that lie here and there and never saw or never will see one ray of the sun some accounts make these the prisons of the wild beasts destined for the amphitheatre, some the prisons of the condemned gladiators, some both. But the legend most appalling to the fancy is that in the upper range, for there are two stories of these caves, the early Christians destined to be eaten at the Colosseum shows heard the wild beasts hungry for them roaring down below, until upon the night and solitude of their captivity there burst the sudden noon and life of the vast theatre crowded to the parapet, and of these their dreaded neighbours bounding in. Below the church of San Sebastiano, two miles beyond the gate of San Sebastiano on the Appian Way, is the entrance to the catacombs of Rome, quarries in the old time, but afterwards the hiding places of the Christians. These ghastly passages have been explored for twenty miles, and form a chain of labyrinths sixty miles in circumference. A gaunt Franciscan friar with a wild bright eye was our only guide down into this profound and dreadful place. The narrow ways and openings hither and thither, coupled with the dead and heavy air, soon blotted out in all of us any recollection of the track by which we had come, and I could not help thinking, good heaven, if in a sudden fit of madness he should dash the torches out, or if he should be seized with a fit, what would become of us? On we wandered among martyrs' graves, passing great subterranean vaulted roads, diverging in all directions, and choked up with heaps of stones, that thieves and murderers may not take refuge there, and form a population under Rome even worse than that which lives between it and the sun. Graves, graves, graves. Graves of men, of women, of their little children, who ran crying to the persecutors, We are Christians, we are Christians, that they might be murdered with their parents. Graves with the palm of martyrdom roughly cut into their stone boundaries, and little niches, made to hold a vessel of the martyr's blood. Graves of some who lived down here for years together, ministering to the rest and preaching truth and hope and comfort from the rude altars that bear witness to their fortitude at this hour. More roomy graves, but far more terrible, where hundreds, being surprised, were hemmed in and walled up, buried before death and killed by slow starvation. "'The triumph of the faith are not above ground in our splendid churches,' said the friar, looking round upon us, as we stopped to rest in one of the low passages, with bones and dust surrounding us on every side. "'They are here, among the martyrs' graves.' He was a gentle, earnest man, and said it from his heart. But when I thought how Christian men have dealt with one another— how perverting our most merciful religion they have hunted down and tortured, burnt and beheaded, strangled, slaughtered and oppressed each other, I pictured to myself an agony surpassing any that this dust had suffered with the breath of life yet lingering in it, and how these great and constant hearts would have been shaken, how they would have quailed and drooped 
if a foreknowledge of the deeds that professing Christians would commit in the great name for which they died could have rent them with its own unutterable anguish on the cruel wheel and bitter cross and in the fearful fire. Such are the spots and patches in my dream of churches that remain apart and keep their separate identity. I have a fainter recollection sometimes of the relics, of the fragments of the pillar of the temple that was rent in twain, of the portion of the table that was spread for the last supper, of the well at which the woman of Samaria gave water to our Saviour, of two columns from the house of Pontius Pilate, of the stone to which the sacred hands were bound when the scourging was performed, of the grin iron of St. Lawrence and the stone below it marked with the frying of his fattened blood. These set a shadowy mark on some cathedrals as an old story or a fable might and stop them for an instant as they flit before me. The rest is a vast wilderness of consecrated buildings of all shapes and fancies, blending one with another, of battered pillars of old pagan temples dug up from the ground, and forced like giant captives to support the roofs of Christian churches, of pictures bad and wonderful and impious and ridiculous, of kneeling people, curling incense, tinkling bells, and sometimes, but not often, of a swelling organ, of Madonna with their breasts stuck full of swords, arranged in a half-circle like a modern fan, of actual skeletons of dead saints, hideously attired in gaudy satins, silks and velvets trimmed with gold, their withered crust of skull adorned with precious jewels, or with chaplets of crushed flowers, sometimes of people gathered round the pulpit, and a monk within it stretching out the crucifix and preaching fiercely, the sun just streaming down through some high window on the sailcloth stretched above him and across the church, to keep his high-pitched voice from being lost among the echoes of the roof. Then my tired memory comes out upon a flight of steps, where knots of people are asleep or basking in the light, and strolls away among the rags and smells and palaces and hovels of an old Italian street. On one Saturday morning, the 8th of March, a man was beheaded here. Nine or ten months before, he had waylaid a Bavarian countess, travelling as a pilgrim to Rome, alone and on foot, of course, and performing, it is said, that act of piety for the fourth time. He saw her change a piece of gold at Viterbo, where he lived, followed her, bore her company on her journey for some forty miles or more, on the treacherous pretext of protecting her, attacked her in the fulfilment of his unrelenting purpose on the Campagna, within a very short distance of Rome, near to what is called, but what is not, the tomb of Nero, robbed her and beat her to death with her own pilgrim's staff. He was newly married and gave some of her apparel to his wife, saying that he had bought it at a fair. She, however, who had seen the pilgrim countess passing through their town, recognised some trifle as having belonged to her. Her husband then told her what he had done. She in confession told a priest, and the man was taken within four days after the commission of the murder. There are no fixed times for the administration of justice or its execution in this unaccountable country, and he had been in prison ever since. On the Friday, as he was dining with the other prisoners, they came and told him he was to be beheaded next morning, and took him away. It is very unusual to execute in Lent, but his crime being a very bad one, it was deemed advisable to make an example of him at that time, when great numbers of pilgrims were coming towards Rome, from all parts, for the Holy Week. I heard of this on the Friday evening, and saw the bills up at the churches, calling on the people to pray for the criminal's soul. So I determined to go and see him executed. The beheading was appointed for fourteen and a half o'clock Roman time, or a quarter before nine in the forenoon. I had two friends with me, and as we did not know but that the crowd might be very great, we were on the spot by half-past seven. The place of execution was near the church of San Giovanni de Calato, 
a doubtful compliment to St. John the Baptist, in one of the impassable back streets without any footway of which a great part of Rome is composed, a street of rotten houses which do not seem to belong to anybody and do not seem to have ever been inhabited and certainly were never built on any plan or for any particular purpose and have no window sashes and are a little like deserted breweries and might be warehouses but for having nothing in them. Opposite to one of these, a white house, the scaffold was built. An untidy, unpainted, uncouth, crazy-looking thing, of course, some seven feet high, perhaps, with a tall gallow-shaped frame rising above it, in which was the knife, charged with a ponderous mass of iron, all ready to descend, and glittering brightly in the morning sun whenever it looked out now and then from behind a cloud. There were not many people lingering about, and these were kept at a considerable distance from the scaffold by parties of the Pope's dragoons. Two or three hundred foot soldiers were under arms, standing at ease in clusters here and there, and the officers were walking up and down in twos and threes, chatting together and smoking cigars. At the end of the street was an open space, where there would be a dust heap and piles of broken crockery and mounds of vegetable refuse, but for such things being thrown anywhere and everywhere in Rome, and favouring no particular sort of locality. We got into a kind of wash-house belonging to a dwelling-house on this spot, and standing there in an old cart and on a heap of cart-wheels piled against the wall, looked through a large grated window at the scaffold, and straight down the street beyond it, until, in consequence of its turning off abruptly to the left, our perspective was brought to a sudden termination, and had a corpulent officer in a cocked hat for its crowning feature. Nine o'clock struck, and ten o'clock struck, and nothing happened. All the bells of all the churches rang as usual. A little parliament of dogs assembled in the open space, and chased each other in and out among the soldiers. Fierce-looking Romans of the lowest class, in blue cloaks, russet cloaks, and rags uncloaked, came and went and talked together. Women and children fluttered on the skirts of the scanty crowd. One large muddy spot was left quite bare, like a bald place on a man's head. A cigar merchant, with an earthen pot of charcoal ashes in one hand, went up and down crying his wares. A pastry merchant divided his attention between the scaffold and his customers. Boys tried to climb up walls and tumbled down again. Priests and monks elbowed a passage for themselves among the people and stood on tiptoe for a sight of the knife, then went away. Artists in inconceivable hats of the Middle Ages and beards, thank heaven, of no age at all, flashed picturesque scowls about them from their stations in the throng. One gentleman, connected with the fine arts, I presume, went up and down in a pair of hessian boots, with a red beard hanging down on his breast, and his long and bright red hair plaited into two tails, one on either side of his head, which fell over his shoulders in front of him, very nearly to his waist, and were carefully entwined and braided. Eleven o'clock struck, and still nothing happened. A rumour got about among the crowd that the criminal would not confess, in which case the priests would keep him until the Ave Maria sunset, for it is their merciful custom never finally to turn the crucifix away from a man at that pass as one refusing to be shriven, and consequently a sinner abandoned of the Saviour until then. People began to drop off. The officers shrugged their shoulders and looked doubtful. The dragoons who came riding up below our window every now and then to order an unlucky hackney coach or cart away as soon as it had comfortably established itself and was covered with exulting people, but never before, became imperious and quick-tempered. The bald place hadn't a straggling hair upon it, and the corpulent officer, crowning the perspective, took a world of snuff. Suddenly there was a noise of trumpets. Attention was among the foot soldiers instantly. They were marched up to the scaffold and formed round it. 
The dragoons galloped to their nearer stations too. The guillotine became the centre of a wood of bristling bayonets and shining sabres. The people closed round nearer on the flank of the soldiery. A long straggling stream of men and boys who had accompanied the procession from the prison came pouring into the open space. The bald spot was scarcely distinguishable from the rest. The cigar and pastry merchants resigned all thoughts of business for the moment, and abandoning themselves wholly to pleasure, got good situations in the crowd. The perspective ended now in a troop of dragoons, and the corpulent officer, sword in hand, looked hard at a church close to him which he could see, but we the crowd could not. After a short delay some monks were seen approaching to the scaffold from this church, and above their heads, coming on slowly and gloomily, the effigy of Christ upon the cross canopied with black. This was carried round the foot of the scaffold to the front, and turned towards the criminal, that he might see it to the last. It was hardly in its place when he appeared on the platform, barefooted, his hands bound, and with the collar and neck of his shirt cut away almost to the shoulder. A young man, six-and-twenty, vigorously made and well-shaped, face pale, small dark moustache, and dark brown hair. He had refused to confess, it seemed, without first having his wife brought to see him, and they had sent an escort for her, which had occasioned the delay. He immediately kneeled down below the knife, his neck fitting into a hole made for the purpose in a cross-plank was shut down by another plank above, exactly like the pillory. Immediately below him was a leathern bag, and into it his head rolled instantly. The executioner was holding it by the hair and walking with it round the scaffold, showing it to the people, before one quite knew that the knife had fallen heavily and with a rattling sound. When it had travelled round the four sides of the scaffold, it was set upon a pole in front, a little patch of black and white for the long street to stare at and the flies to settle on. The eyes were turned upward, as if he had avoided the sight of the leathern bag and looked to the crucifix. Every tinge and hue of life had left it in that instant. It was dull, cold, livid, wax, the body also. There was a great deal of blood. When we left the window and went close up to the scaffold, it was very dirty. One of the two men who were throwing water over it, turning to help the other lift the body into a shell, picked his way as through mire. A strange appearance was the apparent annihilation of the neck. The head was taken off so close that it seemed as if the knife had narrowly escaped crushing the jaw or shaving off the ear and the body looked as if there were nothing left above the shoulder. Nobody cared, or was at all affected. There was no manifestation of disgust, or pity, or indignation, or sorrow. My empty pockets were tried several times in the crowd immediately below the scaffold, as the corpse was being put into its coffin. It was an ugly, filthy, careless, sickening spectacle meaning nothing but butchery beyond the momentary interest to the one wretched actor. Yes, such a sight has one meaning and one warning. Let me not forget it. The speculators in the lottery station themselves at favourable points for counting the goots of blood that spurt out here or there, and buy that number. It is pretty sure to have a run upon it. The body was carted away in due time, the knife cleansed, the scaffold taken down, and all the hideous apparatus removed. The executioner, an outlaw ex officio, what a satire on the punishment, who dare not for his life cross the bridge of St. Angelo but to do his work, retreated to his lair, and the show... Chapter 10, Part 3 of Pictures from Italy by Charles Dickens. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Antoniogus. 
At the head of the collections in the palaces of Rome, the Vatican, of course, with its treasures of art, its enormous galleries and staircases, and suites upon suites of immense chambers, ranks highest and stands foremost. Many most noble statues and wonderful pictures are there, nor is it heresy to say that there is a considerable amount of rubbish there too. When any old piece of sculpture dug out of the ground finds a place in a gallery because it is old, and without any reference to its intrinsic merits, and finds admirers by the hundred because it is there and for no other reason on earth, there will be no lack of objects very indifferent in the plain eyesight of any one who employs so vulgar a property, when he may wear the spectacles of Kant for less than nothing, and establish himself as a man of taste for the mere trouble of putting them on. I unreservedly confess for myself that I cannot leave my natural perception of what is natural and true at a palace door in Italy or elsewhere, as I should leave my shoes if I were travelling in the East. I cannot forget that there are certain expressions of face natural to certain passions, and as unchangeable in their nature as the gait of a lion or the flight of an eagle. I cannot dismiss from my certain knowledge such commonplace facts as the ordinary proportion of men's arms and legs and heads, and when I meet with performances that do violence to these experiences and recollections, no matter where they may be, I cannot honestly admire them and think it best to say so, in spite of high critical advice, that we should sometimes feign an admiration, though we have it not. Therefore I freely acknowledge that when I see a jolly young waterman representing a cherubim, or a Barclay and Perkins drayman depicted as an evangelist, I see nothing to commend or admire in the performance, however great its reputed painter. Neither am I partial to libelous angels who play on fiddles and bassoons for the edification of sprawling monks apparently in liquor, nor to those Monsieur Tonsons of galleries, St. Francis and St. Sebastian, both of whom I submit should have very uncommon and rare merits as works of art to justify their compound multiplication by Italian painters. It seems to me, too, that the indiscriminate and determined raptures in which some critics indulge is incompatible with the true appreciation of the really great and transcendent works. I cannot imagine, for example, how the resolute champion of undeserving pictures can soar to the amazing beauty of Titian's great picture of the Assumption of the Virgin at Venice or how the man who is truly affected by the sublimity of that exquisite production, or who is truly sensible of the beauty of Tintoretto's great picture of the assembly of the blessed in the same place, can discern in Michelangelo's last judgment in the Sistine Chapel any general idea, or one pervading thought, in harmony with the stupendous subject. He who will contemplate Raphael's masterpiece, The Transfiguration, and will go away into another chamber of that same Vatican, and contemplate another design of Raphael, representing in incredible caricature the miraculous stopping of a great fire by Leo the Fourth, and who will say that he admires them both as works of extraordinary genius, must, as I think, be wanting in his powers of perception in one of the two instances, and probably in the high and lofty one. It is easy to suggest a doubt, but I have a great doubt whether sometimes the rules of art are not too strictly observed, and whether it is quite well or agreeable that we should know beforehand where this figure will be turning round, and where that figure will be lying down, and where there will be drapery and folds, and so forth. When I observe heads inferior to the subject in pictures of merit in Italian galleries, I do not attach that reproach to the painter, for I have a suspicion that these great men, who were of necessity very much in the hands of monks and priests, painted monks and priests a great deal too often. I frequently see in pictures of real power heads quite below the story in the painter, and I invariably observe that those heads are of the convent stamp, and have their counterparts among the convent inmates of this hour. 
so I have settled with myself that in such cases the lameness was not with the painter but with the vanity and ignorance of certain of his employers who would be apostles on canvas at all events. The exquisite grace and beauty of Canova's statues, the wonderful gravity and repose of many of the ancient works in sculpture, both in the Capitol and the Vatican, and the strength and fire of many others, are in their different ways beyond all reach of words. They are especially impressive and delightful after the works of Bernini and his disciples, in which the churches of Rome, from St. Peter's downward, abound, and which are, I verily believe, the most detestable class of productions in the wide world. I would infinitely rather, as mere works of art, look upon the three deities of the past, the present and the future in the Chinese collection than upon the best of these breezy maniacs, whose every fold of drapery is blown inside out, whose smallest vein or artery is as big as an ordinary forefinger, whose hair is like a nest of lively snakes, and whose attitudes put all other extravagance to shame. Insomuch that I do honestly believe, there can be no place in the world where such intolerable abortions, begotten of the sculptor's chisel, are to be found in such profusion as in Rome. There is a fine collection of Egyptian antiquities in the Vatican, and the ceilings of the rooms in which they are arranged are painted to represent a starlight sky in the desert. It may seem an odd idea, but it is very effective. The grim half-human monsters from the temples look more grim and monstrous underneath the deep dark blue. It sheds a strange uncertain gloomy air on everything, a mystery adapted to the objects, and you leave them as you find them, shrouded in a solemn night. In the private palaces, pictures are seen to the best advantage. There are seldom so many in one place that the attention need become distracted or the eye confused. You see them very leisurely, and are rarely interrupted by a crowd of people. There are portraits innumerable by Titian and Rembrandt and Van Dyck, heads by Guido and Domenichino and Carlo Dolci, various subjects by Correggio and Murillo and Raphael and Salvatore Rosa and Spagnoletto, many of which it will be difficult indeed to praise too highly or to praise enough, such is their tenderness and grace, their noble elevation, purity and beauty. The portrait of Beatrice di Cenci in the Palazzo Berberini is a picture almost impossible to be forgotten. Through the transcendent sweetness and beauty of the face, there is something shining out that haunts me. I see it now as I see this paper or my pen. The head is loosely draped in white, the light hair falling down below the linen folds. She has turned suddenly towards you, and there is an expression in the eyes, although they are very tender and gentle, as if the wildness of a momentary terror or distraction had been struggled with and overcome that instant, and nothing but a celestial hope and a beautiful sorrow and a desolate earthly helplessness remained. Some stories say that Guido painted it the night before her execution, some other stories that he painted it from memory after having seen her on her way to the scaffold. I am willing to believe that as you see her on his canvas, so she turned towards him in the crowd from the first sight of the axe, and stamped upon his mind a look which he has stamped on mine, as though I had stood beside him in the concourse. The guilty palace of the Cenci, blighting a whole quarter of the town, as it stands withering away by grains, had that face to my fancy in its dismal porch, and in its black blind windows, and flitting up and down its dreary stairs, and growing out of the darkness of the ghostly galleries. The history is written in the painting, written in the dying girl's face by nature's own hand. And oh how in that one touch she puts to flight, instead of making kin, the puny world that claimed to be related to her in right of poor conventional forgeries. I saw in the Palazzo Spada the statue of Pompey, the statue at whose base Caesar fell, a stern, tremendous figure. I imagined one of greater finish, 
of the last refinement, full of delicate touches, losing its distinctness in the giddy eyes of one whose blood was ebbing before it and settling into some such rigid majesty as this, as death came creeping over the upturned face. The excursions in the neighbourhood of Rome are charming, and would be full of interest were it only for the changing views they afford of the wild Campagna. But every inch of ground in every direction is rich in associations and in natural beauties. There is Albano with its lovely lake and wooded shore, and with its wine that certainly has not improved since the days of Horace, and in these time hardly justifies his panegyric. There is squalid Tivoli, with the river Anio diverted from its course and plunging down headlong some eighty feet in search of it, with its picturesque temple of the Sibyl perched high on a crag, its minor waterfalls glancing and sparkling in the sun, and one good cavern yawning darkly where the river takes a fearful plunge and shoots on low down under the beetling rocks. There too is the Villa d'Este, deserted and decaying among groves of melancholy pine and cypress trees where it seems to lie in state then there is the frascati and on the steep above it the ruins of tusculum where cicero lived and wrote and adorned his favourite house some fragments of it may yet be seen there and where cato was born we saw its ruined amphitheatre on a grey dull day when a shrill march wind was blowing, and when the scattered stones of the old city lay strewn about the lonely eminence as desolate and dead as the ashes of a long extinguished fire. One day we walked out, a little party of three, to Albano, fourteen miles distant, possessed by a great desire to go there by the ancient Appian Way, long since ruined and overgrown. We started at half-past seven in the morning, and within an hour or so were out upon the open campagna. For twelve miles we went climbing on, over an unbroken succession of mounds and heaps and hills of ruin. Tombs and temples overthrown and prostrate, small fragments of columns, friezes, pediments, great blocks of granite and marble, mouldering arches, grass-grown and decayed, ruin enough to build a spacious city from, lay strewn about us. Sometimes loose walls, built up from these fragments by the shepherds, came across our path. Sometimes a ditch between two mounds of broken stones obstructed our progress. Sometimes the fragments themselves, rolling from beneath our feet, made it a toilsome matter to advance, but it was always ruin. Now we tracked a piece of the old road above the ground, now traced it underneath a grassy covering, as if that were its grave, but all the way was ruin. In the distance ruined aqueducts went stalking on their giant course along the plain, and every breath of wind that swept towards us stirred early flowers and grasses springing up spontaneously on miles of ruin. The unseen larks above us, who alone disturbed the awful silence, had their nests in ruin, and the fierce herdsmen clad in sheepskins, who now and then scowled out upon us from their sleeping nooks, were housed in ruin. The aspect of the desolate campagna in one direction, where it was most level, reminded me of an American prairie. But what is the solitude of a region where men have never dwelt to that of a desert, where a mighty race have left their footprints in the earth from which they have vanished, where the resting places of their dead have fallen like their dead, and the broken hourglass of time is but a heap of idle dust. Returning by the road at sunset, and looking from the distance on the course we had taken in the morning, I almost feel, as I had felt when I first saw it at that hour, as if the sun would never rise again but looked its last that night upon a ruined world. To come again on Rome by moonlight after such an expedition is a fitting close to such a day. The narrow streets, devoid of footways and choked in every obscure corner by heaps of dunghill rubbish, 
contrasts so strongly in their cramped dimensions and their filth and darkness with the broad square before some haughty church in the centre of which a hieroglyphic covered obelisk brought from egypt in the days of the emperors looks strangely on the foreign scene about it or perhaps an ancient pillar with its honoured statue overthrown supports a christian saint marcus aurelius giving place to paul and trajan to st peter then there are the ponderous buildings reared from the spoliation of the Colosseum, shutting out the moon like mountains while here and there are broken arches and rent walls through which it gushes freely as the life comes pouring from a wound the little town of miserable houses walled and shut in by barred gates is the quarter where the jews are locked up nightly when the clock strikes eight a miserable place densely populated and reeking with bad odours but where the people are industrious and money-getting in the daytime as you make your way along the narrow streets you see them all at work upon the pavement oftener than in their dark and frowsy shops furbishing old clothes and driving bargains crossing from these patches of thick darkness out into the moon once more the fountain of trevi welling from a hundred jets and rolling over mimic rocks is silvery to the eye and ear in the narrow little throat of street beyond a booth dressed out with flaring lamps and boughs of trees attracts a group of sulky romans round its smoky coppers of hot broth and cauliflower stew its trays of fried fish and its flasks of wine as you rattle round the sharply twisting corner a lumbering sound is heard the coachman stops abruptly and uncovers as a van comes slowly by preceded by a man who bears a large cross by a torch-bearer and a priest the latter chaunting as he goes it is the dead cart with the bodies of the poor on their way to burial in the sacred field outside the walls where they will be thrown into the pit that will be covered with a stone to-night and sealed up for a year but whether in this ride you pass by obelisks or columns, ancient temples, theatres, houses, porticos or forums, it is strange to see how every fragment, whenever it is possible, has been blended into some modern structure and made to serve some modern purpose, a wall, a dwelling place, a granary, a stable, some use for which it never was designed and associated with which it cannot otherwise than lamely assort. It is stranger still to see how many ruins of the old mythology, how many fragments of obsolete legend and observance, have been incorporated into the worship of Christian altars here, and how in numberless respects the false faith and the true are fused into a monstrous union. From one part of the city, looking out beyond the walls, a squat and stunted pyramid, the burial place of Caius Cestius, makes an opaque triangle in the moonlight but to an english traveller it serves to mark the grave of shelley too whose ashes lie beneath a little garden near it nearer still almost within its shadow lie the bones of keats whose name is written water that shines brightly in the landscape of a calm italian night the holy week in rome is supposed to offer great attractions to all visitors but saving for the sights of Easter Sunday, I would counsel those who go to Rome for its own interest to avoid it at that time. The ceremonies in general are of the most tedious and wearisome kind, the heat and crowd at every one of them painfully oppressive, the noise, hubbub and confusion quite distracting. We abandoned the pursuit of these shows very early in the proceedings and betook ourselves to the ruins again, but we plunged into the crowd for a share of the best of the sights, and what we saw I will describe to you. At the Sistine Chapel on the Wednesday we saw very little, for by the time we reached it, though we were early, the besieging crowd had filled it to the door, and overflowed into the adjoining hall, where they were struggling and squeezing and mutually expostulating, and making great rushes every time a lady was brought out faint 
as if at least fifty people could be accommodated in her vacant standing room. Hanging in the doorway of the chapel was a heavy curtain, and this curtain, some twenty people nearest to it, in their anxiety to hear the chaunting of the miserere, were continually plucking at, in opposition to each other, that it might not fall down and stifle the sound of the voices. The consequence was that it occasioned the most extraordinary confusion, and seemed to wind itself about the unwary like a serpent. Now a lady was wrapped up in it and couldn't be unwound, now the voice of a stifling gentleman was heard inside it, beseeching to be let out. Now two muffled arms, no man could say of which sex, struggled in it as in a sack. Now it was carried by a rush bodily overhead into the chapel, like an awning. Now it came out the other way, and blinded one of the Pope's Swiss guard, who had arrived that moment to set things to rights. Being seated at a little distance among two or three of the Pope's gentlemen, who were very weary and counting the minutes, as perhaps His Holiness was too, we had better opportunities of observing this eccentric entertainment than of hearing the miserere. Sometimes there was a swell of mournful voices that sounded very pathetic and sad, and died away into a low strain again, but that was all we heard. At another time there was the exhibition of relics in St. Peter's, which took place at between six and seven o'clock in the evening, and was striking from the cathedral, being dark and gloomy, and having a great many people in it. The place into which the relics were brought, one by one, by a party of three priests, was a high balcony near the chief altar. This was the only lighted part of the church. There were always a hundred and twelve lamps burning near the altar, and there were two tall tapers besides, near the black statue of St. Peter, but these were nothing in such an immense edifice. The gloom and the general upturning of faces to the balcony, and the prostration of true believers on the pavement, as shining objects like pictures or looking-glasses were brought out and shown, had something effective in it, despite the very preposterous manner in which they were held up for the general edification, and the great elevation at which they were displayed, which one would think rather calculated to diminish the comfort derivable from a full conviction of their being genuine. On the Thursday we went to see the Pope convey the sacrament from the Sistine Chapel to deposit in the Capella Paolina, another chapel in the Vatican a ceremony emblematical of the entombment of the Saviour before his resurrection. We waited in a great gallery with a great crowd of people, three-fourths of them English, for an hour or so, while they were chaunting the Miserere in the Sistine Chapel again. Both chapels opened out of the gallery, and the general attention was concentrated on the occasional opening and shutting of the door of the one for which the Pope was ultimately bound. None of these openings disclosed anything more tremendous than a man on a ladder lighting a great quantity of candles, but at each and every opening there was a terrific rush made at this ladder and this man, something like, I should think, a charge of the heavy British cavalry at Waterloo. The man was never brought down, however, nor the ladder, for it performed the strangest antics in the world among the crowd, where it was carried by the man, when the candles were all lighted, and finally it was stuck up against the gallery wall, in a very disorderly manner, just before the opening of the other chapel, and the commencement of a new chaunt, announced the approach of His Holiness. At this crisis the soldiers of the guard, who had been poking the crowd into all sorts of shapes, formed down the gallery, and the procession came up between the two lines they made. There were a few choristers, and then a great many priests walking two and two, and carrying, the good-looking priests at least, their lighted tapers, so as to throw the light with a good effect upon their faces, for the room was darkened. Those who were not handsome, or who had not long beards, carried their tapers anyhow, and abandoned themselves to spiritual contemplation. Meanwhile the chaunting was very monotonous and dreary. The procession passed on slowly into the chapel, and the drone of voices went on and came on with it, until the Pope himself appeared, 
walking under a white satin canopy and bearing the covered sacrament in both hands cardinals and canons clustered round him making a brilliant show the soldiers of the guard knelt down as he passed all the bystanders bowed and so he passed on into the chapel the white satin canopy being removed from over him at the door and a white satin parasol hoisted over his poor old head in place of it a few more couples brought up the rear and passed into the chapel also then the chapel door was shut and it was all over and everybody hurried off headlong as for life or death to see something else and say it wasn't worth the trouble i think the most popular and most crowded sight excepting those of easter sunday and monday which were open to all classes of people was the pope washing the feet of thirteen men representing the twelve apostles and judas iscariot the place in which this pious office is performed is one of the chapels of st peter's which is gaily decorated for the occasion the thirteen sitting all of a row on a very high bench and looking particularly uncomfortable with the eyes of heaven knows how many english french americans swiss germans russians swedes norwegians and other foreigners nailed to their faces all the time they are robed in white and on their heads they wear a stiff white cap like a large english porter pot without a handle each carries in his hand a nosegay of the size of a fine cauliflower and two of them on this occasion wore spectacles which remembering the characters they sustained i thought a droll appendage to the costume there was a great eye to character st john was represented by a good-looking young man st peter by a grave-looking old gentleman with a flowing brown beard and judas iscariot by such an enormous hypocrite i could not make out though whether the expression of his face was real or assumed that if he had acted the part to the death and had gone away and hanged himself he would have left nothing to be desired as the two large boxes appropriated to ladies at this sight were full to the throat and getting near was hopeless we posted off along with a great crowd to be in time at the table where the Pope in person waits on these thirteen, and after a prodigious struggle at the Vatican staircase and several personal conflicts with the Swiss guard, the whole crowd swept into the room. It was a long gallery hung with drapery of white and red, with another great box for ladies, who were obliged to dress in black at these ceremonies and to wear black veils, a royal box for the King of Naples and his party, and the table itself, which set out like a ball supper, and ornamented with golden figures of the real apostles, was arranged on an elevated platform on one side of the gallery. The counterfeit apostles' knives and forks were laid out on that side of the table which was nearest to the wall, so that they may be stared at again without let or hindrance. The body of the room was full of male strangers, the crowd immense, the heat very great, and the pressure sometimes frightful. It was at its height when the stream came pouring in from the feet washing, and then there were such shrieks and outcries that a party of Piedmontese dragoons went to the rescue of the Swiss guard and helped them to calm the tumult. The ladies were particularly ferocious in their struggles for places, one lady of my acquaintance was seized round the waist in the ladies' box by a strong matron and hoisted out of her place, and there was another lady in a back row in the same box who improved her position by sticking a large pin into the ladies before her. The gentlemen about me were remarkably anxious to see what was on the table, and one Englishman seemed to have embarked the whole energy of his nature in the determination to discover whether there was any mustard. "'By Jupiter, there's vinegar!' I heard him say to his friend, after he had stood on tiptoe an immense time, and had been crushed and beaten on all sides. "'And there's oil! I saw them distinctly in cruets. Can any gentleman in front there see mustard on the table? Sir, will you oblige me? Do you see a mustard-pot?' 
the apostles and judas appearing on the platform after much expectation were marshalled in line in front of the table with peter at the top and a good long stare was taken at them by the company while twelve of them took a long smell at their nosegays and judas moving his lips very obtrusively engaged in inward prayer then the pope clad in a scarlet robe and wearing on his head a skull-cap of white satin appeared in the midst of a crowd of cardinals and other dignitaries and took in his hand a little golden ewer from which he poured a little water over one of peter's hands while one attendant held a golden basin a second a fine cloth a third peter's nosegay which was taken from him during the operation then his holiness performed with considerable expedition on every man in the line judas i observed to be particularly overcome by his condescension and then the whole thirteen sat down to dinner grace said by the pope peter in the chair there was white wine and red wine and the dinner looked very good the courses appeared in portions one for each apostle and these being presented to the pope by cardinals upon their knees were by him handed to the thirteen the manner in which judas grew more white-livered over his victuals and languished with his head on one side as if he had no appetite defies all description peter was a good sound old man and went in as the saying is to win eating everything that was given him he got the best being first in the row and saying nothing to anybody the dishes appeared to be chiefly composed of fish and vegetables the pope held the thirteen to wine also and during the whole dinner somebody read something aloud out of a large book the bible i presume which nobody could hear and to which nobody paid the least attention the cardinals and other attendants smiled to each other from time to time as if the thing were a great farce and if they thought so there is little doubt they were perfectly right his holiness did what he had to do as a sensible man gets through a troublesome ceremony and seemed very glad when it was all over the pilgrim suppers where lords and ladies waited on the pilgrims in token of humility and dried their feet when they had been well washed by deputy were very attractive but of all the many spectacles of dangerous reliance on outward observances in themselves mere empty forms none struck me half so much as the scala santa or holy staircase which i saw several times but to the greatest advantage or disadvantage on good friday this holy staircase is composed of eight and twenty steps said to have belonged to pontius pilate's house and to be the identical stair on which our saviour trod in coming down from the judgment seat pilgrims ascend it only on their knees it is steep and at the summit is a chapel reported to be full of relics into which they peep through some iron bars and then come down again by one of two side staircases which are not sacred and may be walked on on good friday there were on a moderate computation a hundred people slowly shuffling up these stairs on their knees at one time while others who were going up or had come down and a few who had done both and were going up again for the second time stood loitering in the porch below where an old gentleman in a sort of watch-box rattled a tin canister with a slit in the top incessantly to remind them that he took the money the majority were country people male and female there were four or five jesuit priests however and some half dozen well-dressed women a whole school of boys twenty at least were about halfway up evidently enjoying it very much they were all wedged together pretty closely but the rest of the company gave the boys as wide a berth as possible in consequence of their betraying some recklessness in the management of their boots i never in my life saw anything at once so ridiculous and so unpleasant as this sight ridiculous in the absurd incidents inseparable from it and unpleasant in its senseless and unmeaning degradation there are two steps to begin with and then a rather broad landing 
the more rigid climbers went along this landing on their knees as well as up the stairs and the figures they cut in their shuffling progress over the level surface no description can paint then to see them watch their opportunity from the porch and cut in where there was a place next the wall and to see one man with an umbrella brought on purpose for it was a fine day hoisting himself unlawfully from stair to stair and to observe a demure lady of fifty-five or so looking back every now and then to assure herself that her legs were properly disposed there were such odd differences in the speed of different people too some got on as if they were doing a match against time others stopped to say a prayer on every step this man touched every step with his forehead and kissed it that man scratched his head all the way the boys got on brilliantly and were up and down again before the old lady had accomplished her half-dozen stairs. But most of the penitents came down very sprightly and fresh, as having done a real good substantial deed which it would take a great deal of sin to counterbalance, and the old gentleman in the watch-box was down upon them with his canister while they were in this humour, I promise you. As if such a progress were not in its nature inevitably droll enough, there lay on the top of the stairs a wooden figure on a crucifix resting on a sort of great iron saucer so rickety and unsteady that whenever an enthusiastic person kissed the figure with more than usual devotion or threw a coin into the saucer with more than common readiness for it served in this respect as a second or supplementary canister it gave a great leap and rattle and nearly shook the attendant lamp out, horribly frightening the people further down, and throwing the guilty party into unspeakable embarrassment. On Easter Sunday, as well as on the preceding Thursday, the Pope bestows his benediction on the people from the balcony in front of St. Peter's. This Easter Sunday was a day so bright and blue, so cloudless, balmy, wonderfully bright, that all the previous bad weather vanished from the recollection in a moment. I had seen the Thursday's benediction dropping damply on some hundreds of umbrellas, but there was not a sparkle then in all the hundred fountains of Rome, such fountains as they are, and on this Sunday morning they were running diamonds. The miles of miserable streets through which we drove, compelled to a certain course by the Pope's dragoons, the Roman police on such occasions, were so full of colour that nothing in them was capable of wearing a faded aspect. The common people came out in their gayest dresses, the richer people in their smartest vehicles, cardinals rattled to the church of the poor fishermen in, in their state carriages, Shabby magnificence flaunted its threadbare liveries and tarnished cock hats in the sun, and every coach in Rome was put in requisition for the great piazza of St. Peter's. One hundred and fifty thousand people were there at least, yet there was ample room. How many carriages were there I don't know, yet there was room for them too and to spare. The great steps of the church were densely crowded. There were many of the contadini from Albano, who delight in red, in that part of the square, and the mingling of bright colours in the crowd was beautiful. Below the steps the troops were ranged. In the magnificent proportions of the place they looked like a bed of flowers. Sulky Romans, lively peasants from the neighbouring country, groups of pilgrims from distant parts of Italy, sight-seeing foreigners of all nations made a murmur in the clear air like so many insects and high above them all plashing and bubbling and making rainbow colours in the light the two delicious fountains welled and tumbled bountifully a kind of bright carpet was hung over the front of the balcony and the sides of the great window were bedecked with crimson drapery an awning was stretched to over the top to screen the old man from the hot rays of the sun. As noon approached, all eyes were turned up to this window. In due time, the chair was seen approaching to the front, with the gigantic fans of peacock's feathers close behind. 
the doll within it for the balcony is very high then rose up and stretched out its tiny arms while all the male spectators in the square uncovered and some but not by any means the greater part kneeled down the guns upon the ramparts of the castle of san angelo proclaim next moment that the benediction was given drums beat trumpets sounded arms clashed and the great mass below suddenly breaking into smaller heaps and scattering here and there in rills was stirred like party-coloured sand what a bright noon it was as we rode away the tiber was no longer yellow but blue there was a blush on the old bridges that made them fresh and hale again the pantheon with its majestic front all seamed and furrowed like an old face had some alight upon its battered walls every squalid and desolate hut in the eternal city bear witness every grim old palace to the filth and misery of the plebeian neighbour that elbows it as certain as time has laid its grip on its patrician head was fresh and new with some ray of the sun the very prison in the crowded street a whirl of carriages and people had some stray sense of the day dropping through its chinks and crevices and dismal prisoners who could not wind their faces round the barricading of the blocked-up windows stretched out their hands and clinging to the rusty bars turned them towards the overflowing street as if it were a cheerful fire and could be shared in that way but when the night came on without a cloud to dim the full moon what a sight it was to see the great square full once more and the whole church from the cross to the ground lighted with innumerable lanterns tracing out the architecture and winking and shining all round the colonnade of the piazza and what a sense of exultation joy delight it was when the great bell struck half-past seven on the instant to behold one bright red mass of fire soar gallantly from the top of the cupola to the extremest summit of the cross and the moment it leapt into its place became the signal of a bursting out of countless lights as great and red and blazing as itself from every part of the gigantic church so that every cornice capital and smallest ornament of stone expressed itself in fire and the black solid groundwork of the enormous dome seemed to grow transparent as an eggshell a train of gunpowder an electric chain nothing could be fired more suddenly and swiftly than this second illumination and when we had got away and gone upon a distant height and looked towards it two hours afterwards there it still stood shining and glittering in the calm night like a jewel not a line of its proportions wanting not an angle blunted not an atom of its radiance lost the next night easter monday there was a great display of fireworks from the castle of san angelo we hired a room in an opposite house and made our way to our places in good time through a dense mob of people choking up the square in front and all the avenues leading to it and so loading the bridge by which the castle is approached that it seemed ready to sink into the rapid tiber below there are statues on this bridge execrable works and among them great vessels full of burning tow were placed glaring strangely on the faces of the crowd and not less strangely on the stone counterfeits above them the show began with a tremendous discharge of cannon and then for twenty minutes or half an hour the whole castle was one incessant sheet of fire and labyrinth of blazing wheels of every colour size and speed while rockets streamed into the sky not by ones or twos or scores but hundreds at a time the concluding burst the girandola was like the blowing up into the air of the whole massive castle without smoke or dust in half an hour afterwards the immense concourse had dispersed the moon was looking calmly down upon her wrinkled image in the river and half a dozen men and boys with bits of lighted candle in their hands moving here and there in search of anything worth having that might have been dropped in the press had the whole scene to themselves 
by way of contrast we rode out into old ruined rome after all this firing and booming to take our leave of the Colosseum. i had seen it by moonlight before i could never get through a day without going back to it but its tremendous solitude that night is past all telling the ghostly pillars in the forum the triumphal arches of old emperors those enormous masses of ruins which were once their palaces the grass-grown mounds that mark the graves of ruined temples the stones of the via sacra smooth of the tread of feet in ancient rome even these were dimmed in their transcendent melancholy by the dark ghost of its bloody holidays erect and grim haunting the old scene despoiled by pillaging popes and fighting princes but not laid wringing wild hands of weed and grass and bramble and lamenting to the night in every gap and broken arch the shadow of its awful self immovable as we lay down on the grass of the campagna next day on our way to florence hearing the larks sing we saw that a little wooden cross had been erected on the spot where the poor pilgrim countess was murdered so we piled some loose stones about it as the beginning of a mound to her memory and wondered if we should ever rest there again and look Chapter Eleven, Part One of Pictures from Italy by Charles Dickens. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Anthony Ogus. A Rapid Diorama. We are bound for Naples, and we cross the threshold of the Eternal City at yonder gate, the gate of San Giovanni Laterano where the two last objects that attract the notice of a departing visitor and the two first objects that attract the notice of an arriving one are a proud church and a decaying ruin good emblems of rome our way lies over the campagna which looks more solemn on a bright blue day like this than beneath a darker sky the great extent of ruin being plainer to the eye and the sunshine through the arches of the broken aqueducts, showing other broken arches shining through them in the melancholy distance. When we have traversed it and look back from Albano, its dark undulating surface lies below us like a stagnant lake, or like a broad dull lethe flowing round the walls of Rome and separating it from all the world. How often have the legions in triumphant march gone glittering across that purple waste, so silent and unpeopled now? How often has the train of captives looked with sinking hearts upon the distant city and beheld its population pouring out to hail the return of their conqueror? What riot, sensuality and murder have run mad in the vast palaces, now heaps of brick and shattered marble. What glare of fires and roar of popular tumult and wail of pestilence and famine have come sweeping over the wild plain, where nothing is now heard but the wind, and where the solitary lizards gamble unmolested in the sun. The train of wine carts going into Rome, each driven by a shaggy peasant reclining beneath a little gypsy fashioned canopy of sheepskin, is ended now, and we go toiling up into a higher country where there are trees. The next day brings us on the Pontina marshes, wearily flat and lonesome, and overgrown with brushwood and swamped with water but with a fine road made across them, shaded by a long, long avenue. Here and there we pass a solitary guard-house, here and there a hovel, deserted and walled up. Some herdsmen loiter on the banks of the stream beside the road, and sometimes a flat-bottomed boat, towed by a man, comes rippling idly along it. A horseman passes occasionally, carrying a long gun crosswise on the saddle before him, and attended by fierce dogs. 
but there is nothing else astir save the wind and the shadows until we come in sight of Terracina. How bright and blue the sea, rolling below the windows of the inn so famous in robber stories! How picturesque the great crags and points of rock overhanging tomorrow's narrow road, where galley slaves are working in the quarries above, and the sentinels who guard them lounge on the seashore. All night there is the murmur of the sea beneath the stars, and in the morning, just at daybreak, the prospect suddenly becoming expanded as if by a miracle reveals, in the far distance across the sea there, Naples with its islands and Vesuvius spouting fire. Within a quarter of an hour the whole is gone, as if it were a vision in the clouds, and there is nothing but the sea and sky. The Neapolitan frontier crossed after two hours travelling, and the hungriest of soldiers and custom-house officers, with difficulty appeased, we enter by gateless portal into the first Neapolitan town, Fondi. Take note of Fondi in the name of all that is wretched and beggarly. A filthy channel of mud and refuse meanders down the centre of the miserable streets, fed by obscene rivulets that trickle from the abject houses. There is not a door, a window, or a shutter, not a roof, a wall, a post, or a pillar in all Fondi, but is decayed and crazy and rotting away. The wretched history of the town, with all its sieges and pillages by Barbarossa and the rest, might have been acted last year. How the gaunt dogs that sneak about the miserable streets come to be alive and undevoured by the people is one of the enigmas of the world. A hollow-cheeked and scowling people they are, all beggars, but that's nothing. Look at them as they gather round. Some are too indolent to come downstairs, or are too wisely mistrustful of the stairs, perhaps to venture. So stretch out their lean hands from upper windows and howl. Others come flocking about us, fighting and jostling one another, and demanding incessantly charity for the love of God, charity for the love of the Blessed Virgin, charity for the love of all the saints. A group of miserable children, almost naked, screaming forth the same petition, discover that they can see themselves reflected in the varnish of the carriage, and begin to dance and make grimaces, that they may have the pleasure of seeing their antics repeated in this mirror. A crippled idiot in the act of striking one of them who drowns his clamorous demand for charity, observed his angry counterpart in the panel, stops short, and thrusting out his tongue, begins to wag his head and chatter. The shrill cry raised at this awakens half a dozen wild creatures wrapped in frowsy brown cloaks who are lying on the church steps with pots and pans for sale. These, scrambling up, approach and beg defiantly, "'I'm hungry! Give me something! Listen to me, Signor! I'm hungry!' Then a ghastly old woman, fearful of being too late, comes hobbling down the street, stretching out one hand and scratching herself all the way with the other, and screaming long before she can be heard, "'Charity! Charity! I'll go and pray for you directly, beautiful lady, if you'll give me charity!' Lastly, the members of a brotherhood for burying the dead, hideously masked and attired in shabby black robes, white at the skirts, with the splashes of many muddy winters, escorted by a dirty priest and a congenial cross-bearer, come hurrying past. Surrounded by this motley concourse, we move out of Fondi, bad bright eyes glaring at us out of the darkness of every crazy tenement like glistening fragments of its filth and putrefaction a noble mountain pass with the ruins of a fort on a strong eminence traditionally called the fort of fra diavolo the old town of a tree like a device in pastry built up almost perpendicularly on a hill and approached by long, steep flights of steps. Beautiful Mola di Gaeta, whose wines, like those of Albano, have degenerated since the days of Horace, or his taste for wine was bad, 
which is not likely of one who enjoyed it so much and extolled it so well. Another night upon the road at San Dacata, a rest next day at Capua, which is picturesque, but hardly so seductive to a traveller now, as the soldiers of Praetorian Rome were wont to find the ancient city of that name. A flat road among vines festooned and looped from tree to tree, and Mount Vesuvius close at hand at last, its cone and summit whitened with snow, and its smoke hanging over it in the heavy atmosphere of the day, like a dense cloud. So we go rattling downhill into Naples. A funeral is coming up the street towards us, the body on an open bier, borne on a kind of palanquin, covered with a gay cloth of crimson and gold. The mourners in white gowns and masks. If there be death abroad, life is well represented too, for all Naples would seem to be out of doors, and tearing to and fro in carriages. Some of these, the common veterino vehicles, are drawn by three horses abreast, decked with smart trappings, and great abundance of brazen ornament, and always going very fast. Not that their loads are light, for the smallest of them has at least six people inside, four in front, four or five more hanging on behind, and two or three more in a net or bag below the axle-tree, where they lie half suffocated, with mud and dust. Exhibitors of punch, buffo-singers with guitars, reciters of poetry, reciters of stories, a row of cheap exhibitions with clowns and showmen, drums and trumpets, painted cloths representing the wonders within, and admiring crowds assembled without, assist the whirl and bustle. Ragged lazzaroni lie asleep in doorways, archways and kennels. The gentry gaily dressed are dashing up and down in carriages on the chiaia, or walking in the public gardens, and quiet letter-writers perch behind their little desks and inkstands under the portico of the great theatre of San Carlo in the public street, are waiting for clients. Here is a galley slave in chains who wants a letter written to a friend. He approaches a clerkly-looking man sitting under the corner arch and makes his bargain. He has obtained permission of the sentinel who guards him, who stands near leaning against the wall and cracking nuts. The galley slave dictates in the ear of the letter writer what he desires to say and as he can't read writing, looks intently in his face to read there whether he sets down faithfully what he is told. After a time the galley slave becomes discursive, incoherent. The secretary pauses and rubs his chin. The galley slave is voluble and energetic. The secretary at length catches the idea, and with the air of a man who knows how to word it, sets it down stopping now and then to glance back at his text admiringly. The galley slave is silent. The soldier stoically cracks his nuts. Is there anything more to say? inquires the letter writer. No more. Then listen, friend of mine. He reads it through. The galley slave is quite enchanted. It is folded and addressed and given to him, and he pays the fee. The secretary falls back indolently in his chair and takes a book. The galley slave gathers up an empty sack. The sentinel throws away a handful of nutshells, shoulders his musket, and away they go together. Why do the beggars wrap their chins constantly with their right hands when you look at them? Everything is done in pantomime in Naples, and that is the conventional sign for hunger. A man who is quarrelling with another yonder lays the palm of his right hand on the back of his left and shakes the two thumbs expressive of a donkey's ears whereat his adversary is goaded to desperation. Two people bargaining for fish, the buyer empties an imaginary waistcoat pocket when he is told the price and walks away without a word, 
having thoroughly conveyed to the seller that he considers it too dear. Two people in carriages meeting, one touches his lips twice or thrice, holding up the five fingers of his right hand, and gives a horizontal cut in the air with the palm. The other nods briskly and goes his way. He has been invited to a friendly dinner at half-past five o'clock, and will certainly come. All over Italy a peculiar shake of the right hand from the wrist, with the forefinger stretched out, expresses a negative, the only negative beggars will ever understand, but in Naples those five fingers are a copious language. All this and every other kind of outdoor life and stir and macaroni eating at sunset and flower selling all day long and begging and stealing everywhere and at all hours you see upon the bright sea shore where the waves of the bay sparkle merrily. But lovers and hunters of the picturesque, let us not keep too studiously out of view the miserable depravity, degradation and wretchedness with which the gay Neapolitan life is inseparably associated. It is not well to find St. Giles is so repulsive and the Porta Capuana so attractive. A pair of naked legs and a ragged red scarf do not make all the difference between what is interesting and what is coarse and odious. Painting and poetizing for ever, if you will, the beauties of this most beautiful and lovely spot of earth, let us, as our duty, try to associate a new picturesque with some faint recognition of man's destiny and capabilities, more hopeful, I believe, among the ice and snow of the North Pole than in the sun and bloom of Naples. Capri, once made odious by the deified beast Tiberius, Issia, Procida, and the thousand distant beauties of the bay lie in the blue sea yonder, changing in the mist and sunshine twenty times a day, now close at hand, now far off, now unseen. The fairest country in the world is spread about us. Whether we turn towards the Miseno shore of the splendid watery amphitheatre, and go by the grotto of Pasilipo, to the Grotto del Carne and away to Baia, or take the other way towards Vesuvius and Sorrento, it is one succession of delights. In the last-named direction, where over doors and archways there are countless little images of San Gennaro, with his canute's hand stretched out to check the fury of the burning mountain, we are carried pleasantly by a railroad on the beautiful sea-beach past the town of Torre del Greco, built upon the ashes of the former town, destroyed by an eruption of Vesuvius within a hundred years, and past the flat-roofed houses, granaries, and macaroni manufactories, to Castellamare, with its ruined castle, now inhabited by fishermen, standing in the sea upon a heap of rocks. Here the railroad terminates, but hence we may ride on, by an unbroken succession of enchanting bays and beautiful scenery, sloping from the highest summit of San Angelo, the highest neighbouring mountain, down to the water's edge, among vineyards, olive trees, gardens of oranges and lemons, orchards, heaped up rocks, green gorges in the hills, and by the bases of snow-covered heights, and through small towns with handsome dark-haired women at the doors, and past delicious summer villas, to Sorrento, where the poet Tasso drew his inspiration from the beauty surrounding him. Returning, we may climb the heights above Castellamare, and looking down among the boughs and leaves, see the crisp water glistening in the sun, and clusters of white houses in distant Naples, dwindling in the great extent of prospect down to Dice. The coming back to the city by the beach again at sunset, with the glowing sea on one side, and the darkening mountain with its smoke and flame upon the other, is a sublime conclusion to the glory of the day. That church by the Porta Capuana, near the old fisher market in the dirtiest quarter of dirty Naples, where the revolt of Mazzaniello began, 
is memorable for having been the scene of one of his earliest proclamations to the people, and is particularly remarkable for nothing else, unless it be its waxen and bejeweled saint in a glass case with two odd hands, or the enormous number of beggars who are constantly wrapping their chins there like a battery of castanets. The cathedral with the beautiful door and the columns of African and Egyptian granite that once ornamented the temple of Apollo contains the famous sacred blood of San Gennaro or Januarius, which is preserved in two files in a silver tabernacle and miraculously liquefies three times a year to the great admiration of the people. At the same moment the stone, distant some miles, where the saint suffered martyrdom, becomes faintly red. It is said that the officiating priests turn faintly red also sometimes when these miracles occur. The old, old men who live in hovels at the entrance of these ancient catacombs, and who in their age and infirmity seem waiting here to be buried themselves, are members of a curious body called the Royal Hospital, who are the official attendants at funerals. Two of these old spectres totter away with lighted tapers to show the caverns of death, as unconcerned as if they were immortal. They were used as burying places for three hundred years, and in one part is a large pit full of skulls and bones, said to be the sad remains of a great mortality occasioned by a plague. In the rest there is nothing but dust. They consist chiefly of great wide corridors and labyrinths, hewn out of the rock. At the end of some of these long passages are unexpected glimpses of the daylight, shining down from above. It looks as ghastly and as strange among the torches and the dust and the dark vaults, as if it too were dead and buried. The present burial place lies out yonder on a hill between the city and Vesuvius. The old Campo Santo, with its 365 pits, is only used for those who die in hospitals and prisons, and are unclaimed by their friends. The graceful new cemetery, at no great distance from it, though yet unfinished, has already many graves among its shrubs and flowers and airy colonnades. It might be reasonably objected elsewhere that some of the tombs are meretricious and too fanciful, but the general brightness seems to justify it here, and Mount Vesuvius, separated from them by a lovely slope of ground, exalts and saddens the scene. If it be solemn to behold from this new city of the dead, with its dark smoke hanging in the clear sky, how much more awful and impressive is it, viewed from the ghostly ruins of Herculaneum and Pompeii? Stand at the bottom of the great market-place of Pompeii, and look up the silent streets, through the ruined temples of Jupiter and Isis, over the broken houses with their inmost sanctuaries open to the day, away to Mount Vesuvius, bright and snowy, in the peaceful distance, and lose all count of time and heed of other things, in the strange and melancholy sensation of seeing the destroyed and the destroyer making this quiet picture in the sun. Then ramble on and see at every turn the little familiar tokens of human habitation and everyday pursuits, the chafing of the bucket rope in the stone rim of the exhausted well, the track of carriage wheels in the pavement of the street, the marks of drinking vessels on the stone counter of the wine shop, the amphorae in private cellars stored away so many hundred years ago and undisturbed to this hour all rendering the solitude and deadly lonesomeness of the place ten thousand times more solemn than if the volcano in its fury had swept the city from the earth and sunk it in the bottom of the sea. After it was shaken by the earthquake which preceded the eruption, workmen were employed in shaping out in stone new ornaments for temples and other buildings that had suffered. Here lies their work outside the city gate, as if they would return tomorrow. 
In the cellar of Diomedes' house, where certain skeletons were found huddled together close to the door, the impression of their bodies on the ashes, hardened with the ashes and became stamped and fixed there, after they had shrunk inside to scanty bones. So in the theatre of Herculaneum, a comic mask, floating on the stream when it was hot and liquid, stamped its mimic features in it as it hardened into stone, and now it turns upon the stranger the fantastic look it turned upon the audiences in that same theatre two thousand years ago. Next to the wonder of going up and down the streets, and in and out of the houses, and traversing the secret chambers of the temples of a religion that has vanished from the earth, and finding so many fresh traces of remote antiquity, as if the course of time had been stopped after this desolation, and there had been no nights and days, months, years and centuries since. Nothing is more impressive and terrible than the many evidences of the searching nature of the ashes, as bespeaking their irresistible power, and the impossibility of escaping them. In the wine cellars they forced their way into the earthen vessels, displacing the wine and choking them to the brim with dust. In the tombs they forced the ashes of the dead from the funeral urns, and rained new ruin even into them. The mouths and eyes and skulls of all the skeletons were stuffed with this terrible hail. In Herculaneum, where the flood was of a different and a heavier kind, it rolled in like a sea. Imagine a deluge of water turned to marble at its height, and that is what is called the lava here. Some workmen were digging in the gloomy well on the brink of which we now stand, looking down, when they came on some of the stone benches of the theatre, those steps, for such they seem, at the bottom of the excavation, and found the buried city of Herculaneum. Presently going down with lighted torches, we are perplexed by great walls of monstrous thickness, rising up between the benches, shutting out the stage, obtruding their shapeless forms in absurd places, confusing the whole plan, and making it a disordered dream. We cannot at first believe or picture to ourselves that this came rolling in and drowned the city, and that all that is not here has been cut away by the axe, like solid stone. But this perceived and understood, the horror and oppression of its presence, are indescribable. Many of the paintings on the walls, in the roofless chambers of both cities, or carefully removed to the museum at Naples, are as fresh and plain as if they had been executed yesterday. Here are subjects of still life as provisions, dead game, bottles, glasses and the like. Familiar classical stories or mythological fables, always forcibly and plainly told. Conceits of cupids, quarrelling, sporting, working at trades. Theatrical rehearsals, poets reading their productions to their friends, inscriptions chalked upon the walls, political squibs, advertisements, rough drawings by schoolboys, everything to people and restore the ancient cities in the fancy of their wandering visitor. Furniture, too, you see of every kind, lamps, tables, couches, vessels for eating, drinking and cooking, workmen's tools, surgical instruments, tickets for the theatre, pieces of money, personal ornaments, bunches of keys found clenched in the grasp of skeletons, helmets of guards and warriors, little household bells yet musical with their old domestic tones. The least among these objects lends its aid to swell the interest of Vesuvius and invest it with a perfect fascination. The looking from either ruined city into the neighbouring grounds overgrown with beautiful vines and luxuriant trees, and remembering that house upon house temple on temple, building after building and street after street, 
are still lying underneath the roots of all the quiet cultivation, waiting to be turned up to the light of day, is something so wonderful, so full of mystery, so captivating to the imagination, that one would think it would be paramount and yield to nothing else, to nothing but Vesuvius, but the mountain is the genius of the scene. From every indication of the ruin it has worked, we look again with an absorbing interest to where its smoke is rising up into the sky. It is beyond us as we thread the ruined streets, above us as we stand upon the ruined walls, we follow it through every vista of broken columns, as we wander through the empty courtyards of the houses, and through the garlandings and interlacings of every wanton vine. Turning away to Pystum yonder, to see the awful structures built, the least aged of them, hundreds of years before the birth of Christ, and standing yet, erect in lonely majesty, upon the wild, malaria-blighted plain, we watch Vesuvius as it disappears from the prospect, and watch for it again on our return, with the same thrill of interest, as the doom and destiny of all this beautiful country biding its terrible time. It is very warm in the sun on this early spring day when we return from Pystum, but very cold in the shade, insomuch that although we may lunch pleasantly at noon in the open air by the gate of Pompeii, the neighbouring rivulet supplies thick ice for our wine. But the sun is shining brightly, there is not a cloud or speck of vapour in the whole blue sky, looking down upon the Bay of Naples, and the moon will be at the full to-night. No matter that the snow and ice lie thick upon the summit of Vesuvius, or that we have been on foot all day at Pompeii, or that croakers maintain that strangers should not be on the mountain by night in such an unusual season, let us take advantage of the fine weather, make the best of our way to Rosina, the little village at the foot of the mountain, prepare ourselves as well as we can on so short a notice at the guide's house, ascend at once and have sunset halfway up, moonlight at the top, and midnight to come down in. At four o'clock in the afternoon there is a terrible uproar in the little staple-yard of Signor Salvatore, the recognised head-guide, with the gold band round his cap, and thirty under-guides are all scuffling and screaming at once, are preparing half a dozen saddled ponies, three litters and some stout staves for the journey. Every one of the thirty quarrels with the other twenty-nine, and frightens the six ponies, and as much of the village as possible squeeze itself into the little stable-yard, participates in the tumult, and gets trodden on by the cattle. After much violent skirmishing and more noise than would suffice for the storming of Naples, the procession starts. The head guide, who is liberally paid for all the attendants, rides a little in advance of the party. The other thirty guides proceed on foot. Eight go forward with the litters that are to be used by and by, and the remaining two and twenty beg. We ascend gradually by stony lanes like rough, broad flights of stairs for some time. At length we leave these, and the vineyards on either side of them, and emerge upon a bleak, bare region where the lava lies confusedly in enormous rusty masses, as if the earth had been ploughed up by burning thunderbolts. And now we halt to see the sun set. The change that falls upon the dreary region and on the whole mountain as its red light fades and the night comes on, and the unutterable solemnity and dreariness that reign around, who that has witnessed it can ever forget? It is dark when, after winding for some time over the broken ground, we arrive at the foot of the cone, which is extremely steep and seems to rise almost perpendicularly from the spot where we dismount. The only light is reflected from the snow, deep, hard and white, with which the cone is covered. It is now intensely cold and the air is piercing. The thirty-one have brought no torches, knowing that the moon will rise before we reach the top. Two of the litters are devoted to the two ladies, 
the third to a rather heavy gentleman from Naples, whose hospitality and good nature have attached him to the expedition and determined him to assist in doing the honours of the mountain. The rather heavy gentleman is carried by fifteen men, each of the ladies by half a dozen. We who walk make the best use of our staves, and so the whole party begin to labour upward over the snow, as if they were toiling to the summit of an antediluvian twelfth cake. We are a long time toiling up, and the head guide looks oddly about him when one of the company, not an Italian, though an habitué of the mountain for many years, whom we will call for our present purpose Mr. Pickle of Portici, suggests that, as it is freezing hard, and the usual footing of ashes is covered by the snow and ice, it will surely be difficult to descend. But the sight of the litters above, tilting up and down, and jerking from this side to that, as the bearers continually slip and tumble, diverts our attention, more especially as the whole length of the rather heavy gentleman is, at that moment, presented to us alarmingly foreshortened, with his head downwards. The rising of the moon soon afterwards revived the flagging spirits of the bearers, stimulating each other with their usual watchword, Courage, friend, it is to eat macaroni. They press on gallantly for the summit. From tinging the top of the snow above us with a band of light, and pouring it in a stream through the valley below, while we have been ascending in the dark, the moon soon lights the whole white mountainside, and the broad sea down below, and tiny Naples in the distance, and every village in the country round. The whole prospect is in this lovely state, when we come upon the platform on the mountain top, the region of fire, an exhausted crater formed of great masses of gigantic cinders, like blocks of stone from some tremendous waterfall burnt up, from every chink and crevice of which hot sulphurous smoke is pouring out, while from another conical-shaped hill, the present crater, rising abruptly from this platform at the end, great sheets of fire are streaming forth, reddening the night with flame, blackening it with smoke, and spotting it with red-hot stones and cinders that fly up into the air like feathers and fall down like lead. What words can paint the gloom and grandeur of this scene? The broken ground, the smoke, the sense of suffocation from the sulphur, the fear of falling down through the crevices in the yawning ground, the stopping every now and then for somebody who is missing in the dark, for the dense smoke now obscures the moon, the intolerable noise of the thirty, and the hoarse roaring of the mountain make it a scene of such confusion at the same time that we reel again. But dragging the ladies through it and across another exhausted crater to the foot of the present volcano, we approach close to it on the windy side, and then sit down among the hot ashes at its foot and look up in silence, faintly estimating the action that is going on within from its being full a hundred feet higher at this minute than it was six weeks ago. There is something in the fire and roar that generates an irresistible desire to get nearer to it. We cannot rest long without starting off, two of us on our hands and knees, accompanied by the head guide, to climb to the brim of the flaming crater and try to look in. Meanwhile, the thirty yell, as with one voice, that it is a dangerous proceeding, and call to us to come back, frightening the rest of the party out of their wits. What with their noise, and what with the trembling of the thin crust of ground that seems about to open underneath our feet, and plunge us in the burning gulf below, which is the real danger if there be any, and what with the flashing of the fire in our faces, and the shower of red-hot ashes that is raining down, and the choking smoke and sulphur, we may well feel giddy and irrational like drunken men. But we contrive to climb up to the brim and look down for a moment into the hell of boiling fire below. Then we all three come rolling down, blackened and singed and scorched and hot and giddy, and each with his dress alight in half a dozen places. 
You have read a thousand times that the usual way of descending is by sliding down the ashes, which, forming a gradually increasing ledge below the feet, prevent too rapid a descent. But when we have crossed the two exhausted craters on our way back, and are come to this precipitous place, there is, as Mr. Pickle has foretold, no vestige of ashes to be seen, the whole being a smooth sheet of ice. In this dilemma, ten or a dozen of the guides cautiously join hands and make a chain of men, of whom the foremost beat, as well as they can, a rough track with their sticks, down which we prepare to follow. The way being fearfully steep, and none of the party, even of the thirty, being able to keep their feet for six paces together, the ladies are taken out of their litters and placed each between two careful persons, while others of the thirty hold by their skirts to prevent their falling forward, a necessary precaution tending to the immediate and hopeless dilapidation of their apparel. The rather heavy gentleman is abjured to leave his litter too, and be escorted in a similar manner, but he resolves to be brought down as he was brought up, on the principle that his fifteen bearers are not likely to tumble all at once, and that he is safer so than trusting to his own legs. In this order we begin the descent, sometimes on foot, sometimes shuffling on the ice, always proceeding much more quietly and slowly than on our upward way, and constantly alarmed by the falling among us of somebody from behind, who endangers the footing of the whole party, and clings pertinaciously to anybody's ankles. It is impossible for the litter to be in advance, too, as the track has to be made, and its appearance behind us overhead, with some one or other of the bearers always down, and the rather heavy gentleman with his legs always in the air, is very threatening and frightful. We have gone on thus a very little way, painfully and anxiously, but quite merrily, and regarding it as a great success and have all fallen several times, and have all been stopped somehow or other, as we were sliding away, when Mr. Pickle of Portici, in the act of remarking on these uncommon circumstances, as quite beyond his experience, stumbles, falls, disengages himself, with quick presence of mind from those about him, plunges away head foremost, and rolls over and over down the whole surface of the cone. Sickening as it is to look and be so powerless to help him, I see him there in the moonlight, I have had such a dream often, skimming over the white ice like a cannonball. Almost at the same moment there is a cry from behind, and a man who has carried a light basket of spare cloaks on his head comes rolling past at the same frightful speed, closely followed by a boy. At this climax of the chapter of accidents, the remaining eight and twenty vociferate to that degree that a pack of wolves would be music to them. Giddy and bloody and a mere bundle of rags is Pickle of Portici when we reach the place where we dismounted, and where the horses are waiting, but thank God sound in limb, and never are we likely to be more glad to see a man alive and on his feet than to see him now, making light of it too, though sorely bruised and in great pain. The boy is brought into the hermitage on the mountain, while we are at supper, with his head tied up, and the man is heard of some hours afterwards. He too is bruised and stunned, but has broken no bones, the snow having fortunately covered all the larger blocks of rock and stone, and rendered them harmless. After a cheerful meal and a good rest before a blazing fire, we again take horse and continue our descent to Salvatore's house, very slowly by reason of our bruised friend being hardly able to keep the saddle or endure the pain of motion. Though it is so late at night or early in the morning, all the people of the village are waiting about the little stable yard when we arrive, and looking up the road by which we are expected. Our appearance is hailed with a great clamour of tongues, and a general sensation for which in our modesty we are at somewhat a loss to account, 
until, turning into the yard, we find that one of a party of French gentlemen who are on the mountain at the same time is lying on some straw in the stable with a broken limb, looking like death and suffering great torture, and that we were confidently supposed to have encountered some worse accident. "'So well returned, and heaven be praised,' as the cheerful veterino who has borne us company all the way from Pisa says with all his heart, and away with his ready horses into sleeping Naples. It wakes again to Polcinelli and pickpockets, buffo singers and beggars, rags, puppets, flowers, brightness, dirt, and universal degradation.' airing its harlequin suit in the sunshine next day and every day, singing, starving, dancing, gaming on the seashore, and leaving all labour to the burning mountain which is ever at its work. Chapter 11, Part 2 of Pictures from Italy by Charles Dickens. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Anthony Ogus. Our English dilettanti would be very pathetic on the subject of the national taste if they could hear an Italian opera half as badly sung in England as we may hear the Foscari performed tonight in the splendid theatre of San Carlo. But, for astonishing truth and spirit in seizing and embodying the real life about it, the shabby little San Carlino Theatre, the rickety house one storey high, with a staring picture outside, down among the drums and trumpets and the tumblers and the lady conjurer, is without a rival anywhere. There is one extraordinary feature in the real life of Naples at which we may take a glance before we go, the lotteries. They prevail in most parts of Italy, but are particularly obvious in their effects and influences here. They are drawn every Saturday. They bring an immense revenue to the government, and diffuse a taste for gambling among the poorest of the poor, which is very comfortable to the coffers of the state, and very ruinous to themselves. The lowest stake is one grain, less than a farthing. One hundred numbers, from one to a hundred inclusive, are put into a box. Five are drawn. Those are the prizes. I buy three numbers. If one of them come up, I win a small prize. If two, some hundreds of times my stake. If three, three thousand five hundred times my stake. I stake, or play as they call it, what I can upon my numbers, and buy what numbers I please. The amount I play, I pay at the lottery office where I purchase the ticket, and it is stated on the ticket itself. Every lottery office keeps a printed book, a universal lottery diviner, where every possible accident and circumstance is provided for, and has a number against it. For instance, let us take two Carlini, about sevenpence. On our way to the lottery office, we run against a black man. When we get there, we say gravely, the diviner. It is handed over the counter as a serious matter of business. We look at black man, such a number. Give us that. We look at running against a person in the street. Give us that. We look at the name of the street itself. Give us that. Now we have our three numbers. If the roof of the theatre of San Carlo were to fall in, so many people would play upon the numbers attached to such an accident in the diviner, that the government would soon close those numbers, and decline to run the risk of losing any more upon them. This often happens. Not long ago, when there was a fire in the king's palace, there was such a desperate run on fire, and king, and palace, that further stakes on the numbers attached to these words in the golden book were forbidden. Every accident or event is supposed by the ignorant populace to be a revelation to the beholder or party concerned in connection with the lottery. Certain people who have a talent for dreaming fortunately 
are much sought after, and there are some priests who are constantly favoured with visions of the lucky numbers. I heard of a horse running away with a man and dashing him down dead at the corner of a street. Pursuing the horse with incredible speed was another man, who ran so fast that he came up immediately after the accident. He threw himself upon his knees beside the unfortunate rider, and clasped his hand with an expression of the wildest grief. "'If you have life,' he said, "'speak one word to me. If you have one gasp of breath left, mention your age, for heaven's sake, that I may play that number in the lottery.' It is four o'clock in the afternoon, and we may go to see our lottery drawn. The ceremony takes place every Saturday in the Tribunale, or Court of Justice, this singular, earthy-smelling room, or gallery, as mouldy as an old cellar, and as damp as a dungeon. At the upper end is a platform, with a large horseshoe table upon it, and a president and council sitting round, all judges of the law. The man on the little stool behind the president is the capo lazzarone, a kind of tribune of the people, appointed on their behalf to see that all is fairly conducted, attended by a few personal friends. A ragged, swarthy fellow he is, with long matted hair hanging down all over his face, and covered from head to foot with most unquestionably genuine dirt. All the body of the room is filled with the commonest of the Neapolitan people, and between them and the platform guarding the steps leading to the latter is a small body of soldiers. There is some delay in the arrival of the necessary number of judges, during which the box in which the numbers are being placed is a source of the deepest interest. When the box is full, the boy who is to draw the numbers out of it becomes the prominent feature of the proceedings. He is already dressed for his part, in a tight brown holland coat, with only one, the left, sleeve to it, which leaves his right arm bared to the shoulder, ready for plunging down into the mysterious chest. During the hush and whisper that pervade the room, all eyes are turned on this young minister of fortune. People begin to inquire his age, with a view to the next lottery, and the number of his brothers and sisters, and the age of his father and mother, and whether he has any moles or pimples upon him, and where and how many, when the arrival of the last judge but one, a little old man, universally dreaded as possessing the evil eye, makes a slight diversion, and would occasion a greater one, but that he is immediately deposed as a source of interest by the officiating priest, who advances gravely to his place, followed by a very dirty little boy carrying his sacred vestments and a pot of holy water. Here is the last judge come at last and now he takes his place at the horseshoe table. There is a murmur of irrepressible agitation. In the midst of it, the priest puts his head into the sacred vestments and pulls the same over his shoulders. Then he says a silent prayer, and dipping a brush into the pot of holy water, sprinkles it over the box and over the boy, and gives them a double-barrelled blessing, which the box and the boy are both hoisted on the table to receive. The boy remaining on the table, the box is now carried round the front of the platform by an attendant, who holds it up and shakes it lustily all the time, seeming to say like the conjurer, "'There is no deception, ladies and gentlemen. Keep your eyes upon me, if you please.' At last the box is set before the boy, and the boy, first holding up his naked arm and open hand, dives down into the hole, it is made like a ballot box, and pulls out a number, which is rolled up round something hard like a bonbon. This he hands to the judge next him, who unrolls a little bit, and hands it to the president next to whom he sits. The president unrolls it very slowly. The capo lazzaroni leans over his shoulder. The president holds it up, unrolled, to the capo lazzaroni. The capo lazzaroni, looking at it eagerly, cries out in a shrill, loud voice, Sessanta due! Sixty-two. 
expressing the two upon his fingers as he calls it out. Alas, the Capalazzaroni himself has not staked on sixty-two. His face is very long, and his eyes roll wildly. As it happens to be a favourite number, however, it is pretty well received, which is not always the case. They are all drawn with the same ceremony, omitting the blessing. One blessing is enough for the whole multiplication table. The only new incident in the proceedings is the gradually deepening intensity of the change in the capo Lazzaroni, who has, evidently, speculated to the very utmost extent of his means, and who, when he sees the last number and finds that it is not one of his, clasps his hands and raises his eyes to the ceiling before proclaiming it, as though remonstrating in a secret agony with his patron saint for having committed so gross a breach of confidence. I hope the Capo Lazzarone may not desert him for some other member of the calendar, but he seems to threaten it. Where the winners may be, nobody knows. They certainly are not present, the general disappointment filling one with pity for the poor people. They look, when we stand aside, observing them in their passage, through the courtyard down below, as miserable as the prisoners in the jail, it forms a part of the building, who are peeping down upon them from between their bars, or as the fragments of human heads which are still dangling in chains outside, in memory of the good old times, when their owners were strung up there, for the popular edification. Away from Naples in a glorious sunrise by the road to Capua, and then on a three days' journey along by-roads that we may see on the way the monastery of Monte Cassino, which is perched on the steep and lofty hill above the little town of San Germano, and is lost on a misty morning in the clouds. So much the better for the deep sounding of its bell, which as we go winding up on mules towards the convent, is heard mysteriously in the still air, while nothing is seen but the grey mist, moving solemnly and slowly, like a funeral procession. Behold at length the shadowy pile of building close before us, its grey walls and towers dimly seen, though so near and so vast, and the raw vapour rolling through its cloisters heavily. There are two black shadows walking to and fro in the quadrangle, near the statues of the patron saint and his sister, and hopping on behind them, in and out of the old arches, is a raven, croaking in answer to the bell, and uttering at intervals the purest Tuscan. How like a Jesuit he looks! There never was a sly and stealthy fellow so at home as is this raven, standing now at the refectory door, with his head on one side, and pretending to glance another way, while he is scrutinising the visitors keenly, and listening with fixed attention. What a dull-headed monk the porter becomes in comparison! "'He speaks like us,' said the porter, "'quite as plainly.' quite as plainly porter nothing could be more expressive than his reception of the peasants who are entering the gate with baskets and burdens there is a roll in his eye and a chuckle in his throat which should qualify him to be chosen superior of an order of ravens he knows all about it it's all right he says we know what we know come along good people glad to see you how was this extraordinary structure ever built in such a situation, where the labour of conveying the stone and iron and marble so great a height must have been prodigious? Core, says the raven, welcoming the peasants. How, being despoiled by plunder, fire and earthquake, has it risen from its ruins and been again made what we now see it, with its church so sumptuous and magnificent? Core says the raven, welcoming the peasants. These people have a miserable appearance, and, as usual, are densely ignorant, and all beg, while the monks are chaunting in the chapel. Caw, says the raven, cuckoo. So we leave him chuckling and rolling his eye at the convent gate, and wind slowly down again through the cloud. 
at last emerging from it we come in sight of the village far below and the flat green country intersected by rivulets which is pleasant and fresh to see after the obscurity and haze of the convent no disrespect to the raven or the holy friars away we go again by muddy roads and through the most shattered and tattered of villages where there is not a whole window among all the houses or a whole garment among all the peasants or the least appearance of anything to eat in any of the wretched hucksters shops the women wear a bright red bodice lace before and behind a white skirt and the neapolitan headdress of square folds of linen primitively meant to carry loads on the men and children wear anything they can get the soldiers are as dirty and rapacious as the dogs the inns are such hobgoblin places that they are infinitely more attractive and amusing than the best hotels in paris here is one near valmontone that is valmontone the round-walled town on the mount opposite which is approached by a quagmire almost knee-deep there is a wild colonnade below and a dark yard full of empty stables and lofts and a great long kitchen with a great long bench and a great long form where a party of travellers with two priests among them are crowding round the fire while their supper is cooking above stairs is a rough brick gallery to sit in with very little windows with very small patches of knotty glass in them and all the doors that open from it a dozen or two off their hinges and a bare board on trestles for a table at which thirty people might dine easily and a fireplace large enough in itself for a breakfast parlour where as the faggots blaze and crackle they illuminate the ugliest and grimmest of faces drawn in charcoal and the whitewashed chimney sides by previous travellers there is a flaring country lamp on the table and hovering about it scratching her thick black hair continually a yellow dwarf of a woman who stands on tiptoe to arrange the hatchet knives and takes a flying leap to look into the water jug the beds in the adjoining rooms are of the liveliest kind there is not a solitary scrap of looking-glass in the house and the washing apparatus is identical with the cooking utensils but the yellow dwarf sets on the table a good flask of excellent wine holding a quart at least and produces among half a dozen other dishes two-thirds of a roasted kid smoking hot she is as good-humoured too as dirty which is saying a great deal so here's long life to her in the flask of wine and prosperity to the establishment rome gained and left behind and with it the pilgrims who are now repairing to their own homes again each with his scallop shell and staff and soliciting arms for the love of god we come by a fair country to the falls of terni where the whole valino river dashes headlong from a rocky height amidst shining spray and rainbows perugia strongly fortified by art and nature on a lofty eminence rising abruptly from the plain where purple mountains mingle with the distant sky is glowing on its market day with radiant colours they set off its sombre but rich gothic buildings admirably the pavement of its market-place is strewn with country goods all along the steep hill leading from the town under the town wall there is a noisy fair of calves lambs pigs horses mules and oxen fowls geese and turkeys flutter vigorously among their very hooves and buyers sellers and spectators clustering everywhere block up the road as we come shouting down upon them suddenly there is a ringing sound among our horses the driver stops them sinking in his saddle and casting up his eyes to heaven he delivers this apostrophe o jove omnipotent here is a horse has lost his shoe notwithstanding the tremendous nature of this accident and the utterly forlorn look and gesture impossible in any one but an italian veterino with which it is announced it is not long in being repaired by a mortal farrier by whose assistance we reached castiglione the same night 
and Arezzo next day. Mass is, of course, performing in its fine cathedral, where the sun shines in among the clustered pillars through rich stained-glass windows, half revealing, half concealing the kneeling figures on the pavement, and striking out paths of spotted light in the long aisles. But how much beauty of another kind is here, when on a fair clear morning we look from the summit of a hill on Florence. See where it lies before us in a sun-lighted valley, bright with the winding Arno, and shut in by swelling hills, its domes and towers and palaces rising from the rich country in a glittering heap and shining in the sun like gold. Magnificently stern and sombre are the streets of beautiful Florence, and the strong old piles of building make such heaps of shadow on the grounds and in the river that there is another and a different city of rich forms and fancies always lying at our feet. Prodigious palaces constructed for defence, with small distrustful windows heavily barred, and walls of great thickness formed of huge masses of rough stone, frown in their old sulky state on every street. In the midst of the city, in the piazza of the Grand Duke, adorned with beautiful statues and the fountain of Neptune, rises the Palazzo Vecchio, with its enormous overhanging battlements, and the great tower that watches over the whole town. In its courtyard, worthy of the castle of Otranto in its ponderous gloom, is a massive staircase that the heaviest wagon and the stoutest team of horses might be driven up. Within it is a great saloon, faded and tarnished in its stately decorations, and mouldering by grains, but recording yet in pictures on its walls the triumphs of the Medici and the wars of the old Florentine people. The prison is hard by in an adjacent courtyard of the building, a foul and dismal place where some men are shut up close in small cells like ovens, and where others look through bars and beg, where some are playing draughts and some are talking to their friends who smoke the while to purify the air, and some are buying wine and fruit of women vendors, and all are squalid, dirty and vile to look at. They are merry enough, signora, says the jailer. They are all blood-stained here, he adds, indicating with his hand three-fourths of the whole building. Before the hour is out, an old man, eighty years of age, quarrelling over a bargain with a young girl of seventeen, stabs her dead in the market-place, full of bright flowers, and is brought in prisoner to swell the number. Among the four old bridges that span the river, the Ponte Vecchio, that bridge which is covered with the shops of jewellers and goldsmiths, is a most enchanting feature in the scene. The space of one house in the centre being left open, the view beyond is shown as in a frame, and that precious glimpse of sky and water and rich buildings, shining so quietly among the huddled roofs and gables on the bridge, is exquisite. Above it the gallery of the Grand Duke crosses the river. It was built to connect the two great palaces by a secret passage, and it takes its jealous course amongst the streets and houses with true despotism, going where it lists and spurning every obstacle away before it. The Grand Duke has a worthier secret passage through the streets, in his black robe and hood, as a member of the Compagnia della Misericordia, which brotherhood includes all ranks of men. If an accident takes place, their office is to raise the sufferer and bear him tenderly to the hospital. If a fire break out, it is one of their functions to repair to the spot and render their assistance and protection. It is also among their commonest offices to attend and console the sick, and they neither receive money nor eat nor drink in any house they visit for this purpose. Those who are on duty for the time are all called together on a moment's notice by the tolling of the great bell of the tower, and it is said that the Grand Duke has been seen at this sound to rise from his seat at table and quietly withdraw to attend the summons. 
in this other large piazza where an irregular kind of market is held and stores of old iron and other small merchandise are set out on stalls or scattered on the pavement are grouped together the cathedral with its great dome the beautiful italian gothic tower the campanile and the baptistry with its wrought bronze doors and here a small untrodden square in the pavement is the stone of dante where so runs the story he was used to bring his stool and sit in contemplation i wonder was he ever in his bitter exile withheld from cursing the very stones in the streets of florence the ungrateful by any kind remembrance of this old musing place and its association with gentle thoughts of little beatrice the chapel of the medici the good and bad angels of florence the church of Santa Croce, where Michelangelo lies buried, and where every stone in the cloisters is eloquent on great men's deaths. Innumerable churches, often masses of unfinished heavy brickwork externally, but solemn and serene within, arrest our lingering steps in strolling through the city. In keeping with the tombs among the cloisters is the Museum of Natural History, famous through the world for its preparations in wax beginning with models of leaves seeds plants inferior animals and gradually ascending through separate organs of the human frame up to the whole structure of that wonderful creation exquisitely presented as in recent death few admonitions of our frail mortality can be more solemn and more sad or strike so home upon the heart as the counterfeits of youth and beauty that are lying there upon their beds in their last sleep beyond the walls the whole sweet valley of the arno the convent at fiesole the tower of galileo boccaccio's house old villas and retreats innumerable spots of interest all glowing in a landscape of surpassing beauty steeped in the richest light are spread before us returning from so much brightness how solemn and how grand the streets again with their great dark mournful palaces and many legends not of siege and war and might and iron hand alone but of the triumphant growth of peaceful arts and sciences what light is shed upon the world at this day from amidst these rugged palaces of florence here open to all comers in their beautiful and calm retreats the ancient sculptors are immortal side by side with michelangelo canova titian rembrandt raphael poets historians philosophers those illustrious men of history besides whom its crowned heads and harnessed warriors show so poor and small and are so soon forgotten here the imperishable part of noble minds survives placid and equal when strongholds of assault and defence are overthrown, when the tyranny of the many, or the few or both, is but a tale, when pride and power are so much cloistered dust. The fire within the stern streets, and among the massive palaces and towers, kindled by rays from heaven, is still burning brightly, when the flickering of war is extinguished, and the household fires of generations have decayed, as thousands upon thousands of faces, rigid with the strife and passion of the hour, have faded out of the old squares and public haunts, while the nameless Florentine lady, preserved from oblivion by a painter's hand, yet lives on in enduring grace and youth. Let us look back on Florence while we may, and when its shining dome is seen no more go travelling through cheerful tuscany with a bright remembrance of it for italy will be the fairer for the recollection the summer time being come and genoa and milan and the lake of como lying far behind us and we are resting at fido a swiss village near the awful rocks and mountains the everlasting snows and roaring cataracts of the great st gotthard hearing the italian tongue for the last time on this journey 
let us part from Italy with all its miseries and wrongs affectionately in our admiration of the beauties, natural and artificial, of which it is full to overflowing, and in our tenderness towards a people naturally well disposed and patient and sweet-tempered. Years of neglect, oppression and misrule have been at work to change their nature and reduce their spirit, miserable jealousies fermented by petty princes to whom union was destruction and division strength have been a canker at their root of nationality and have barbarized their language but the good that was in them ever is in them yet and a noble people may be one day raised up from these ashes let us entertain that hope and let us not remember Italy the less regardfully, because in every fragment of her fallen temples, and every stone of her deserted palaces and prisons, she helps to inculcate the lesson that the wheel of time is rolling for an end, and that the world is, in all great essentials, better, gentler, more forbearing and more hopeful as it rolls. End of chapter 11 Recording by Anthony